of me. Materials for Meditation on the Spiritual Life and What It Requires of Us by Rev. John Kearney, CSSP. Neil Obstadt, Reginaldus Phillips, Imprimatur Leonellus Evans. To Mary, Mother of Jesus and Our Mother, whose gentle care was revealed at the marriage feast of Cana, may she obtain for us the good wine of divine love which flows from knowledge and holy hope with filial fear of offending God. Introduction Looking out on Catholic society, we find that many of our people are weak in their gratitude to God, ungenerous in His service, withholding from Him and His church that full devotion we should expect. We find many of them down at a low level of spiritual mediocrity. They do not think very often of their Savior. They just want to save their souls. They want to avoid serious sin, but beyond that they do not go very far. They want, first of all, to get as much satisfaction out of life as they can, and to secure heaven in the end. We find many who do not shrink from being ungenerous with God, who has been so generous with them. It looks as if their plan of life was to give to God as little as possible. They may have lived as sincere Catholics at one time, but now they are no longer intimate with God. They know He is the judge, but they seldom think of Him as a father. To avoid serious sin is all they ambition, in this they do not and cannot succeed. Their worship of God is negative. The idea of positively pleasing Him in all they do is no longer a ruling principle in their lives. It is sad to see a young man or a young woman who, while a student, was very good, who prayed fervently, who went regularly and frequently to the sacraments, beginning to withdraw from intimate relations with God, and gradually settling down to give God rather the minimum than the maximum. This sad change is found among those in religious life as among those who live in the world. It is not rare to find instances of those who, after profession, have gradually passed from being very generous with God, from being ruled by His good pleasure in every detail of life, to being ruled by their very own will and pleasure, except when it involves sin more or less serious. All this is nothing short of a spiritual tragedy. A question comes before us here. What means can be suggested to cure this mediocrity, or to prevent a soul from falling from spiritual generosity to this spiritual meanness? Every soul is bound to strive to be pleasing to God in spite of its dark mind and its weak will and its strong inclination to evil. In this effort it is a great help to have a simple, convincing, and practical view of holy living. To carry any work through successfully, it is necessary for the worker to have a clear idea of what he's aiming at. The shipbuilder or the house builder must have a clear mental picture of the ship or the house he wants to build. The violinist, who's practicing a difficult change of position, must have clearly before his mind the note he wants to produce, otherwise his practice will never give him the skill he wishes to have. The maker of any garment must clearly know what he's aiming at before he begins to cut the material. If the end is not very clearly before his mind, mistakes will be made, much time and effort will be wasted without result, and the chance of attaining the end will be small. All this is true of the effort to attain to sanctity and salvation. Every sincere Christian needs a clear understanding of what he has to aim at to be ready for heaven. He needs to be able to distinguish the end from the means. Many have erred here. In a word, the earnest soul wants an exact idea of what God expects from these who wish to live as his friends. It is a want of a fundamental, practical, well-grasped view of the spiritual life that explains in great part the rapid falling away of so many young people from the life of a genuine Catholic. Moreover, Experience shows us that a number of earnest souls would be very glad to have a simple but true and comprehensive idea of holy living which they could easily grasp and easily remember and easily apply as a stimulus and corrective to their everyday activities. Of course, to save one soul more is required than a knowledge of the nature of the spiritual life, but a clear view of it is a fundamental necessity, as the examples given show. 
The present volume, with its two predecessors, My Yoke is Sweet and You Shall Find Rest, is an attempt to explain and illustrate a fundamental and simple view of the spiritual life, of holy living, that may be helpful to the ordinary souls who sincerely desire to live in friendship with God. Such a view we found emerging from the consequences of our being creatures of God, from the lesson of the life of our Blessed Lady, from the fact that we are really children of God by sanctifying grace, from the instruction given by Christ to His apostles, you must become as little children. And now in this volume we shall seek it in the principles that directed our blessed Lord both in the acts of His life and in His bearing of the Passion. The result of all these distinct considerations is the same. It is the realization, by the help of grace, that sanctity for us is found in the childlike conformity of our will with the will of God in all we do and all we suffer. The fundamental character of this conclusion is confirmed by the fact that the holy sacrifice of the Mass is an act by which we acknowledge our total dependence on God. It is the public sign of the surrender of our will to the divine will in union with the surrender of the human created will of our Savior. Our Lord Himself directs us to learn from Him this same lesson. Learn of Me, He says, for I am meek and humble of heart. The humility of Jesus was in His always doing what pleased His Heavenly Father. His meekness was in accepting without resistance the suffering which His Heavenly Father wished Him to bear. With all this before us, we are not astonished to hear that Abbot Marmion, one of the great directors of souls in our time, insisted on this attitude of dependence on God as being essential for every sincere soul. We read in his life, Dom Marmion required of the soul he directed a twofold essential attitude, the humble submission of the creature and the loving faithfulness of the child. He would have the soul conscious of the rights of God, the Supreme Master, acknowledge these rights, honor and respect them, by perfect conformity of will with that of Jesus. But being a child of the Heavenly Father, all this work of conformity must be rooted in constant filial love. The perfect ideal of sanctity presented to us in the life of our blessed Savior is adequately described by Himself when He says, I always do what pleases Him, meaning His Heavenly Father. Hence the simple idea of Catholic life that all should keep before them is the idea of being guided in all activity by the good pleasure of God. This idea, simple as it is, requires to be thought over in prayer, and we need much petition for the grace to understand it and to make it become a power in our lives. But if an idea enlightens the mind and shows it the path of Catholic life, the will needs something to attract it, to draw it to incline it to follow the idea of being guided in all details of life by the divine will. This attraction is found in the same life of Jesus, considered as a revelation of the goodness and the perfections of God. And the same revelation of God's goodness leads the soul to ask for the grace needed to enable it to persevere in living the ideal seen in our Lord. Thus the life of Jesus Christ enlightens the mind on the nature of Catholic life, and inclines the will, or the heart, to live the ideal so wonderfully set forth by the Savior. Directing our life by the divine will involves both keeping the law of God and bearing the daily cross which He wishes us to bear. That this life, simple as it seems, is a life of Christian perfection, is testified to by St. John of the Cross in these words. The soul that aspires to naught else than the keeping of the law of the Lord and the bearing of the cross of Christ will be a true ark containing within itself the true manna which is God. To those who have not tasted and seen that the Lord is sweet, a life of constant conformity to the divine will may seem severe, uninviting, repulsive even. It is true that it involves self-denial and mortification and prayer, as means to attain to and preserve this surrender of our will to the divine, but the life is a life of peace, of contentment of heart, of serenity of soul, 
and this even amid suffering. I superabound with joy, says St. Paul, in the midst of all my tribulations. It is the only life that gives real happiness both in this world and in the next. Those are mistaken who think that God wishes us to be miserable and unhappy here, that we may be perfectly happy hereafter. As regards the present life, the reverse is the truth. The saints were happy, intensely happy, even amid their trials. We should be like the saints, and the secret and the condition of that happiness is in the permanent desire to be directed in all things by the will of our Creator, our Father, and our Lover. Come to me, all ye that labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. Chapter 1 of Learn of Me, Loving Dependence of Our Lord, We Must Put on Christ. The life of Jesus is an inspiration. It attracts us to him. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, shall draw all men to myself. The contemplation of his life leads us to want to be as God wants us to be. It leads us to want to live in a way that pleases him. But the life of Jesus is also a model for us. It teaches us how to live. Not only does it show us examples of various acts of virtue, but it shows us the secret of holy living. We shall now consider that divine life from this last point of view. The Church, every year in her liturgy, puts before us the life of our Lord. She bids us contemplate the Incarnation, the Nativity in Bethlehem, the childhood in Egypt, the boyhood in Nazareth, the young man at the carpenter's bench until the age of thirty, the public life of preaching and miracle-working. He went about doing good, says the Scripture. Finally, the bitter passion and death on the cross. This life, in all its details, was a life of holiness, a life of perfect sanctity. We are called to be conformed to Christ Jesus. St. Paul speaks of the saints being made by God conformable to the image of his Son. Sanctity for us is nothing else than perfect conformity with our blessed Lord. This conformity with Christ does not mean the imitation of the external details of his life. It means that the spirit of our life should be the same as the spirit of the life of Jesus. In other words, the principles that govern our life should be the same as those that govern his. And this implies that all other principles must be rejected. St. Paul refers to this conformity when he speaks of putting off the old man and putting on the new. To the Colossians he says, Strip off the old man with his deeds and put on the new. And to the Ephesians, Put off the old man and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man who according to God is created in justice and holiness of truth. These texts call for a profound change in the life of the soul. Writing to the Romans, the apostle made the idea definite when he says, Put ye on the Lord Jesus. He describes sanctity in these words, but what exactly do they mean? Is it not by conformity of our interior spirit with the interior spirit of Christ that we put on Christ? And again St. Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's the same idea. Our mind should judge things as Christ judged them. Our mental attitude should be like unto his. We must therefore look into and consider our Lord's life, and by his grace try to understand the spirit that pervades it. And we must examine the interior characteristics of his life not merely what is exterior. But first, let us recall the Catholic doctrine which tells us that in our blessed Lord, while there was one person, the person of the Eternal Son, there were two natures, the divine nature and the human nature. Because he had two natures, our Lord had two wills, the divine will and the human will. The divine will, which was one and the same in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the human will, which was a created faculty of his created soul. Now the story of our Lord's life reveals to us the fact 
that the spirit pervading his life and guiding his life was the spirit of dependence on the will of God. His created human will was absolutely and ever subject to the divine will. He always did what was pleasing to the divine will. He accepted and bore all that the divine will wished him to bear. His subjection was characterized by its childlike and affectionate spirit. This was manifested by his constant reference to the divine will as the will of his Father, and indeed by the very turn of the phrases he used. From the Gospel text we see it was his heavenly Father's will that our Lord should preach, and also that he should give to the world the example of a perfect human life. This example Jesus gave, in the first place, by the conformity of his created will to the divine will in all his actions. But there was a further conformity. The external circumstances of our Lord's human life were foreseen, and the divine will wished him to subject himself to them while doing the work he was given to do. From the crib to the cross nothing was haphazard. Things would have been otherwise if the divine will had so decreed. All was known beforehand, all was chosen or permitted. The poverty of the stable, the hardships of Egypt, the toil of Nazareth, the labor of preaching, the disappointments of the ministry, the passion and the crucifixion, all was foreseen. And our Lord's human will submitted lovingly to the divine will in every minute detail of this life. He humbled himself, as St. Paul says, taking the form of a servant. As he accomplished the divine will perfectly in his activity, so also he submitted with loving docility to the daily incidents of the life chosen for him with its poverty, its accidents, its sufferings, its daily toil, its monotony, its disappointments, its apparent failures. Loving submission, loving dependence, is therefore the fundamental and the central characteristic of the life of our Lord. This appears all through the Scriptures. Lifelong Subjection of Christ in Acting St. Paul, in the Epistle to the Hebrews, quotes from the prophetic Psalm 39 these words spoken in the very person of Christ. In the head of the book it is written of me that I should do thy will, O God. In the head of the book, meaning in the book itself, in the book of the Scriptures it is written that Christ should accomplish the divine will. The first principle of the human life of the Redeemer was to be the submission of his human will to the will of his heavenly Father. Two verses lower down St. Paul quotes again, Behold, I come to do thy will, O God. Behold, I come to submit my human will to the divine will. The Gospel records how perfectly the human will of Christ was united with the divine will all through his life and how absolutely he accepted all the decrees and arrangements of that divine will. At the age of twelve he was about his father's business. His father's will was ever before him. Later on he spoke thus, My food is to do the will of him that sent me. My food, what a strong word! Food is our first earthly necessity. The very choice of this word brings before us what the divine will was to our Lord. To fulfill the divine will was his first concern. Again he said, I am come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. The loving manifestation of the dependence and the submission by this human will was that for which he had come down from heaven. He is the great teacher, and this was his great lesson. And in another place he says, my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. All these texts give us the same revelation, the revelation of the principle that directed the life of Jesus. In his early manhood it was the divine will that our Lord should give the example of a perfect life spent in arduous work and in lowly subjection. He carried out this will of his Father. He spent his life up to the age of thirty, in humble obedience to those that represented God. Jesus went down to Nazareth, says the Gospel, and he was subject to them. This life 
of subjection to God by loving docility, to those who represented God, included the long years during which he worked all day at the carpenter's trade. Think of him bending over the bench, cutting the wood carefully, seeing to the joints, giving the work a final polish. It was his father's will that he should be a village carpenter. He was diligent in doing that will. He lived the life of an ordinary artisan. His attention to his work and his diligence in his work could not be more perfect. His life was one long act of loving, filial dependence on the divine will. And then, then came the time for the public life. Here again the divine will had given Christ a work to do. He was to preach. He said to Pilate, For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth. In the beginning of the public life, at his first appearance in the synagogue at Nazareth, he applied to himself those words of the Scripture. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the contrite of heart. These are words of one who is dependent on another. Again, after his first preaching in the synagogue of Capernaum, when the people wanted him to stay with them, he said, To other towns I must preach the kingdom of God, for therefore I am sent. But he did not preach the whole world because he was sent only to the children of Israel. I was not sent, he says, but to the sheep that are lost of the house of Israel. And not merely did our Lord preach because he was sent, but he preached the things he was directed to preach. I have not spoken of myself, but the Father who sent me. He gave me commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And a moment after he added, Even as the Father said unto me, so do I speak. He was subject, therefore, to the divine will, even in the details of what he taught. Christ devoted himself to the fulfillment of this divine command. He labored in the work of preaching, which had been given to him. He was constant. He took trouble. He illustrated his doctrine in the beautiful parable so familiar to us, which made it accessible to the simple and ignorant as well as to the more gifted. But all the time he knew that the vast majority who heard would turn against him in the end and cry for his blood. He knew that his efforts for his own people would be a failure. The chosen race were very dear to him. They were his people, the people whom he loved, the people whom he would have gathered unto him as a hen doth gather her chickens. He foresaw that when he had done everything for them, his people would reject him, that they would not have him, not this man but Barabbas. He wept over them because they did not know the time of their visitation, the time of instruction and mercy, but he continued the work given to him. He never let his knowledge of the future interfere with his course of instruction. He had been sent to teach and to give to the world the example of a perfect human life. He knew this would lead to persecution and pain and death, but he never hesitated. He persevered to the end in his work of teaching. He never slackened. He never seemed to consider the immediate results. He knew that few would listen to him. He knew that they would murmur against him and harden their hearts against him. But he was never checked by difficulties or by failure. I always do, he said, the things that please him. St. Paul adds Christ did not please himself. And his father spoke of him, saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. When the Last Supper came, in his sublime prayer Christ said to his heavenly Father, I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. And he had converted but a small number. He had preached to the people, and he had failed. He had preached to the heads of the people, the Pharisees, and he had failed. He had preached to the chosen twelve, and he had failed to change their material outlook. How often he had to complain of their dullness. Are you also without understanding? And in the end they deserted him. But the work of preaching had been given to him, and he persevered in spite of the small result. On the cross, when he seemed a complete failure, he repeated the words of the night before, All is finished now, all the work is done. 
the night before, opus consumavi, on the cross consumatum est. His first word, as recorded by the Holy Ghost, was, I must be about my Father's work. His last word was similar, I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. When we contemplate the activity of our Lord, He comes before us as being absolutely perfect in this activity. But we should note carefully that the perfection was in His acts and not in the result of His acts. Each of His acts was done to fulfill the divine command, and His human mind and will were always concentrated on the actual work He was engaged in, so that it might be done as the divine will desired. I always do what is pleasing to Him. We must be conformed to this example. Our activity must be exercised in doing what God wants us to do. We must do it because it is pleasing to God. We should keep in mind that God wants us to do our work perfectly, even if we cannot accomplish a perfect work. If we do what pleases God, and do it to please God, and do it as carefully as we can, our work is perfect in His eyes, even if the result of the work be not perfect. Lifelong Subjection of Christ in Accepting and Bearing The submission of the human will of our Lord to the divine will appeared also in the way He submitted to all the details of the life chosen for Him. His submission was passive as well as active. He submitted lovingly and without murmur to all that came upon Him. He submitted to poverty, to exile, to hardship, to opposition, to failure, to all that wounded His affections. As he did not let the vision of his future failure check his activity, neither did he let the beatific vision prevent his suffering. He exposed his human nature to all the annoyance and pain that came from the circumstances of each day. He saw the divine permission in each of them. He did not let the vision of God prevent his being fatigued at the well and his sitting down there to rest, or his being tired out by preaching and is sleeping on a pillow in the boat during the storm. He let events play on him. He was hungry after his long fast. He was grieved for the blindness of those that hurt him. He was surprised at what happened. And Jesus marveled. He was disappointed. Could he not watch one hour with me? In a word, he submitted to the events of the life marked out for him by the divine will. And in particular, he submitted to all the pain that came from men. Think diligently, says St. Paul, upon him that endured such opposition from sinners against himself. It was his father's will that he should pass his life in a world filled with human beings who were all stained with original sin, who were clouded in mind and weak in will, and marked with a strong inclination to evil. And among them it was appointed him to live amid the roughest and the most despised. Nazareth was the least of villages. Can any good come out of Nazareth, said Nathaniel, who lived beside it? Our Lord accepted this, all this. He made no complaint of sinfulness, of ingratitude, of stupidity, of positive roughness, all of which were repulsive and revolting to his perfection and to his human delicacy. He accepted the situation. He never avoided his fellow townsmen. Just think of the difference between himself and those in the village. But he never resisted their roughness. He was among them as one of themselves, but without sin. He was meek and humble of heart. He was subject always to the divine will. In a word, Christ submitted all his life to the trials and pains that came to him each day. And when his suffering reached a climax in Gethsemane, he bent under the divine will. He accepted the suffering his father sent him. The chalice which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? These words represent his constant, his unchanging mental outlook on all the events of life. And in this spirit he went through all the agonies of his passion. He did not try to defend himself. He did not use his human skill or his miraculous power to escape from suffering. It was loving dependence, absolute obedience, pushed to the furthest limit. How absolutely true, therefore, is the statement 
that the fundamental and central and all-controlling characteristic of the life of our Lord was the submission of his human will to the divine will. The Holy Ghost tells us that when he prayed, he was heard on account of his reverence, that is, on account of his lowly and loving subjection. He lived his life of doing and bearing in filial dependence on the divine majesty. And when that life of humble dependence on God was come to an end, his very last words were but a final expression of his filial dependence. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. These last words summed up all his life. They were his last and most touching declaration of loving subjection. All this subjection, even to death, came from his filial love. It was the great manifestation of his childlike love of his Father in heaven. That the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father hath given me commandment, so I act. Application to ourselves, its result. We are all called to become conformed to Christ. We have to put on Christ. We must have in us the same mind which was in Christ Jesus. Now the central and constant characteristic of the life of Christ Jesus was the filial subjection, the loving dependence of his human will on the divine will, loving dependence in doing and bearing. This must also be the fundamental character of our life. We must live in filial dependence, in loving submission to the will of God in all we do and in all we bear. It is not enough to aim at avoiding sin. We must aim at pleasing God in all we do. This is to be conformed to Christ. This is the disposition that God asks for, and he will sanctify all who are thus conformed to his divine Son. Our Lord himself invites us to this conformity. He asks us to consider himself, to imitate him, to be conformed to him. Learn of me, he said, for I am meek and humble of heart. He wants us to learn and imitate his humility. This humility was his recognition of the absolute dependence of his created nature on God and the disposition of his human will to keep himself in the position of dependence before God. When he asks us to learn from him humility of heart, he is asking us to let our life be dominated by the disposition that dominated his life, the disposition of absolute and childlike subjection to God. The conformity of our will in disposition and in act is practically the same as what St. Thomas calls devotion. Devotion, he says, is the promptitude of the will in the service of God. The religious life implies the giving up of the three things that might hold our will down to earth. Hence it is a state of life which favors the surrender of our will to God. The result of surrender to God. The conformity of his human will to the divine was therefore the governing principle of the life of Christ. He was made obedient unto death, to use the words of St. Paul. Of Christ, the apostle adds, however, for which cause God also hath exalted him, and hath given him a name which is above all names. Christ as man was obedient even unto death. In heaven he sits at the right hand of God. And if we too persevere in the imitation of Christ, heaven shall be our reward. We shall be signed with the sign of the elect. The Apostle St. John, referring to one of his visions, says, I saw another angel ascend from the rising of the sun, having the sign of the living God. And he cried, Do not injure the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we sign the servants of God. In their foreheads, note the words. And having recounted all that were signed, the evangelist says that in his prophetic vision he saw them standing before the throne of the Lamb, clothed in white garments and palms in their hands. Later on, he shows that their loving subjection shall forever continue in heaven with unspeakable joy. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell over them. They shall not thirst, nor shall they hunger any more, nor shall the sun trouble them, nor any heat. 
for the Lamb that is in the midst of the throne shall rule them, and shall lead them to the fountains of the waters of life, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. But the happiness that comes to all those who imitate Christ in the total surrender of their will is not only for the next life, but is also for the present life. Those that imitate the Savior shall know the peace of God that surpasseth all understanding. They shall taste and see that the Lord is sweet. They shall, with St. Paul, superabound with joy in all their tribulations. Though joy is the accompaniment of surrender, its attainment must not be the objective. Our Lord's words to St. Teresa express a great truth. During this life the true gain consists not in striving after greater joy in me, but in doing my will. To this complete surrender we are drawn by the very life of Jesus, which teaches us the law of total dependence. The goodness of God is so wonderfully manifested in this life, as we've just considered it, that every sincere soul who ponders on this revelation must be influenced, must be attracted, to desire to live in his friendship by union of will. A Prayer O God of infinite goodness, who through thy beloved Son hast given to us the example of childlike conformity to thy holy will, grant to us, we beseech thee, that ever keeping before us the life of Jesus, we may strive like him to be guided in all we do and all we bear by that same divine will. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Chapter 2 Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? The words of St. Paul. The love of conformity, conformity to Christ. We have already seen in some detail that the central characteristic of our Lord's life was the loving surrender of himself to the will of his heavenly Father, the loving dependence of his human will on the divine will. I always do, he said, what pleases him, meaning his heavenly Father. We must be conformed to him in this. I find, says Abbot Marmion, absolute submission to God's will a sovereign remedy in every trouble, and when I consider that God's will is God, I see this submission is but the supreme adoration due to God. The life of our Lord not only gives us the example of a life governed by the divine will, but also it draws us, it moves us to imitate that life of surrender to God's will, and it leads us to ask for the help we need. It is an inspiration as well as an instruction. The good pleasure of God must govern our activity. We can hardly help being struck by the fact that at a certain point in the lives of some of the saints there was a very complete change in them. They were converted from a lukewarm or sinful life to a life of sanctity, and it was a fundamental and full and final conversion. They seemed to become saints almost at once. Of course they had temptations and trials, saints and sinners have them, but they reached sanctity with amazing rapidity. Now what brought about that change? No doubt it was the work of God's grace, but God's grace was cooperated with by the free act of his servants. Now what great act done by God's grace marked this profound change? How did they cooperate with grace? The great act that made them saints at once was the full and final surrender of their will to the divine will. From that disposition of surrender they never went back, and in consequence they never opposed the loving designs of God for their sanctification. They surrendered themselves, and God did all for them. The Roman breviary records many instances of these full and complete and final conversions. Consider the case of St. Paul. He was struck down on the way to Damascus, and his whole life was changed. It was a complete reversal of all his plans and his views and his interests. He became a saint at once. Now the great act which he made then by God's grace was the act by which he surrendered his own will absolutely and without reserve to the divine will. Lord, he cried, what wilt thou have me to do? These words manifest that absolute surrender. These words manifest the act by which he became conformed to Christ his Lord, by which he put on Christ Jesus. By this act 
he gave up his will fully and finally. Our Lord had just spoken to the chosen apostle and had reproved him for persecuting the church. Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Saul did not try to excuse himself. He surrendered himself, and this surrender he expressed by placing all his activity at the disposal of his Savior. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? We should note how in this surrender he was looking forward. He wanted all his future activity to be guided by Jesus. His outlook was positive. It regarded doing rather than avoiding. It is most significant that he made no reference to the past. He made no promise of not persecuting the church. And yet our Lord had just complained of his persecuting her. His act was more comprehensive. He wanted all his activity to be ruled by the good pleasure of God. And this included both the avoiding of all that was displeasing to him and the acceptance of the divine will as the inspiration and guide of all that he would do. We will continue with the book Learn of Me, and What Wilt Thou Have Me to Do, on side B of this tape. Continuing now with the book Learn of Me, How We Can Know the Divine Will. We should imitate St. Paul in our complete surrender to the Divine Majesty. This surrender of ourselves to God, our childlike dependence on the Divine Will, will appear first in our always doing what God wishes us to do, simply because it is His will. This is loving submission in our activity. It is submission to the signified will of God. But how, in all the varied circumstances of our lives, can we know what God wants us to do? How can we know the divine will that is to govern our activity? The answer is, this signified will of God is made known to us by the teaching of the Church, by our Catholic doctrine. Catholic doctrine tells us the mysteries God commands us to believe, the eternal blessing He would have us aspire to and hope for, what He will have us love, the commandments He would have us observe, the virtues he would have us practice, the counsels whose spirit he would have us follow. In other words, moderation in possessing or desiring to possess, in pleasure, in following our own will. This comprehensive statement needs to be considered carefully. It is God's will, therefore, that we practice virtue according as the occasion presents itself, and hence a knowledge of the virtues gives us a general knowledge of God's will for us. To study the virtues is to study the commandments, and the understanding of the virtues gives us a clear idea of the perfect Catholic. They are set before us practically in the lives of the saints, and hence the great spiritual utility of reading these lives. In the canonization of a saint, the Church requires evidence that the three theological and four moral virtues have been practiced in a heroic degree. If we come down to details, the will of God is signified to us in a very comprehensive way by the great commandment of charity, charity to God and charity to our neighbor. On these two commandments dependeth the whole law. Conformity to the will of God in our activity appears, therefore, in our fulfillment of the law of charity. The law of love, both as regards God and as regards our neighbor, has been considered in a previous volume. We may summarize by saying that a lover makes the interest of the person he loves to be as important or more important than his personal interests. A lover strives to further the interests, the happiness of his beloved, even at great cost, and he finds his own happiness in the happiness of the person he loves. Hence, we are not conformed to the divine will in our activity if we are indifferent to the needs, spiritual or temporal, of our neighbor when we can render him some service, or if we are indifferent to the pain or annoyance or inconvenience we cause him by our acts. God's will is known to us very definitely in the obligations and duties of our state in life. Hence to please God we must do the work belonging to our position with all care, with selfless devotion, with constant perseverance. If we are negligent, our will is not one with the divine will, in our activity. 
The duties of the state in life include all that helps to the immediate activity demanded by our position. Thus, a priest has to be able to say Mass with proper dispositions, to preach helpful sermons, to instruct, to comfort the sick, to lift up souls in the sacrament of penance. Hence he must be a man of prayer, of self-denial, of study, of reflection. This is God's will for him, and the first commandment of the Decalogue is violated if he fails. In the case of the married man this principle also holds good. The immediate end of his activity is the care of his wife and the bringing up his, of his family as good Catholics. God's will clearly covers all the details of his life. What God desires a person to do is easily known in the case of one who is in some way dependent on and subject to the will of another. And this, by the order of providence, is the state of nearly everyone, at least in certain departments of their lives. For all such, the will of God is known by the lawful orders of those in authority, and to submit to these is to submit to God himself. Thus, for instance, children are subject to parents. Children, says St. Paul, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is just. Honor thy father and thy mother. Wives are subject to their husbands. Wives, says St. Paul, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Priests are subject to their bishop and to the rules of canon law. Soldiers and sailors are subject to their officers. Religious are subject to their superiors. Penitents should submit to their usual confessors. The saints were marked by perfect obedience in this case. The employed are subject to their employers. Servants, says St. Paul, obey your masters according to the flesh as Christ, as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from your soul. In these cases God's will is known through the human will of someone in authority. In submitting to authority we are submitting to God. We are conforming our will to God's will. All such instances of obedience come under the fourth commandment, and we should notice that the words of the commandment are not obey, but honor. We are bound to reverence those who have authority, even if their lives are not perfect. In this most important matter, we have our model and instructor in Christ himself. Our Lord, as we've seen, always acted according to the divine will, and the divine will, as in the case of other men, was expressed for him by the directions of human beings who had authority. Our Lord submitted to all who had this authority. He followed the directions given by Mary and Joseph. He was subject to them, says the Holy Ghost, and in these words we have the divine summary of his life, from the age of twelve to the age of thirty years. He was subject to those who were less wise and less holy than he was. He could have done much finer work than St. Joseph, but he followed the direction given him, and he produced rough work like the average village carpenter. He submitted to the demands of the tax-gatherers of the temple. This was a religious tax. Christ was obviously not bound to it. He was the Son of God. He declared to St. Peter that he was not bound, saying to him, The children are free, free of the tax. And he then added, But that we may not scandalize them, go to the sea, and cast in a hook, and that fish which shall first come up, take, and when thou hast opened its mouth, thou shalt find a stator. Take that, and give it to them for me and thee. Therefore Christ submitted to authority. He paid the tax. He gave as a practical example of submission. Our Lord in a most positive way directed all of us to imitate his submission and obedience. Learn of me he said, For I am meek and humble of heart. Obedience is the test of meekness and humility, and meekness and humility find their development and their increase in obedience to lawful authority, no matter who exercises it. Even when those in authority do not give good example in their lives, we should obey them. Jesus said, The scribes and the Pharisees have sitten in the chair of Moses. All things, therefore, whatsoever they shall say to you, observe and do. But according to their works do ye not, for they say and do not. In other words, 
the Pharisees and scribes are in a position of authority. Be obedient to them. Since they have authority, God's will comes to you through their voice. Observe what they say and do it. But being men, they may sin, and they have sinned. Hence Christ warns his disciples not to imitate them in their deeds. And we, while being obedient, must take care not to imitate the faults that may be manifest in our superiors, but to pray for them. When Christ tells us that we must become as little children if we want to be saved, unless he become as little children he cannot enter the kingdom of God, he evidently wants us to observe and imitate some fundamental characteristic of the good child. What more fundamental than the humble, submissive will of the child in regard to his parents? We must be as children, therefore, in our loving submission to God's will. Nothing can replace this loving submission of our will to the divine will. No spiritual exercise can excuse us from this loving dependence, not even the all-powerful prayer of petition. Not every one that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, who is in heaven, he shall enter the kingdom of heaven. These words of Christ are almost startling in the positive character of his emphasis. Loving dependence on the divine will must come first and be the foundation on which sanctity and salvation rest. For those who are in religion, God's will is manifested in a special way. They know what he wishes them to do by their religious rule and constitutions, and also by the directions of their superiors. But God's will is made known not only by the words of superiors, but also by the direction given them by the companion who is head of the department or work in which they are occupied. Unless the order be contrary to the commandments of God or the church, or against the constitutions. This last point should be noticed. There are not a few who, although they submit their will to the superior of the house, do not easily submit to the fellow religious who happens to be in charge of a department. They are inclined to judge the wisdom of the orders given by these and to subject themselves willingly only when such orders merit their own approval. In so acting, they do themselves much spiritual harm, for they are resisting God's will, which comes to them through any person who has real authority. How we can learn God's will when we have no visible indication? Someone may ask, How can I know God's will in the case when the commandments or the duties of my state of life or my rule, if I am in religion, or the spirit of the councils, do not give me clear indications, and when in consequence I seem to be free to select among several acts or courses of action? It's important to note the answer. Since God has given us a rational nature, He evidently wishes us to live in a reasonable way, according to the nature He's given us. And so, when other indications of His divine will are not present, we are following His will if we act reasonably, and hence we are doing His will if we select one among several reasonable ways of acting. This should be kept in mind when one is in any position of authority for in such cases there is no superior to indicate in detail what God wishes us to do. We may restate this as follows. Since God has made us reasonable beings, He wishes us to live in a reasonable manner, but He wishes us to be careful of our motive. We should live in a reasonable manner, not because it is naturally right, but because He wishes us to do so in childlike submission to His will. This distinction is very practical. In deciding such questions as the selection of a way of life, the above and the following show us how we can follow God's will in this important matter. To know God's will in exceptional cases. Finally, we can learn God's will regarding our actions from the various circumstances of our life. These indicate the exceptional things God wishes us to do. Such indications of God's will are sometimes spoken of as his inspirations, because in a particular circumstance the thought comes frequently to us that to do a certain act or to undertake a certain work would lead others to know or love God better. To be sure that this thought comes from God, 
three questions should be asked. Will it prevent me from fulfilling the duty of my state of life? Does the thought of it put my soul in tranquility rather than agitation? And in the case of more important matters, have I the advice of a holy and prudent person, preferably my director, confessor, or superior? St. Francis de Sales puts the advice thus, The best and most assured marks of lawful inspirations are perseverance against inconstancy and levity, peace and gentleness of heart against disquiet and solicitude, humble obedience against obstinacy and extravagance. It is from inspirations such as we are considering that have originated the great works of charity in the Church's history, charity to God and charity to men. From all the above it is evident that we can attain to a knowledge of what God wants us to do. We can reach the knowledge of His signified will. But to attain to this knowledge easily, we should pray for light, so that the divine will may be clearly before us. St. Ignatius advises this prayer, and he frequently concluded his letters by inviting his correspondent to ask God for the light to know his holy will, and for the strength to accomplish it perfectly. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? THE MOTIVE OF OUR ACTS In our activity, even when doing what as a fact God wishes us to do, we should take care that the motive of our act is the good pleasure of God. It is the knowledge and the contemplation of the adorable goodness of God, as revealed in the life of our Lord, that inclines us, draws us to act for this sole motive of pleasing the Divine Majesty. Considering now in particular the acts we do under the direction of others, the motive of our obedience to any authority may be stated thus. We must be subject to those that have authority, because this pleases God, and because in so doing we are like Jesus of Nazareth. If our motive be the above, we should easily be subject to superiors who are imprudent and defective and bad-mannered. But in our activity, even if we have some general idea of pleasing God, we should be on our guard lest an imperfect motive may enter and gradually become the dominant motive of our acts. This entry of imperfect motives is often subconscious. Our imagination is held by the work we have before us, and we do not realize very well that our perfect motive is being gradually replaced by an imperfect one. Here are some of the usual motives that tend by the influence of Satan to replace the motive of the divine good pleasure. The Wisdom of a Superior This wisdom may come before us on many occasions and impress our memory. It's easy to submit to one who is marked by wisdom. The Goodness of a Superior The personal influence of a superior because of his kindness may easily become dominant. Our Friendship for a Superior Gratitude leads to friendship. Friendship is also based on relations of family or of native place. Such friendship may easily become the principal motive of our obedience. Personal convenience may also become a motive. We desire a quiet life, and we dislike disturbance of any kind. We do not like to be corrected or to be scolded. We expect that if we are usually obedient, the superior will let us do certain things on which our heart is set. When these natural motives are according to right reason, they may help to make obedience easy, and hence make it useful. But we must take care that they are always subordinate. Whether you eat, or drink, or whatever else you do, do all for the glory of God. If those natural motives become dominant and permanent, it is evident that our merit for heaven will be little or nothing. In such cases we are not exercising ourselves in obedience, and therefore we are not acquiring facility in obedience. This explains why we find instances of years of apparent subjection followed by a period of resistance to authority, a cause of surprise to those that do not consider carefully. The possibility of imperfect motives entering should lead us to take great care that we frequently recall the motive of God's good pleasure so that in all we do, whether in word or in work, we may do all for the glory of God by the perfection of our motive. 
In conclusion, sanctity is nothing else than the presence of the divine life of grace in our souls. This life requires to be preserved and developed. The acts which are required for this preservation and development are the acts that make us to be conformable to the Lord Jesus. And, as we've seen, these acts are all expressions of the childlike submission of our human will to the divine will. By these acts our will lovingly unites with the divine will. We are ruled by the good pleasure of God. This is what God asks of us. When this loving dependence is our permanent disposition, then we are not opposing the designs of God for our sanctification, which we are so inclined to do, and God will certainly give us His grace in abundance in reward for our every good act. In other words, Sanctity requires the absolute surrender of our souls to God. The perfection of a man, says St. Thomas, consists in his adhering totally to God. In this absolute surrender we have the way of peace. St. Paul puts before us this complete surrender of ourselves when he says you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Death and life are named in the same phrase death being the condition of life. You are dead to self by the surrender of your will to God, and in consequence you are living. You are living a life hidden from the world, hidden in God, and hidden with Christ because by your surrender of will you are become like to Him and one with Him. Death of self-will is the condition of real life. Unless the grain of wheat falling onto the ground die, itself remaineth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world keepeth it unto life eternal. Those who surrender themselves to God are often conscious of a certain softening of heart, not that there is any sentimental devotion. This softness is the result of the absence of resistance to God. It is an evidence of humility. It is the beginning of that peace of God which surpasseth all understanding. On the other hand, those that resist God, who want their own way, who are still dominated by self-will, these, if they observe themselves, will be conscious of a certain hardness of heart. There seems to be a hard center in their soul that resists breaking. They will be easily conscious of this if they pay attention, but in many or most cases they shrink from considering this hardness and try to dismiss it from their minds. A Prayer O God, who in Thy goodness hast called us to be sharers in Thine own eternal happiness, and who only awaitest our petition to give us the needful help, grant to us, Thy servants, the grace to persevere in prayer, so that we may get the light to know what is Thy good pleasure. Lord, what wilt Thou have me to do, and the strength to do whatever Thy light shows us to be Thy will? Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Chapter 3 of the book Learn of Me, The Kind Hands of God, The Love of Submission, Divine Providence. Our perfection consists in our conformity to Christ. Sanctity and salvation are in this conformity. The saints, as St. Paul says, are made by God to be conformed to the image of His Son. We must therefore direct our life under the influence of God's grace in the line of this conformity. We must put on Christ, to use the words of St. Paul again. We must put off the old man, our old self-seeking self. We must put on the new man. We must put on Christ. To put on Christ, we must accept the one principle which governed his life and make it govern ours. This one principle is the conformity of the created will to the divine will, and this means that in our activity we always do what is pleasing to God and that we carry the cross He wishes us to bear. This last point, the carrying of the daily cross, is one in which many souls fail. Even when we know that as God's creatures we should bear with patience the crosses He wishes us to bear, our weakness is such that we shrink from pain and even from discomfort. To strengthen ourselves to bear the cross, we shall consider the question of the kind providence of our Father in heaven. In meditating on divine providence, 
we shall try to look at the events God sends or permits from God's point of view. We shall ask ourselves with all reverence, what is God's design in sending this or permitting that? We've already considered our creation and also God's purpose in creation. We shall now consider God's purpose in the things and events we meet with every day. From this meditation we shall see that provided we try to be faithful in acting according to God's desires in the various circumstances of our daily life, we can commit ourselves to His kind hands for all the rest, including our crosses, and keep our souls in peace. Fidelity in doing His will and confident surrender to God sum up the life of the soul that is conformed to Christ. The Infinity of God when we lift up our mind to think of God, the divine attribute that we can put before ourselves best and easiest is His infinity. The infinity of God is so marvelously mirrored in the works of His omnipotence that it appeals clearly and strongly to those who think and almost forces itself upon their minds. The boundless sea puts God's infinity before us. Who is there that is not impressed by the vast expanse of the ocean? as seen from some hilltop, and the impression is deepened if it be recalled that only a tiny part of the ocean is visible at once, and that we might sail on it for weeks and months and years without fully exploring its immensity. This vastness is an image of the infinity of him who created the mighty waters, and who, as the scripture says, holds the ocean in the hollow of his hands. When we look up at the heavens at night, we meet another image of God's infinity in the almost inconceivable distances of the celestial bodies that sparkle in the midnight darkness. And the unsounded depths of the starry sky humble us into silence, into awe. It is the mirror of the divine infinity, for the heavens declare the glory of God, the glory of His infinite being. But this infinity of God, although so strikingly set forth in creation, is entirely beyond our power of comprehension. We can never fathom this or any other of God's attributes. We can only get a faint idea of them, and this especially by the way of negation, by removing all idea of imperfection and limitation from our thoughts of the divine being. And when, even in our imperfect way, we consider the unlimited being of Him who is, when we contemplate in a childlike spirit the infinity of God, we are dazzled by the mystery, we are bowed down by it in deepest and humblest adoration. In God there is unlimited being. We understand to a certain extent at least the idea of being. We ourselves possess being, but it is a limited being. In God being is unlimited. The infinity of God brings before us also his mysterious eternity. His unlimited being had no beginning. He never began to be. He that is, is so eternally. In God we have the eternal present. Past and future are equally before him. With God it is the eternal now. The Providence of God The infinity of God appears also in his power, his creative power, by which he called all things out of nothing his preserving power, by which he keeps all things in existence, his governing power, by which he rules all his creatures. Let us pause and consider the action of his governing power, that is, the action of his divine providence. God watches over all creation. He cares for all the creatures of his hands, for all living beings especially. He thinks of each one. He follows up the life of each one in all details. He enters actively into the life of each one. We consider a man to be very talented who can dictate to several secretaries at once. It means the following out of several lines of thought at the same time. St. Thomas is said to have been able to do this. But even for the greatest human talent, a limit is soon reached in the number of secretaries. There is no limit in God. God has in thought each one of his almost innumerable living creatures. Let us look at what this fact means, and we shall get a new and more impressive idea of his infinity. Consider the immense number of living things on the earth, birds of the air, almost without number, 
fishes of the sea, likewise all but innumerable, animals great and small, down to the tiniest insect. Now in his divine providence, God looks after each single one of this unthinkably great multitude. And let us note it well, because God is infinite, he can concentrate his attention on each being, on each little insect, as if it were the only living thing in existence. His divine attention is never distracted from this watchfulness. As has been said already, God could not be more attentive if there were no other being over which he was watching. This fact is a manifestation of his infinity. Our Lord puts the work of divine providence before us most beautifully when he says of the birds of the air, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and not one of them shall fall on the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, better are you than many sparrows. The text reminds us in the first place of God's care for the insignificant things of his creation. Two sparrows sold for a farthing, so small, almost worthless, yet nothing can happen to them without his permission. Not one shall fall on the ground without your father. Not one of them is forgotten before God, as St. Luke writes, recording the same teaching of the Savior. And then our Lord extends this truth to his human creatures. You are of more value than many sparrows. Think now of God's care for you. You are never forgotten by Him. Nothing can happen to you without His permission. If He cares for the insignificant sparrows, what must be His care for you? And to show the closeness of this watchful care, He adds, The very hairs of your head are numbered. There is no trifle in you that He does not know perfectly. Could anything be more beautiful, anything more touching? The conclusion is a note of confidence. Fear not, therefore. You have no reason to fear, since the great, the infinite God is watching over you, since you are never forgotten before him, since you can never fall to the ground without your father. Our blessed Lord frequently came back to this and to similar examples to bring home to us the watchful care of divine providence. Thus he says, Behold the birds of the air, your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are not you of much more value than they? Consider the lilies of the field. Not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed as one of these. And if the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow, is cast into the oven, God doth so clothe how much more you, O ye of little faith. St. Paul repeats the same doctrine when he says, God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will make also with temptation issue that you may be able to bear it? God is faithful to his repeated statements regarding his watchful and loving care for each of us. And in particular, he weighs and measures each temptation, each trial, and permits only those which by prayer we can turn into occasions for meriting eternal life. We should always keep in mind that the care of God's providence is directed to the individual. He does not merely watch over the multitude of men considered as a whole. He is also concerned with the individual. It is true that men fell from grace in one body, in one immense mass. Adam, the head of the human race, by wanting to be independent of God, lost God's grace and friendship both for himself and for his children, that is, for the mass of mankind. He could not transmit what he had lost. We lost God's grace, therefore, as a multitude. But by the arrangement of divine providence, we do not get back to God's grace as a body, but as individuals. It is true that to be saved we must be members, in desire at least, of the mystic body of Christ. Sanctification comes to us through this mystic body. Nevertheless, we have to work out our own salvation. Our Lord died for each one, not merely for the mass of humanity. The sacraments are personal gifts given to each one as an individual. We enter the church one by one through baptism. 
we are absolved one by one. Our Lord comes to us in holy communion, and He comes separately to each one. It is the individual that He wishes to lift up, to strengthen, and to comfort. It is always the individual soul. And as individuals we shall be judged by Him who has cared for us as individuals. His providence is always concerned with the individual soul. God's Providence in My Regard Let us apply this doctrine to the wear and tear of our life, to the pressure of our life, to the ever-varying circumstances that meet us day by day. God our Father is always watching over us, especially those who are in His grace. We are more valuable than many sparrows. Nothing can happen to us in the daily circumstances of life without His permission. The very hairs of our head are all numbered. Our life is lived each day in certain surroundings, material and mental, in certain conditions of body and mind. These surroundings and conditions have great influence on us, they play on our nature, they press upon us, and this action and pressure brings sorrow or joy. But they are not blind forces, they are in the hands of a kind providence, and things are directed so that his own designs of goodness regarding our souls may be fulfilled. God's infinity makes it possible for him to manage and manipulate and govern and arrange all the minute details of the surroundings and conditions of my daily life, so that they may be just what his love wishes or permits them to be. And his infinity makes it also possible for him to watch over the circumstances of all other human lives with the same care with which he watches over mine. His infinity is the key to the correct view of these mysteries of goodness. We must keep in mind that in this meditation we are dealing with the care God has for those who are in the state of grace. We do not speak here of the way God governs sinners. They are governed in a totally different way from the way in which he governs those who are his friends. God is unspeakably merciful to sinners, but they are not his friends, and he does not watch over them in the same way as he watches over those who by sanctifying grace are united to him in intimate friendship. THE DESIGNS OF GOD IN REGARD TO MY SOUL In order to appreciate rightly the action of divine providence in our own case, we must recall the design of God in regard to our soul. But what is God's design? God created us that He might show His goodness by the benefits He gives us. This is the teaching of the Vatican Council. Now the supreme gift God gives us is the power to attain to the possession of Himself. This possession means that in the next life we shall share God's happiness, because the source of God's own happiness is the possession of Himself. But even in the present life God gives Himself to and dwells in the soul that enters the state of sanctifying grace, and the natural development of this first possession will be the perfect and perpetual possession of God in heaven. Now the one condition needed on the part of the human creature for this life of happiness is the union of the will of the creature with the will of the Creator. It is a very simple condition. He that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven, he shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But the human creature belongs to a fallen race. He is infected by the results of original sin. These results make it difficult for the creature to surrender his will to God, to keep his holy law, and to carry the cross of Christ. And hence he has need of help, he has need of being purified from attachment to the things that hold down the human will. He must therefore be separated from whatever keeps him back from surrendering himself. His tendency to seek himself without reference to God must be mastered. The giving of help for this purification is what God wants to do for the creature who is in His grace and whom He loves with an unthinkable love. The love of God for a soul in a state of grace is unbounded. Each soul among the blessed in heaven is the object of His undivided love. He is concentrated in love on that single soul. He gives Himself entirely to that soul, and that soul is to rest in His love for all eternity. 
Similar to that is his love for a soul in grace. Of this concentration of God's love on the single soul, we have an image in the fact that Jesus gives himself entirely to each one that receives him in holy communion. No matter how many receive, Jesus is completely with each one. If I'm in grace, God's love for me is likewise undivided. He is concentrated in love on my soul. I am unspeakably dear to him. Now this unthinkable love of God for me means that he desires my good. But as we've seen, my supreme good is the possession of God himself. Hence the love of God for me means his desire that I may possess him in eternity, and also that I may possess him now in this life more and more perfectly. The surrender of my will to God is the condition of this possession, and the surrender of my will implies detachment from all that may hold it back from God. God therefore desires for me detachment from these earthly things that I may surrender to himself. He wants me to advance day by day in the union of my will with his holy will. He wants me by this to be prepared for the perfection of union with him in heaven, so that when death comes it may find me so ready for his divine embrace that I may enter at once into the full possession of himself and enjoy his own happiness. God does not want me to be delayed in purgatory. He does not want me merely to get into heaven and take a low place there. He wants me to attain to a high place he has prepared for me, and hence to reach a very intimate union with himself. He wants me to be ready to enter this joy of my Lord immediately after death. His absolute goodness, his loving kindness, is in this divine desire. We will continue with the kind hands of God in the book Learn of Me on tape number two. Please join us. We continue with Learn of Me, materials for meditation on the spiritual life and what it requires of us by Reverend John Kearney, CSSP. The circumstances of life are God's means for accomplishing His designs. What means does God adopt to detach us, to purify us, to prepare us to enter now into a close union of will with Him, and to enter at once into His glory at death? One of the great means is the daily pressure of our life, which is altogether in His hands, His kind hands. By this means He purifies us from our self-seeking. If we do as he desires in all circumstances and let him act on us through the details of our life, the work he wants will be done. He arranges our life so that everything helps for our sanctification. To those who love God, all things work together unto good. His kind hands are in the very limitations of our powers which make our daily life so ordinary, so full of failure. There is no accident in what we call the accidents of each day. The very hairs of our head are numbered. Sanctity, therefore, is in our daily life. It is in the wear and tear of the monotonous day, because all is directed by God, and so directed that we may attain to holiness by means of it. Hence the saints were sanctified by living their daily life, their ordinary life. The saints usually led very commonplace lives, for example, the little flower was so ordinary in her external life that the community did not know she was a great saint, fit for canonization. Her sisters have testified to this, and her own words testify also, for we read in her autobiography that when sick in bed she overheard a member of the community saying, Sister Teresa is dying, and Mother Prioress will have nothing to say of her for the mortuary notice. Nothing to say on the life of a saint? Her life was absolutely simple and commonplace. The ordinary surroundings of her life were directed by God and used by Him as means for her sanctification. She became a saint because she saw God's hand in all that happened to her, and she accepted all from God's hand. Each of us, in like manner, should see God's kind hands in the varying events of life. We should enter into God's designs of goodness and accept with loving confidence and with all our heart everything that He sends us or permits to come to us 
it is all planned for our sanctification. To accept the hard things of life simply because we cannot help them would be mere paganism. To be patient under them, that we may not have the shame of complaining, this would be pride. But to accept them with loving humility, because they come from the hands of our Heavenly Father, is to give Him great glory. It is the praise of His divine goodness. By thus accepting all that comes to us, we gradually become detached from the things that hold us down, and our will becomes more perfectly united to the divine will. St. Thomas Aquinas sets forth this doctrine with his usual clearness. God extends his providence over the just in a certain more excellent way than over the wicked, inasmuch as he prevents anything happening which would finally impede their salvation. For to them that love God, all things work together unto good. The trials that come from the free acts of others also come from God. He permits them. It is easy for all of us to have the true faith and who are supported by God's grace to recognize God's kind hand in the events of life which come to us, as we say, from the laws of nature, such events, for instance, as the loss of earthly possessions, failure in earthly efforts, suffering from poor health. All such trials are so manifestly God-permitted trials that it is not so hard to see God's kind hand in them, at least for anyone who has the faith and tries to live up to it. But to see God's hand in the events and sufferings that come from the free acts of our fellow creatures is not so easy, and it is especially difficult when the sufferings we bear come from the malice of others. We should be quite clear on the view to take of the painful circumstances of our life, of the pressures of our life which comes from the free acts of one of our fellow creatures. In all cases, we must see God's kind hand permitting such trials. If he saw that this particular pressure could not be a means of our sanctification, a means of detaching us from earth, his love for us would force him to prevent its touching us, and he could do this in a thousand ways. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and not one of them can fall to the ground without your father? We must, therefore, see God's hands in all that happens to us, his kind hands, his gentle hands, the hands that were pierced for us. We must see his love in the circumstances of every day. This last point is of such importance that we must dwell a little on it. The fundamental truth that God's providence governs all things should lead us to direct our minds away from the immediate cause of our sufferings. Many persons create difficulties for themselves by letting their minds dwell on the immediate cause of their trials, when this cause seems to involve the fault of a fellow creature. The only solution of these problems is to consider all such suffering as coming from God, who permits the fault causing it, but wishes us to bear the resulting pain which he intends us to turn to our spiritual profit. The scriptures are full of examples which illustrate this doctrine. Holy Job was afflicted with the loss of all his temporal goods. The Sabians and Chaldeans, says the text, carried off his property and slew his servants. Holy Job saw God's hand in all this. The Lord hath given, and the Lord hath taken away. As it hath pleased the Lord, so is it done. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So spoke Job. And he made no mention of the enemies who were the immediate cause of his temporal ruin. The Sabians and Chaldeans were not referred to. He blessed the hand of God, even when it pressed on him in pain. He knew there was love in the pressure of that divine hand. Another example is found in the words of Joseph, the son of Jacob. He'd been sold as a slave into Egypt by his brothers. They were jealous of him, they disliked him, and hence sold him to the slave merchants. It was a most grievous and abominable sin. We know how God protected him, how true to God he was, and finally how God gave him wisdom, and he was made by Pharaoh to be the governor-general of all the land of Egypt. It was while he held this position that his brothers came to buy corn. You're familiar with the details of the story. Joseph was good to the brothers who had sold him. He returned good for evil. And now 
Mark the words he spoke after he had made himself known. God, he said, sent me before you into Egypt. He saw God's hand in his slavery, and did not attend to the treachery of his brothers. But yet more strongly is the doctrine taught us by our blessed Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. When the apostles asked if they should defend him, he restrained them and said, The chalice which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? His chalice, that is, his passion, his sufferings, his death on the cross, all these, he says, come from his father in heaven. He says nothing of the Jews or the Romans, who are the immediate human free causes of all his pains. We must therefore see God's hands in all we suffer through the sinful acts of our fellow creatures. We must not be angry with them, even if they show signs of hatred for us. God has designs of goodness in permitting such pain to press upon us. There is love in all he permits. St. Gregory illustrates this by a striking example. A doctor may occasionally apply leeches to a patient. They cause some pain. The leeches are only anxious to satisfy themselves and suck our very blood. But we're not angry with these leeches. We know they are instruments in the hands of the doctor, instrument which he uses for our good. He will remove them when he thinks fit. The application of the example is obvious. The minds and hearts of men are in God's hands. He can turn a fiber in our brain and make them change their way of acting when he wills. Thus far shalt thou go, he says, and no farther. Pilate said he had power to crucify Christ, and our Lord answered, Thou shouldst have no power over me, if it were not given thee from on high. And in like manner, God may permit our fellow men to afflict us. He permits it for our good. Whom the Lord loveth, he chastiseth, says St. Paul, and he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. When we've really grasped the doctrine of divine providence, we begin to see the folly of grumbling and complaining or giving way to impatience and ill temper because of the trials arising from the laws of nature or from the duties of our position in life, religious life, married life, professional life. All this implies a forgetfulness of the kind care that God has for us. The same doctrine should keep us from being really depressed and moody or irritable when we fail in our work, or when our plans are contradicted. We should not yield to such impressions. We should see the kind hand of God in all these things which are so repugnant to those with a nearly natural outlook. The folly of criticizing those that are over us and who make us suffer is another instance of the blindness that comes from our forgetting the love with which our Heavenly Father follows all the details of our life. God's loving plans for our sanctification may not always be clear to us. This is not necessary. But we can be always confident of the reality of His constant care for those He loves. In many of these cases we cannot help a feeling of resentment. But if we do not make it our own, if we wish we could dispel it, we do not yield. In such temptations we should pray that God may bless the person. Pray for those that persecute you. The Signified Will and the Will of Good Pleasure The divine will which commands our activity is called the signified will of God. The divine will which sends or permits the events that press upon us is called the will of good pleasure. Let us keep in mind that accepting and bearing in peace all that God sends or permits to come to us should be united to the doing of His holy will, which is shown to us by the commandments, and particularly by the duties of our state of life. This bearing and doing must be blended together, for every new suffering or trial which we have to bear brings with it something new which God wants us to do. Our spiritual life will be seriously injured if we neglect either of these two duties. It's not enough to spend ourselves in doing in working to please God, we must also see His kindness in all He permits to come to us. On the other hand, to bear in peace all that He sends us, while we neglect to do what He wants us to do, would be equally fatal. 
Our sanctification is in our completely adhering to God, and this adherence is manifested by our doing and bearing all that He wills, just because it is His will. The explanations given must be well understood so that in all new circumstances we may both bear and act according to the divine will. When suffering comes in our body from sickness or accident, or comes in our soul by way of anxiety or darkness, we must not rebel against this pain, we must not lose our patience. The kind hands of God are in this trial but it is God's will that we seek a remedy with reasonable care, especially if the trial prevents our fulfilling the duties of our state in life, or if it causes inconvenience to our neighbor, in particular to those who depend on us. And we can ask God in prayer to mitigate or terminate our suffering, but always with submission to His will, as did our Lord in the garden. We should try to lead others along this path of peace, while we do all we can to alleviate their trials, according to the instructions of our blessed Lord and the example of Holy Church. When the suffering, whether of body or soul, comes from the sin of our fellow man, here again we must be patient, we must not rebel even in our heart. God's hands are in the pain, but submission to injustice does not mean acquiescence in injustice. The advent of this new suffering brings a new duty. If the wrongdoing that causes our pain is a source of suffering to others, or a danger of sin to others, or if it is against the common good, we should do all we can to prevent this evil from continuing. We should then strive to rectify injustice when we can do so, and we should bear with peace the pain that the effort brings. However, in many or in most cases we can do nothing. God has sent or permitted this trial. It is the cross of the day. We should carry it. We should be quiet under God's kind loving hands and let Him purify our soul by this pain. When we suffer by the sins of others, we should remember that God does not wish the sin. He does not even directly wish the effect, the suffering that follows. He permits both these. But He wishes me to react in a certain way to the suffering. He wishes me to accept the pain, even if according to his desires I try to get things rectified. He wishes me to be patient, to carry the cross, and to follow him, to imitate him. This doctrine applies to the future, and in consequence we can and we should look forward with peace and confidence to the events before us. The future is in the kind hands of God, and because he is master of the future, and because he cares for us with his fatherly providence, therefore we can be in peace and can with absolute trust commit the future of our soul to his care. Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. These last words of our blessed Lord bring before us what should be our mental attitude not merely on the deathbed, but during all the days of our life. When we confide in God's fatherly care of us, when we see His kind hands and all that presses on us in the present, when we look forward to the future with secure confidence, because His kind hands will be likewise in all that shall press upon us tomorrow, and next day, and next month, and next year, when we do this, we give God great glory. We are just what He wants us to be, His loving and trusting children. We are really treating Him as our Father and His goodness will never fail those that thus put themselves with simple trust in His kind hands. The martyrs are our models. In all circumstances of life we need fidelity to the divine will and confidence in the divine goodness, and we find perfect models for this in the fidelity and confidence of the holy martyrs. The martyrs had to win heaven at the price of many tribulations, much pain, intense suffering even. It was God who gave them the opportunity and the privilege of martyrdom. This way to heaven was safe and secure and certain, but it was a hard way. They had no choice. They had to accept this way of suffering, this way to heaven through torture. There was no other way for them to eternal bliss. The history of the forty martyrs of Sebasta 
sets all this before us most vividly. The story is recorded in the divine office. Forty Christians were condemned to death for Christ. They were condemned to be exposed on the ice of a frozen lake until the cold killed them. God gave them the privilege. God would give them the grace to accept all humbly and to persevere to the end in fortitude if they but asked him with confidence for this grace. It was a hard way to heaven. It was a safe way to heaven. But alas, one of the forty broke down near the end. He would not accept the glorious, if hard way to heaven given him by God. It was too painful. He wanted heaven, of course, but he would try to get in some other way. This present way he considered was beyond his endurance. He called the guard. He was taken off the ice and placed in a warm bath already prepared. He died in the bath. He would not take the glorious, if hard way to heaven, which God in his goodness gave to him. And he lost all he would not take pain from God's hand, and look to God for help. He was wanting in the fortitude, which trusting in God bears all things. He resisted and rebelled against the kindness of divine providence. He lost everything. There is a great lesson in this for all of us. God who loves us and who watches over us arranges the circumstances of our life so that they may be means for our sanctification and salvation. He appoints our way to heaven. If we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, and trusting in His help, are strong in bearing pain, He will purify us and prepare us through these pains, so that we shall rapidly attain to the joy of our Lord. But, if we do not accept God's arrangements, if we want our own way to heaven, God may cease to protect us, as in the case of the unfortunate man of Sebastian. St. Peter, in his first epistle, puts all this doctrine very clearly when he says, Be ye humble, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in the time of visitation. Cast all your care upon him, for he hath care of you. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little, will himself perfect you, and confirm you, and establish you. To him be glory and empire for ever and ever. Amen. Our Own Death The martyrs had no choice in their way to heaven. God wished them to accept the painful death inflicted by those that hated his holy name, and by this death to attain to the possession of himself. Their crown depended on their willing acceptance of this particular death, because it was the divine will. It was again a case of loving dependence on God, loving acceptance of what he wished them to bear. Their acceptance was an act of love, because for his dear sake they gave up their will to him. That single act of acceptance of pain for God's sake has placed them in the eternal possession of him to whom they surrendered themselves so perfectly. We, too, have to meet death, and we have to meet, most of us, the pains that precede death. But our death, with all its pains, will not be a matter of chance. The hour and the moment, the severity of the suffering, the length of the agony, all this is in the kind hands of one who loves us. He weighs and measures all with love. If we keep in His grace, nothing concerning us can escape His loving care. Not one sparrow can fall without Him. We are more value than many sparrows. We have a great act of love to make in the acceptance, with all our will, of the death God wills us to accept. It is an act we should frequently make during life, even every day. It is an act which prepares us to meet in great peace the reality of our transit to God. If we keep ourselves in the habitual state of willing acceptance of the death God desires us to meet, are we not being really conformed to Christ? The great work of his life was the submission of his human will in accepting the death that the divine will desired him to accept. We are really conformed to him, therefore, if every day, we accept with full will the sufferings and death that God wishes us to bear, just because He wishes us to bear it. This is love, and this love will be eternal. 
St. Paul puts it forcibly, If we have been planted together with him in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And our daily acceptance of death will have a very far-reaching effect on our present life. It will make it easy for us to accept with humility and bear with fortitude the sufferings, pains of body and mind, failures and ingratitude and criticism, and all the other little things we shall meet with during life. All come from the kind hand of God. We should accept them in peace for this simple reason. It is a most excellent practice to ask our Lord each morning to give us the grace to accept from His kind hands and to bear with patience the unknown annoyances of that day. In conclusion, loving dependence on God, childlike trust in His fatherly care of us, this is at the very foundation of sanctity. In this spirit we can pass the days of our pilgrimage with great contentment of heart. I superabound with joy, says St. Paul, in the midst of all my tribulations. Let us conclude by hearing this most consoling doctrine of God's care set forth by St. Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For if God be for us, who is against us? He that spared not even his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how hath he not also with him given us all things? Who then shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or persecution, or the sword? For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor might, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And to the Philippians, St. Paul speaks of the consequent tranquility in which we should live. Rejoice in the Lord always, again I say, rejoice. Let your modesty be known to all men, the Lord is nigh. Be nothing solicitous, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your petitions be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasseth all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Part 2 of the book Learn of Me, The Cross in Our Spiritual Life Chapter 4 the Lesson of Calvary, The Passion, A Satisfaction for Sin When we desire to meditate on the Passion, we bring the cross before us, we recall the facts of the Gospel story, we consider the details, we make a comparison between the accounts of the four Gospels. We contemplate the intensity of our Lord's sufferings, we try to bring home to ourselves His physical pain, and then his mental agony. These facts move us to wonder, to compassion, to sympathy. But it is possible to be lost in the details of the history. It is possible to know much about the sufferings, and yet know little of the sufferer. To know him who suffered, we must try to penetrate deeper. We must consider the interior of Jesus. We must contemplate the soul of our Savior. It is the heart of Jesus that attracts us to love, we must contemplate that sacred heart. We are conscious of the mystery that surrounds the awful scene of Calvary, and yet the sincere soul is convinced that it will be pleasing to God if it tries to penetrate some little way into this mystery. It is convinced that the mystery contains a further revelation of love, and also the explanation, as far as we can grasp it, of many of the spiritual problems that arise unbidden in the soul. We shall endeavor, therefore, to enter into the mystery of Calvary. We shall try to know more about the sufferer. In what spirit did he bear his pains? What was the attitude of the soul of Jesus as he hung on the cross? What was the disposition that was expressed by his willing suffering unto death? What object had he in view? Holy Church will guide us in seeking the answer to these questions. The Church tells us that our Lord suffered and died to satisfy for sin and to open heaven for us men 
and for our salvation he came down from heaven, and again he was crucified for us. These are the words of the creed. Jesus Christ, who hath loved us, says St. John, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He bore our sins in his body on the tree, says St. Peter. He atoned for our sins by his death. Calvary was a satisfaction for sin. The more we penetrate into the depths of this great work of satisfaction, the more we shall realize the depths of the love which made our Lord's final act so pleasing to the Heavenly Father, and the more we shall be drawn to return love for love. The Vatican Council, speaking of the study of the mysteries of religion, says, When reason, enlightened by faith, pursues its researches with care, piety, and sobriety, it reaches, with the help of God, a most fruitful knowledge of the divine mysteries. To understand the passion as an act of satisfaction for sin, we must first understand the act that called for satisfaction. We must consider the nature of sin. We are God's creatures, and by grace we are God's adopted children, or at least we have the power to become His children. Hence our disposition before Him should be a disposition of filial dependence, of childlike subjection. Our acts, our life, should be governed and directed by the fundamental truth that we are creatures of God and children of God, that God is our Father. We should live in loving dependence on Him. Mortal sin is the very opposite of this loving dependence. In every mortal sin we turn away from God, and we turn to some created satisfaction which we prefer to the divine will. In a single act of mortal sin we find, therefore, a double evil. First, mortal sin is a turning away from God. It is a refusal to be obedient to Him from whom we received existence, and who keeps us in existence each moment. It is a practical rejection of the first consequence of our position of dependence on the Most High. It is an act of disobedience to God, who is not only our Creator, but also our Father, who in His goodness has opened to us the entry into His own happiness. Turning away from God by refusing to be subject to Him is the fundamental malice of mortal sin. Because God is the source of man's existence, of his preservation in being, and of his final happiness. He is man's first beginning, and he is man's last end. There's another evil in an act of mortal sin. In committing mortal sin, the creature turns to a forbidden gratification which is preferred to God's good pleasure. Every sin is committed because man expects to satisfy himself in it. This turning to a creature is contrary to justice because preferring a pleasure to God means putting God in the second place, and thereby refusing Him the reverence which is His due, as man's first beginning and man's last end. All we've said of mortal sin applies in a special way to the sin of Adam, the father and head of our race. By that sin he lost all God's special favors, both for himself and his posterity and his descendants are born with the stain of that sin, deprived of sanctifying grace, and excluded from heaven. Adam and his posterity were incapable, by their natural powers, either of atoning for this sin, or of repairing the consequences. But God so loved the world as to give his only begotten Son, so that by him satisfaction might be made for sin, and grace merited. The Eternal Son, out of his pure goodness, out of his immeasurable mercy, came down from heaven and became man. For us men, and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was made man. He came to undo the damage done both by the sin of Adam and by the sins of all men. Now what precisely was the nature of the atonement and satisfaction for sin that our Lord made? Why was it necessary? that satisfaction to be perfect should be offered by God made man. Christ satisfied for sin by an act of obedience. Since mortal sin is a refusal to be subject to God, our Creator and our Father, it is evident that satisfaction for sin must, in the first place, include an act of willing submission to God, 
in other words, an act of loving and practical acknowledgement of the creature's total dependence on God and of God's supreme dominion over the creature. This act of subjection is the essential and central act of the work of atonement. Without it, atonement cannot be made. When a child is disobedient to its parents and refuses to submit, there can be no pardon given in reason and justice until the child submits and does as the parents direct. As the essence of sin is refusal to submit to God's authority, so the essence of atonement is willing submission to God's authority. St. Paul puts this very clearly when he says, As by the disobedience of one man many were made sinners, so also by the obedience of one many shall be made just. If we examine the case of the sin of Adam, we shall easily realize that to make perfect atonement for his sin, this act of submission to God must be made not only by a person of infinite dignity, since the dignity of the person offended is infinite, but also by a person who is the representative of the whole human race, for the whole race had sinned in Adam, in whom all sin, says St. Paul. Our Lord fulfilled these two conditions. The dignity of his person was infinite. As man he was the representative and official head of the human race, as Adam was. St. Paul refers to this when he speaks of Christ as the last Adam, and when he speaks of Adam as a figure of him who was to come, of Christ who was the new Adam. But our Lord also atoned for our personal sins. Christ bore our sins on his body on the tree, says St. Peter. He was our representative. And Isaiah says, The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. As head of the human race, all the sins of men were laid upon him. To penetrate into the mystery of our Lord's act of atonement, as far as our finite minds permit us, we must keep in mind that in Christ, as we've seen, there are two distinct natures, and therefore two distinct wills, the divine will and a distinct human will. I am come down from heaven, not that I might do my will, but the will of him that sent me. We are so much impressed with the divine person in our Lord, it occupies our imagination and our mind so completely that we may perhaps not keep clearly enough before us the two distinct wills that were in him. When we do think of his human nature, we're liable to look on it as giving him a capacity for labor and for suffering. We can easily forget that it involved the human will, which was distinct from the divine will. In the act of atonement, our Lord's human mind recognized a divine authority, and his human will submitted itself absolutely and lovingly to the divine will in all that the divine will decreed. This submission of his human mind and will was a perfect acknowledgment of God's supreme dominion and of the absolute dependence of all creatures, even of the created human nature and the created human will of our Lord himself. It was an act of absolute adoration. Consider now what was included in this act, the filial submission of our Lord's human will to the divine will involved submission to all that the divine will desired and decreed. Now it was the divine will that our Lord's obedience should be manifested by his actual and willing subjection to the life and work appointed to him. He was sent into the world of fallen and perverted men, that he might give an example of a perfect life, and that he might preach. He came, he said, to give testimony to the truth. Christ accepted the mission and all it involved. Behold, I come to do thy will, O God. Our divine Redeemer clearly foresaw that his life and teaching would involve the passion and death, for the leaders of the Jews would rise against the preacher of truth. His life and his doctrine contradicted their views, and his power made them envious. They would do away with him by having him crucified. It was the divine will that our Lord should accept all the consequences of his life and his teaching and even the pains of the Passion. Now our Lord's human will submitted reverently and lovingly to the death he had foreseen, and this bearing of death as the expression of his obedience 
he offered to God in atonement for the sin of Adam and for all sins. It was an act offered by a person of infinite dignity. It was an act offered by one who was constituted by God as head and representative and king of the human race. And by this act of submission, Christ repaired the refusal of submission to the divine authority, which is the first evil in sin. As by the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners, so also by the obedience of one, many shall be made just. Our Lord's own words bring out very clearly the fact that the Passion was an act of obedience. A considerable time before the close of his life he said, No man taketh it, my life, away from me, but I lay it down of myself, and I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. At the Last Supper, his last words before leaving for Gethsemane were, As the Father hath given me commandment, so I act. Arise, let us go hence. In the garden, just before he was taken prisoner, he repeated the same truth, saying, The chalice which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? The fundamental characteristic of our Lord's work in atonement for sin was therefore the fact that it was an act of obedience, obedience unto death. This way of looking at the Passion is that which the Church puts before us in Holy Week. The liturgy of the ceremony of blessing the palms deals with the events of Palm Sunday, the first day of that great week, but the liturgy of the Mass which follows is devoted to the Passion. The epistle chosen contains the words of St. Paul, telling us that Christ was made obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. The Church selects these words as expressing the way she looks at the Passion, and during the last days of the week she repeats them at every one of the canonical hours of each day, she repeats them in the Church, in the refectory, in every place. They evidently express her predominant thought. She leaves aside the multitude of beautiful texts of Scripture that speak of His Passion, and she keeps to this one. By so doing she teaches us that the Passion, before all else, was an act of obedience, and that by this obedience of Christ the disorder of sin was satisfied for. This great act of satisfaction for sin suggests some questions, the consideration of which will lead us to deeper wonder and more grateful appreciation of God's love for men, and we will take that up on side B of this tape. Let us continue now with the book Learn of Me and the chapter on the Lesson of Calvary. Why was the obedience asked of Christ so difficult? The supreme malice of sin is in the refusal of a creature to be subject in obedience to the Creator, and this malice was repaired by our Lord's obedience. But the smallest act of obedience made by Christ would be sufficient to atone for all sin. Why, then, did His Heavenly Father wish Him to be obedient unto death? The text of St. Paul which the Church repeats so often in Holy Week, gives an indication of the answer. To the words of the Apostle, the infallible Church has added, as an explanation, the words, For us. Christ was made obedient unto death for us. And from the Creed we learn that He was crucified for us. It was for our advantage, therefore, that the obedience was so extreme. It was for love of us, that his obedience was unto death. For to love is to wish what is good to a person, and to do all one can to secure that good. To understand how this was so will lead us to return love for love. The obedience of Christ in the Passion is a revelation of the wickedness of refusing to be subject to God. The Passion was divinely chosen that men might have some idea of what sin really is, and thus be led to avoid it. From this point of view, the divine choice of the Passion is simply overwhelming in the light it throws on sin. The astounding act of obedience on Calvary brings before us the fundamental wrongness of the disobedience of mortal sin. 
It brings before us how sin goes to the very depths of creation and attacks its immediate consequences. This it does by rejecting what is the very first duty of all rational beings, namely, the fundamental obligation of being subject to God. God alone is really supreme. He supports in existence all creatures. It is of their very nature to be dependent on God. How clearly the divine goodness shines out in the Passion. God, descending in love to the very depths of submission, even to pain and shame, that he might bring home to us, his fallen creatures, the immensity of the wickedness of refusing to be subject to our Creator and our Father. How true are the words, Christ loved his own to the end. The obedience of Christ in the Passion reveals the perfection of his subjection to his Father. With minds darkened through original sin, men would not realize the completeness of the loving subjection of the human will of Christ, except by a proportionate sign. They would not realize how the Savior's life was marked by unreserved surrender to his Father's will, except by an overwhelming sign. The sign chosen was the willing bearing of pain, of atrocious and prolonged pain, and finally the acceptance of death itself through obedience. Our Lord expressed the fact of his willing subjection to death when he said, Therefore doth the Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No man taketh it away from me, but I lay it down of myself, and I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. This death, lovingly accepted, was in very truth a most clear expression of complete and total subjection to God, the Sovereign Lord of all things. It was an act of adoration absolutely perfect, an act of adoration that was more pleasing than the sin was displeasing. Hence it atoned and satisfied for the rejection of God's authority, which was the first evil in sin. For all of us, it is most necessary that we be convinced of the unreserved surrender of the human will of Jesus to the will of his heavenly Father. Our advance in sanctity depends on our realizing this, for sanctity requires that we imitate Jesus in this surrender of our will to God. But Jesus is not only our model, he's also our encouragement, our inspiration, the source of our strength. He attracts us to imitation. The contemplation of the obedience of Jesus in the Passion will lead us to want to be obedient. It carries us on the way of obedience, obedience to God and to those that have authority from God. As obedience characterized all the life of Jesus, so it should characterize all our life. The law of obedience presses upon everyone. The religious must be obedient in all details of the rule and to all regulations of superiors. The priest must be obedient to the details of canon law and to all the instructions of his bishop. Child must be obedient to its parents, the wife to her husband, those employed to those that employ them. The supreme obedience of Jesus in his passion makes all obedience possible and easy, and more than that, to contemplate the passion as an act of obedience done for our sake should lead us to hate disobedience, not only the supreme disobedience of mortal sin, but even the disobedience of the smallest venial sin. This last is the first step in the way of supreme disobedience, the first step in the way of the eternal ruin from which our Lord, in his obedience, strove to preserve us. The Obedience of Christ was unto death. As we've already indicated, an act of sin can be looked at in two ways. In the one act, there are two evils. The creature turns away from the Creator, and the creature turns to some satisfaction which is preferred to God's good pleasure. In like manner, the single act of atonement can be looked at in two ways. It was an act of obedience, and was an act of bearing pain. It was obedience unto death. Obedience and death are two aspects of our Lord's reparation for sin. 
We shall now consider our Lord's atonement as a willing acceptance and bearing of pain, the pain of death. In every mortal sin, as we've seen, there is a violation of justice. Sin is a turning to a created satisfaction. It is an inordinate seeking for self-gratification. Sin involves the preference of a personal satisfaction to the good will and friendship of the Most High. Every sin is committed because man expects to find some advantage, some gratification in it. Now, preferring a satisfaction to God means refusing him that reverence which belongs to him as the Creator, as the first beginning and the last end of all creatures. Hence, this undue seeking of creatures is a violation of justice and calls for reparation. And the corresponding penalty is the enduring of pain. The straight line of rectitude in which our life should be directed and should tend to God has been bent to one side, to the side of forbidden pleasure. It must be rectified by bending it in the opposite direction, and this involves pain. And hence it is universally recognized that the natural reparation of sinful satisfaction is the bearing of suitable suffering, for pain is the opposite of pleasure. It is just, says St. Thomas, that he who has indulged his will more than he ought to have done should suffer something against his own will. In this way equality is re-established. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, head and representative and king of the human race, bore our sins in his body on the tree. He took our place. He willingly bore the sufferings of death and offered this willing bearing of pain to pay the debt we owed to the justice of God. He laid hold, as it were, of the pains inflicted on him and directed them to God as an expiation for the sinful pleasure-seeking of men. God's various attributes are manifested in the incarnation and the life of Jesus, his omnipotence, his wisdom, his kindness, his generosity, his justice. He might, it is true, and without any derogation to his justice, have forgiven sin without a suitable reparation. But the perfection of his justice would seem in this case not to be manifested so fully and clearly to men as were his other attributes. Our Lord, in his love for his heavenly Father and for us, was willing to bear pain that the divine justice might be clearly revealed. Thus it was that in the sacred passion both God's mercy and his justice shine forth. Mercy indeed to us sinners, justice in Jesus our head, our representative, our king, who submitted to the pain which our sins deserved. God, being infinite, is beyond our comprehension. We can never fathom any one of his attributes. His justice must be always more or less mysterious. Hence it is not astonishing that the relation between sin and the punishment of sin should be, to a certain extent, involved in obscurity. But the considerations given should lead us to accept the fundamental truth admitted by all mankind that wrong pleasure deserves pain, and that pain is the rectification of the order which was violated by forbidden satisfaction. The pain our Lord suffered in the Passion was most terrible, both in its intensity and in its duration. When in humble prayer we ponder on this and on the questions it suggests, we shall find a further revelation of God's love for men. Why was the pain that Christ suffered so extreme? God, as we've said, could have condoned sin without exacting satisfaction. He willed, however, that sin should not remain unpunished, and that reparation proportionate to the offense should be made. On account of the dignity of the person of Christ, the least pain he bore would have sufficed to manifest the perfection of divine justice and to expiate all sin. Why then? Why then, we ask, was the pain so terrible? Why was the passion so long? Why did the Heavenly Father will this? Why did Jesus accept the prolonged pain? It was for our sake. It was to teach us a hard lesson. It was to encourage us by his example to accept the law of suffering, to accept, to suffer, to recognize that suffering is necessary for us. Suffering is necessary for us 
on account of sin. It is necessary because of our past personal sins. It is necessary as a preservative against future sin. This is a hard saying, and who can hear it? We shrink from suffering, and yet for the sake of the eternal possession of God, we must accept willingly the pain that comes to us from the events of life, and be ready for the pain that comes from our own free acts in inflicting suffering or in refusing ourselves seemingly innocent gratification. We are united to Jesus in a most intimate and wonderful manner. He is the vine, we are the branches. He is the head of the body, we are the members. In the human body, if one part suffer, all the rest suffer. Christ suffered all he had to suffer, said St. Augustine, and to the number of his sufferings nothing is wanting. Hence the passion is complete, but in the head only. There still remain the sufferings of Christ to be completed in his body. These profound words tell us of the law of pain. Our own sins are to be expiated by the application to our soul of the satisfactions of Calvary. But, in the order of divine providence, this is done not only by the sacraments, but also by our own sufferings, which we unite to the sufferings of Jesus. Suffering in itself has no meritorious or expiatory value, but, if borne with patience, in union of will with the sufferings of Jesus, it brings to our soul his precious merits and satisfactions. By suffering thus, we become Christ-like. With Christ, I am nailed to the cross. This union in suffering is no mere imagination. As children of the church, we are united really with Christ, as the members with the head, and as the branches with the vine. As sinners, therefore, we should bear in patience the cross of the day, uniting it to the sufferings of Jesus. And we should, for the same reason, frequently refuse ourselves what gives us pleasure. It was to teach us this need of suffering for past sins that the passion was so long. It is our want of charity that prevents the perfect application to our soul of the satisfactions of Christ. Great love of God and great hatred of sin, says St. Thomas, remove the need of punishment, whether satisfactorial or purgatorial, and even if the vehemence be not so great as to exclude all punishment, yet the greater the vehemence, the less punishment will be required. But we have to consider another manifestation of the divine goodness in willing that Christ should bear extreme suffering. For love of us, our Heavenly Father wished this because of the possibility of our sinning in the future. Our first parents were created by God with their nature in perfect order. Their will was subject to God with ease, and their inferior powers were subject to reason. They could, without difficulty, do all their acts according to God's will, and in consequence God could develop in them the life of divine grace. Adam, by his sin, destroyed this harmony, and for us, his descendants, there is need of a continual struggle to reduce to order our unruly tendencies so that we may be able to conform our will to the will of God. Now the setting, in order of our inferior powers, involves pain. To bind our self-seeking tendency to the yoke of Christ involves great pain, the pain of constant self-denial and mortification. It is like the resetting of a dislocated limb, which by this severe pain of setting becomes again submissive to our will. The disorder wrought in us is rectified only by pain, and hence Christ atoned for sin by bearing prolonged pain, to show us the way we must walk if we desire to undo the effects of sin that still remain in each of us. Christ is the way. If we do not willingly accept this law of suffering, we shall never rectify the disorder of our nature, and in consequence we shall never keep away from sin. Unless you take up your cross every day and come after me, you cannot be my disciple. The daily cross, the contradictions, the sufferings of each day, patiently borne, in union with the suffering of Christ, will enable us to set our inferior nature in order, and thus our will can be kept in conformity with the divine will. But something is needed to enable us to bear the daily cross, 
Some preparation is needed to strengthen us. We must refuse ourselves some lawful gratifications. If we do not do this, we shall never persevere in carrying the daily cross with patience, and in consequence we shall never keep from sin. The cross, that is, pain, is necessary for us. Hence Christ in his love for us expiated sin by severe and prolonged pain to show us the way. Love was the motive force in the Passion. When we contemplate, even in a general way, the astounding act of atonement for sin which Christ offered on Calvary, we are almost forced to look into its depths and seek its ultimate cause or motive. This brings us face to face with an amazing mystery. The cause and the motive was mercy and love. Christ hath loved us and delivered himself for us. The human love of the Lord Jesus for his heavenly Father his human love for sinful men, he was called the friend of sinners, his divine clemency and most mysterious mercy for the human creatures that had rejected his divine friendship, these are the final explanations of the Passion. The Scripture puts the reality of this love before us. God so loved the world, says Christ, as to give his only begotten Son, to give him up to suffering to contempt, to scourging, to death. By this hath the charity of God appeared towards us, says St. John, because God hath sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we may live by him. The Son of God has loved me, says St. Paul, and delivered himself for me. In this we have known the charity of God, says St. John, because he hath laid down his life for us. The goodness and the love of God for us as revealed in the Passion, if pondered over, will draw us to want to be united with him in friendship, and as friendship means conformity of will, we are carried forward in the way of submission to his will, in doing all we do to please him, and in bearing the cross of the day in union with his Passion. In conclusion, the contemplation of the willing submission of Christ leads us, by his grace, to confidence and to charity because it reveals not only the loving human heart of our Lord, but also the divine goodness which was the ultimate source of all the marvels of the Passion. God, who is so rich in mercy for his exceeding charity, wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together in Christ. The crucifix should bring three thoughts before our mind, three words sum up the marvels of Calvary. The first word, is subjection. Christ was subject to the divine will in all he did. I always do what pleases him, he said, and he was subject in bearing all the pains that came to him, for they came with the divine permission. He was subject even unto death. The chalice which my father gives me, shall I not drink it? We also must be subject to the divine will in union with Christ, both in our acts and in our acceptance of what God sends or permits. The second word is patience. Christ expiated our sins by bearing pain, even the pain of death. Sin involved the seeking for forbidden satisfaction. That disorder is expiated by the bearing of pain, and Christ bore intense pain. We also must accept pain of mind and body in union with Christ, for it is only by such pain that the disorder which sin leaves in our nature can be rectified. And the pain of carrying our daily cross and of daily self-denial will affect this essential purification. The third word that the crucifix calls up is love. Christ suffered because he was a lover. He loved each of us with a tender, human, created love, and he loved us with an infinite, uncreated love. Love it was that brought him from the bosom of the Father to the dereliction of the cross. We also should be lovers. The crucifix calls for our love, and if we are not lovers, it is because the crucifix is forgotten. The crucifix draws us to Jesus. When I shall be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. If we yield ourselves to the influence of this divine love, we shall live in union of will with him, 
like him we shall be ruled by the divine will in all that we do and we shall bear in peace the cross of the day just because he wills us to be patient but the crucifixion was not the final end of the life of christ on earth before he ascended into heaven he lived a risen life a life of happiness of radiant contentment of peace my peace i give you it is the same for us the life of obedience and of patience in pain is not the only life we have to live on earth before we're taken to heaven according as our pride and false independence is destroyed by obedience and our pleasure seeking by the willing bearing of pain we rise to a higher life a life of peace of soul of deep contentment this is the risen life that we should live the life that god has planned for us the life of joy and contentment the life that we pray for in the mass of the holy ghost asking that we may ever rejoice in his consolation the risen life becomes more manifest in us according as our obedience to the divine will and our patience under god's kind hands becomes more perfect with us therefore the risen life and the life of crucifixion are lived together even here on earth we enjoy the peace of god which surpasseth all understanding we superabound with joy in the midst of all our tribulations rise let us go go with him who is the fortitude of martyrs to meet thy passion he went to meet betrayal mockery scourging pain upon pain and death rise as he did and go in peace to meet thy suffering whatever it may be for the time of conflict is over underlying the passion is joy fathomless joy the pain no matter how great passes away but the joy is eternal in the evening weeping shall have place and in the morning gladness a practical note in the holy mass we have a perpetuation of the supreme act of our lord on calvary because in the mass we have the human will of christ submitting absolutely as on calvary to the divine will acknowledging its own total dependence and expressing this subjection by a chosen sign the double consecration christ atoned for our sins on calvary by an internal act of loving submission to god an act of his human mind and will which he expressed externally by submission to suffering and death and which he offered up in atonement in so doing christ offered himself in sacrifice for a sacrifice is an external act which expresses the internal subjection and docility of him who offers it is a sign of the surrender of the soul of, to god hence saint thomas says that christ redeemed us by way of sacrifice that he should do so was the divine will hence to unite with christ in offering the holy sacrifice we must unite our dispositions to his dispositions we must become conform to him that is our mind must acknowledge god's absolute dominion and our total dependence on it our will must sincerely accept this doctrine and all it includes it must bend to the divine will in loving filial dependence like christ as man we should be subject and docile before the divine majesty and sacrifice is the expression of this docility that is it is the expression of the internal offering of ourselves to be spent in doing the divine will and to be dealt with by god according to his good pleasure all this being done in union with the offering of himself which christ perpetuates in the mass let us therefore each morning during holy mass unite our loving dependence to the loving dependence of our lord and by the holy sacrifice his merits will be applied to our souls in particular god will bestow on us the grace to continue all day in that state of loving dependence on him which was the characteristic of every moment of the earthly life of the lord jesus chapter five in the book learn of me the subtlety of self-seeking selfishness in regard to god the generosity of god like all his attributes is infinite god so loved the world as to give his only begotten son 
This generosity is manifested in the life of Jesus, and in particular by the way he gave himself for us. He gave himself to be our companion by the Incarnation, to be our food in the Holy Eucharist, to be our salvation on Calvary, and he will give himself as our reward in heaven. This generosity of God calls for generosity on our part, that we may understand better the disposition of soul known as generosity, we shall consider its opposite, selfishness. When a person is spoken of as being selfish, this means that his personal interests dominate him, that he thinks too much of himself. The selfish man loses the esteem of men, and every one would shrink from being called selfish. But we may be selfish in regard to God. This is very common and is rarely considered. To be selfish in regard to God spoils our whole life. It means real danger of damnation. But what exactly is this selfishness in relation to our Creator and our Father? To be selfish with regard to God means that our life, in some departments at least, is ruled by our earthly individual interests without reference to God, unless the fear of hell stops us. To be selfish regarding God is called self-seeking or self-centeredness. The opposite of that is the self-abnegation so often spoken of in the gospel. This we must now study. But first we should note the ideas signified by the three words, self-abnegation or self-denial, mortification, and penance. These words are used freely, one for the other, almost as if they were synonymous. This usage has led to a good deal of confusion of thought. In reality, these words suggest three very distinct ideas, on which we should be quite clear, no matter what name is given to them, and even though the same act may be referred to in all three ideas. In this study we shall restrict the meaning of each of these words to that one of the three ideas which is indicated by the derivation of the word. Mortification the making dead of some unruly tendency, is evidently a preservation from possible sin. Mortification looks to the future. Penance, the infliction of pain to make up for the seeking of pleasure in sin. Penance looks to the past. Self-abnegation, or self-denial, looks to our state at the present, and always we are creatures. We should note that sometimes the same act may be an act of mortification, of penance, of self-denial. Thus, fasting may be a mortification, to govern the unruly tendency of our physical nature, a penance to atone for our past sins, and an act of self-denial when it is considered as commanded. We shall begin by a study of self-abnegation. The Reason of the Gospel Law of Self-Abnegation in the Gospel we find our blessed Lord insisting repeatedly, and in the strongest terms, that in order to be his disciples we must practice self-abnegation. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. We all desire to be disciples of Christ, and hence we must understand the nature of this self-denial, this self-abnegation, which he postulates as a necessary condition for being his followers. Let us begin by considering the reason which makes the law of self-denial so necessary. That reason brings us back to the sin of our first parents. The gift of integrity bestowed by God on our first parents was a gift of order, the order of dependence of lower on higher. By that gift the lower powers of the soul were dependent on and obedient to the higher powers of intellect and will, and this dependence was to continue as long as man was subject to God. Original sin deprived men of this gift of integrity. Adam pursued his own desire of personal advantage without dependence on God. He would not stand in docile subjection to him who had drawn him from nothing. It was disorderly independence. It was a practical rejection of the fundamental truth of the dependence of the creature on the Creator. In consequence, the lower powers of the soul in Adam and his children were no longer subject to the mind and will. Each faculty or power of the sensitive, emotional, imaginative nature pursued its own peculiar advantage, independently 
of the control of reason. It sought its own satisfaction without regard to the good of the whole man, and irrespective of the lawfulness or unlawfulness of that satisfaction. This seeking for particular satisfaction by particular powers produced a general tendency in the whole man, a tendency to make self-satisfaction the object of activity, and to rest in this self-satisfaction without due reference to God. Self-centeredness became the outstanding characteristic of the descendants of Adam. This tendency to place self as the center of activity to the exclusion of God is the practical wrongness of man's fallen nature. Man is God's creature, therefore he belongs to God. Man is kept in existence each moment by the divine power. Each faculty of man's soul, each organ of the man's activity, is kept in existence every instant by God's action. Hence, every act of man, coming as it does from these faculties, belongs to God and must be exercised in due dependence on God. And hence, in very truth, God must be the ultimate end of man's activity. That is, God must be the center of man's life. To put self in the center of man's life is a reversal of the order of truth. This self-centeredness, this self-seeking, this worship of self, this independence of God, this making of self to be the moving power of our activity, this tendency of man's fallen nature being fundamentally wrong, must be checked by anyone who wants to prepare his soul for the perfect possession of God. A soul that desires God must cease to be self-centered, and it must become God-centered, that is, all its activity must be exercised in dependence on God. Here is the difficulty of the spiritual life. Here is the great work of the spiritual life. How can it be done? The answer is simple. This destruction of self-centeredness or self-worship, of independence of God, is affected by its contrary, by self-abnegation or self-denial. If any man will come after me, says Christ, let him deny himself. The Manifestations of Self-Seeking Our first and fundamental and essential duty, then, as God's creatures, and as God's children by grace, is to direct all our life according to God's will. The good pleasure of God must be the term of our acts. It must be the end of all our activity. St. Paul expressed this very clearly when he said to the Colossians, All whatsoever you do, in work or in word, all things do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. The first words, All whatsoever you do, show us that this instruction covers our whole life. Doing things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ implies that our activity is directed by God, by his divine will. This clear statement is not an isolated text of St. Paul. To the Corinthians he repeats it in a still more pointed way. Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever else you do, do all to the glory of God. This docile, childlike spirit was wanting in our first parents. Our father Adam wanted to be the master of his own happiness and not to depend on God for it. You shall be as God, said the tempter. A similar spirit is in all of us, his children, and it appears constantly in our daily lives. We want self-satisfaction, self-convenience, self-glorification. We are self-centered. We rest in self-satisfaction without due reference to God. In our activity we are not fully dependent on God. Self is our moving force. We want to be the absolute owners of our life, at least when sin does not seem to be involved. It is well to note the manifestations of this self-worship. If we are habitually preoccupied by and constantly striving after material advantages, good health, ease and comfort, reputation and success, and do not seek these things as means to the service of God, it is obvious that we are self-centered and self-seekers. But there are other forms of self-seeking which are not so obvious. There are occasions when self-seeking may be found frequently, if not always. We are discontented at the limitations we see in ourselves. 
What we want is the self-contentment that we think would come with higher gifts, with more perfect mental capabilities. Self is here the governing power. We want to be somebody. We are irritable, and we grumble at the bad health sent us by God. We want the self-satisfaction which comes with the perfect functioning of our body and its powers. We want for ourselves the health that makes life pleasant, and we're restive under its privation. In all this, self-satisfaction is the secret influence. We revolt against the absence of things because we want comfort. We shrink from poor surroundings because we want to avoid the sense of inferiority which poverty brings. And we love riches in our family and in our friends for the distinction it brings us. We get displeased or vexed with those who thwart our desires. We want the free will of others to be submitted to ours, our own self first. Another instance, we find it hard to submit to authority, because we do not want our wills to be restricted. We willingly submit when authority gives orders according to our views. Self is the real motive power. In order to get our own way, we may seek to please a superior. Detestable, self-seeking, many deceive themselves in this. Examples of engineering a superior are not rare. Some may even be tempted to boast of it. Any superior can be deceived by this way of acting until he has evidence of want of sincerity he judges a subject to be sincere. All this is obvious self-seeking. Again, we make unreal excuses for our faults and mistakes. We shrink from inferiority. We want the contentment of being perfect. We speak our very frequently of ourselves. We begin many sentences with I. What is behind these habits? Are they signs of a soul that is self-centered? Our self-centeredness may be very hidden. Consider these cases. We spend ourselves in work for others. We think we're seeking God. In reality, we may be seeking and resting in the sense of the superiority which doing charitable work gives us. A charitable person is one who is very superior, who is somebody. Again, we rebel against the society in which we find ourselves if those we associate with do not, by accommodating themselves to us, help to make life smooth. It is self-satisfaction in life we want. We, we break down under some sudden temptation. We're distressed about it. Is the cause of our distress the fact that God has been offended, or is it the fact that our weakness marks us with the mark of inferiority? We are so warped by our past self-centeredness that we may be self-seekers even in our sorrow for sin. Our distress may be due to disappointment at not reaching an ideal of natural goodness, which self-love has enthroned. If we're scrupulous, we are often self-centered. A scrupulous person is frequently a self-seeker. The scrupulous seek to be sure that they have not sinned generally for the sake of the satisfaction of self that is found in this assurance, and not because sin is so hateful to God. This is manifest because they are unwilling to subject themselves fully to God, by obedience to his priest, in act and will and mind. Again we're self-seekers in matters of judgment. We are resentful if anyone criticizes our friends or what we regard as ours, because all that pertains to us, to self, must be perfect, and it is a humiliation for us if they are declared inferior. We want the self-satisfaction of being thought to be superior beings. For the same reason, we resent criticism of ourselves. Nothing in us must be inferior. We're unwilling to acknowledge that we are beaten in an argument. We cling to our own opinion with obstinacy. We shrink from the inferiority of failure. To judge another correctly requires knowledge, prudence, experience, and discretion. Hence, when we set ourselves to criticize, we are assuming all these qualities with the superiority that they imply. To be conscious of this and to act in consequence is most gratifying to our self-love. The critic is usually a self-seeker, a self-centered person. Criticism is the refuge of incompetency. We will continue with the subtlety of self-seeking in the book Learn of Me on tape number three. Please join us.
continue now with the book, Learn of Me, Materials for Meditation on the Spiritual Life and What It Requires of Us, by Rev. John Kearney, CSSP. The chapter on the subtlety of self-seeking. Self-seeking in success and failure. One of the common forms of subtle self-seeking appears in our attitude toward success or failure. This should be considered carefully. For we all have work to do, we all have duties to fulfill, and our activity is followed by success or failure. In our toil for the works given us are we, perhaps to a certain extent, seeking the good opinion of men. Success means reputation, and hence we seek success. In all this we are seeking what pleases our vanity. We are simply seeking to excel in the minds of others. This, of course, is such a gross form of self-seeking that anyone can detect the pride inherent in it. But even if we count as little what men may say in our praise, yet we may still be self-seekers in our striving after success. We may work very hard at the duty given us by obedience and do all we can to make it succeed. In this we think we are working for God, but in reality we may be working to make our work succeed because it is our work not because it is God's work. We seek to succeed in our own eyes. An example will make this possibility clear. Perhaps in the past we've striven to make a work succeed, and we thought it was concern for God's interest that moved us. But when the work was committed to other hands, its success did not seem to concern us much, and yet it was then as much God's work as it was when we had charge of it. If we had thought of this, the fact would have shown to ourselves what our motive really was. We were, all the time, seeking ourselves in our success. If God grants us success, we must be careful not to rest in the thought of our own excellence, in the thought that we have worked wisely and well. Success is from God. I planted, says St. Paul, Apollo watered, but God gave the increase. Who gave us the health, the time, the surroundings, the external helps? If thou hast received, says St. Paul, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received? When we shrink from failure, is it not because it stamps us with the stamp of inferiority, and so wounds our pride, our desire of excellence, of excelling? This shrinking appears in our trying to get out of duties when superiors wish us to keep them. Of course we may do this through seeking our own ease and comfort. This is obvious self-seeking. But frequently we may try to get out of a work because we do not wish to have on us that stamp of inferiority which partial failure may bring. Again we object to take up a particular work which our superiors ask us to do. We say it's beyond us, and in this we think we are humble. The saints refused positions of dignity because they feared they might offend God in the position, but others refuse because they shrink from failure, they shrink from the character of being inferior persons with which failure would brand them. Take this example. A man, call him A, has a work to do. He knows how it should be done. If he had the help of X, he could do it perfectly. His superiors give him Y. Y is a hopeless bungler and is careless. A cannot bring the work to perfection. It's a failure. A is very vexed. He loses interest. He wants to resign, to throw the work there. The real reason very often is that his pride is wounded by the humiliation of failure. Instead of all this, he should just have gone ahead and done his best. God does not ask us to do a perfect work, but to do our work perfectly. How different is the really humble man? The man who is really selfless takes up the work given him. He may point out his incapacity to the superior, for the superior may not see it clearly, but if the superior still desires him to go on, he does so. He knows that what God wants from him is to do his best, and leave the results in the hand of him who can, if he so wills, make the inferior man succeed, and permit the superior man to fail. Again, we fly from failure, and seek ourselves when in spite of facts we persuade ourselves that it is not we who have failed, the failure was due to another cause. 
we seek the satisfaction of success in our own mind. We will not face the truth of our inferiority. We want to contemplate our own excellence, which is so much the object of our desire and effort. In all cases, such as we considered, we forget that failure in the eyes of men may be success in the eyes of God. We do not know fully what God's designs are, but we know that if He permits us to work hard and get no visible result, it is part of His merciful plan for our sanctification. Hence, failure should be welcome to us because a good God permits it. It should be welcome to our mind, even if it stings our sensitive nature. We have abundant opportunity for self-purification in the circumstances of our life which are related to success and failure. Let us strive to enter into the designs of God for our sanctification in these circumstances. To summarize, if we are self-seekers, we want persons and things to suit themselves to our manner of living, and we resent all that does not minister to our well-being, to our self-love. St. Paul saw those around him infected with this self-worship. All men seek the things that are their own, not those that are Jesus Christ's. These self-centered motives enter into the best of our good works and tarnish their perfection, even if they do not destroy it completely. It was this vision of self-seeking that made the saints despise themselves. St. Teresa spoke of her wickedness. St. Francis said he was the most wicked man in the world. St. Chantal said she had to turn away from her own soul, which was a picture of hell. Self-seeking in hell. Death fixes the soul forever in the disposition it is in at the last moment. Consider a soul dying in mortal sin, no matter of what kind. That sin involved the direction of the will to what satisfied self, but was seriously displeasing to God. That self-centered disposition remains forever. That adherence to self never changes. Self was chosen and loved above God, and the wild grief of the soul in hell for the acts that brought it damnation is self-centered still. It suffers endless remorse because it caused its own sufferings and not because it displeased God. Here is eternal, self-centered, useless grief. It is like the repentance of Judas. What keeps so many good people from sanctity is subtle self-seeking, want of subjection to God. They're willing to avoid what seems to be wrong, in this they're often to a great extent following their own judgment and not subjecting themselves to God. They're willing to do a number of particular good acts, prayer and work. Here again these things commend themselves to their natural judgment. But they want to keep the ownership of their life, especially of certain departments, and this clinging to ownership is present, although they do not perceive it, both in their avoiding of evil and in their doing certain good things. In a word, they are unwilling to surrender the full ownership of themselves to Him who owns all. Now self-denial means primarily this surrendering of ourselves, this giving up of our will to God. The Correction of Self-Seeking Because of original sin, we are inclined to self-assertion, to self-seeking, to self-centeredness, to living regardless of our absolute dependence on God. If we desire to live in perfect docility to Him, we must eliminate from our soul all these forms of self-worship. Now self-worship is corrected by the practice of childlike subjection to God, and this means self-forgetfulness, self-abnegation, self-denial. But what precisely is the nature of this self-abnegation, this self-denial? Self-denial or self-abnegation is the elimination of self as to a motive power in our actions. This means that in every external act and every internal movement we so control ourselves that we are moved uniquely by the will to procure the good pleasure of God. In a word, Self-denial is handing over the reins of the control of our existence and life to God, our Creator and our Father. Here is an instance in which many fail to be thus subject to God. 
It is in the order of divine providence that we, like our blessed Lord, are to live surrounded by men, like ourselves, infected with original sin, and perverted by the results of personal sins. Hence they may cause us suffering. We must subject ourselves to these trials as true men who are Christians, mindful of the dignity of our fellow creatures. If we tend to rebel against our surroundings, we need to do the violence required to bring ourselves into subjection to God's providence. All men are infected by original sin, and hence all are weak in will and clouded in mind. We have no right to demand that all those around us should be perfect. We should accept the fact that we're living among weak men and not rebel against this fact. To rebel against our surroundings, our companions, is to seek ourselves. Such rebellion seldom comes from zeal. A soul dependent on God recognizes its limitations and accepts the truth of its own disorderly nature against which it has to strive daily and hourly. It does not demand in others a perfection which it recognizes as wanting in itself. It passes over the external blemishes of others. It reverences them as tabernacles of the Most High. A soul that is absolutely dependent on God is always in God's hands, in a spirit of childlike docility. Such a soul may feel things keenly, but it accepts in peace the events of everyday life, because God's kind hands are in all of them. It should be clear to us now that self-abnegation and filial subjection to God are like the two faces of the same metal. If we deny ourselves, if we do not make self the motive power of activity, then God will easily be that motive power. We shall therefore be subject to God. In a word, if we are subject to God, we must be practicing self-denial. And if we do not practice self-denial, we are not subject to God. The foundation of holiness consists in our humbly recognizing and willingly accepting the absolute dominion of God and our total dependence on Him with all the consequences that flow from this truth. Although God has raised us, by His grace, to be His children, we never cease to be His creatures, and no matter how exalted is the grace in our souls, we are totally dependent on Him, our Creator and our Father. Holiness, for us, consists in our will, freely and fully surrendering itself to the attraction of God, who is supremely attractive and therefore merits to be sought above and beyond all else. This is love. But to yield ourselves freely and fully to the divine attraction, it is necessary that we resist both the attractions of earthly satisfactions and the repulsion that pain exercises on us. This demands self-denial, for self-denial implies our being proof against the attractions of pleasure and strong against the fear of pain. There is no possibility of real holiness if we seek ourselves in a habitual way. Holiness, in the full sense, means the union of our soul with God by the possession of the life of grace, and this is conditioned by the directing of all our powers to God according to the orders of His holy will. The Practice of Self-Denial Self-denial, as we've said, means giving over to God the reins of the control of our life. This self-denial implies the destruction of self-assertion, self-seeking, self-centeredness. It implies that we do not rest in self-convenience or self-satisfaction as the term of our endeavor, but that our endeavor reaches farther, even to fulfilling perfectly the divine will in all we do. From our study of self-denial it should be clear that it is commanded and that to disregard it involves sin. Its object is that we may become God-centered. The manifestations of self-seeking given here and the illustration showing the nature of self-denial suggest at once very important occasions for practical self-denial. But as we must be very clear on how we can make this necessary self-abnegation enter into our life, we shall give some further practical instances. Self-denial in our relations with others The first kind of self-denial we must make to enter into our lives is that which is involved in our being charitable. 
to avoid every word and every act that might cause inconvenience to another, and to do this to please God. What constant self-denial this involves! To look out for occasions of rendering service to another. This is the very opposite of self-seeking, and it demands a constant repression of self. The exercise of politeness requires real self-forgetfulness. Self-denial in the use of our time we must not allow the use of our time to be controlled by caprice. Hence, punctuality and fidelity to duty should be a first exercise of self-denial. In a word, we must use life not as something from which to extract satisfactions for ourselves, but we must consider and use it as being a means to the service of God and to spiritual progress. Self-denial in our work We must do our work because God wills that we do it. We must give our heart to our work. We must not set our heart on our work. That is, we must work hard and take interest in our work, but we must not make an idol of our work. To prevent this, we should maintain a certain interior aloofness in regard to the work we have to do. We may work with pleasure, but not for pleasure alone. Self-Denial in Carrying the Cross what our Lord insisted on most particularly in this matter was the carrying of the daily cross. If any one will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross every day and follow me. He that taketh not up his cross and followeth me is not worthy of me. Whosoever doth not carry his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The daily cross is nothing else than the daily annoyances and contradictions and failures and humiliations, the daily hours of spiritual dryness or darkness, the daily hours of pain of body or of mind. We should note that in each case our Lord declares that we must carry the cross, that is, not lie down under it, and each time he adds that we must follow him. This implies our imitating him in carrying the cross, without complaint or grumble, and doing this to please God. Here we have the most practical occasions for subjecting our life to God, that is, surrendering the government of our soul to Him with real self-abnegation. Our fallen nature abhors pain of body or mind. It wants the self-satisfaction that is implied in the absence of pain. If we cannot secure this, we seek ourselves in seeking the luxury of a grumble. When we're patient and content under the daily cross, although we feel it, we are keeping ourselves in our true place before God. We are really His docile children. Self is not the governing power in our life. Self is replaced by God. We are practicing with perfection the duty of self-abnegation. Self-denial in protracted suffering. Suffering purifies us from self-seeking. But we must be very careful here. It is not enough to accept a particular suffering. Such acceptance may coexist with the expectation that the suffering will cease and we can resume our ordinary life, our self-seeking life. We must do more than accept a particular suffering. We must accept to suffer. We must keep ourselves in God's hands for the present and the future. In summary, Self-abnegation destroys the seeking of self to which we are so inclined, seeking of self in body or in mind, in temporal things or in spiritual things. But this death is only a means to life. We must destroy the seeking of self in order that we may seek God, seek to please God, seek to possess God. It is not the wrong we have done that keeps us back from sanctity. God can and does blot out that from our soul in a moment. The obstacle to sanctity is the wrong that is in us now. What matters is not what we have done, but what we are. It is our being self-centered. It is our aiming at and resting in self-satisfaction without reference to God. It is this that impedes our progress in the spiritual life. The destruction of self-seeking will be slow. The perfection of surrender to God is only attained by degrees and few attain to its absolute perfection. 
As we advance in the surrender of our souls to God, in other words, in conformity to His will, He gives us more light to see, in the depths of our soul, the reality of the self-centeredness that still remains. When the truth of what we are comes before us, we must not be discouraged at what we see in ourselves. We must go to the God of goodness for help. In our effort to purify ourselves by mortification and self-abnegation, we can count on God's help. He gives us His grace, and moreover, He Himself takes the work of purification in hand and affects it by trials, dryness, and darkness. The Happiness of Self-Abnegation, Peace, and Pain When we contemplate, in a general way, the gospel narrative of the infancy and childhood of our blessed Lord, we find constantly present two apparently contradictory characters, peace and pain. Life in the Holy Family was a happy life. We cannot think of our Blessed Lady and St. Joseph as being otherwise than happy in the true sense of the word. We cannot look into their souls without seeing their unspeakable peace, deep contentment, and tranquil happiness. God was with them. But with all this we have pain also. We see the hardship of the cave, the absence of all comfort, physical suffering. We see the want of sympathy and the rejection at Bethlehem, the loneliness of the cave, the solitariness of the exile in Egypt, the suffering of heart. We see the anxiety of Christmas night, the fear because of the satellites of Herod, the suffering of mind. It is the same in our spiritual life. In the soul of those who are striving to live for God, we find peace and pain. They have profound peace and tranquil contentment. They know by holy faith that God cares for them. That's enough. And all this is true, even in the times when God tries His favored servants by permitting spiritual darkness to come down on them, for even in the midst of the deepest darkness they have always childlike trust in the divine goodness. They would not have things otherwise than as God desires. Not my will, but thine be done. But with the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, there's always the mark of the daily cross. The soul that is really striving to live for God has already made a great spiritual act, an act which implied the rejection of all that is displeasing to God, of all earthly attachments that might stand in the way of perfect union of the human will with the divine. And perseverance in that rejection and that renouncement means continual pain, for our fallen nature seeks itself, and all renunciation that is complete and radical implies the destruction of inordinate self-seeking. In the life of such a soul a day has come which is called the day of conversion, the day in which the light of God's grace showed the soul the desire of God's goodness that the creature should live with him in the union of love even while on earth. On that day the soul knew that this life of love implied the union of the human will with the divine will, and that this union required complete detachment. And drawn by God's grace, the soul accepted the law of self-denial because it was the necessary condition for union with God, and by accepting and living that law it entered into the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. The happiness of the soul that constantly practices self-denial is really a foretaste of the happiness of heaven. Such a soul tastes the contentment which the saints tasted even in this life, the contentment that made St. Paul cry out, I superabound with joy in the midst of all our tribulations. A revolution, not a resolution. A revolution means a change of government. One ruler is put out of power, and another takes full control. If the new government is good, the subjects look forward to a time of peace and contentment. But the actual time of revolution is a time of suffering. A revolution takes place in our spiritual life when the ruling by our own will, when our self-centeredness, is put out of power, and the divine will is established in full control of every detail of life. The change involves suffering. This revolution is called by spiritual writers the second 
conversion. This usually occurs some years after we first give ourselves to God. It took place in the apostles when after three years passed in following Christ, he told them that there was a further conversion needed. They were to become as little children, that is, they were to live in loving dependence on God's will, as little children live in loving dependence on the will of their parents. This second conversion often takes place in the time of retreat. In such a case, the retreat has resulted not in a resolution, but in a revolution. St. Ignatius says a retreat is a series of exercises to enable a man to conquer himself. Chapter 6 In the book Learn of Me Self-Abnegation, Its Nature, and Its Necessity Nature and Grace The Futility of Trying to Satisfy Self Without Offending God The author of The Imitation has a most striking chapter on the movements of nature and grace. In this chapter he puts before us two utterly different human lives, utterly different because they are dominated by two utterly different principles, and have as objective two utterly different ends. One is dominated by the idea of pleasing God, the other is dominated by the idea of pleasing self. Here are some extracts from this profound analysis. Nature is crafty and draws away many, ensnares them and deceives them and always has herself for her end. Grace walks with simplicity, turns away from all appearance of evil, offers no deceits, does all things purely for God, in whom also she rests, as in her last end. The whole chapter should be studied, as it sets before us the warfare of the Spirit. God and self are the two claimants that dispute the allegiance of every human soul. Grace and nature are but other names for the same two claimants. If a soul seeks to please God in all its activity, if being conformed to the divine will is its constant objective, that soul is truly religious and is really happy and will advance in grace. But if a soul has as objective the satisfaction of self without due reference to God, such a soul can neither be truly religious nor really happy even if the things it seeks are not obviously sinful in themselves. The object of God's actual grace is to lead us to the subjection of our will, to the divine will, in other words, to lead us to act in all things for the motive of pleasing Him. But nature and self urge us in the directly opposite way. It is self-satisfaction that is their object, self-satisfaction as an end in which we may rest, without reference to God. Doing what we like, for the sole reason that we like it, is making self-satisfaction our end. Instead, we should do what, in fact, we like because God will be pleased with our doing it. Whether we eat or drink or whatever else we do, we must do all for the glory of God. All must be done as God desires, and done because it pleases Him, although eating and drinking may give us pleasure. The great effort of the spiritual life must be directed to the elimination of self-satisfaction as the moving force in our activity, and to the replacement of it by the divine will. In a word, the work of the spiritual life is the destruction of self-seeking, so that we may let ourselves be guided by grace and live in childlike docility to God. To live thus is to live the only real life and to enjoy here below the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Some Catholics are content if they resist the tendency to self-satisfaction when there's a question of mortal sin. This position is untenable. Sooner or later, generally sooner, they will fall into mortal sin. Other Catholics are determined to resist a tendency to self-satisfaction when venial sin is clearly involved. This position is practically untenable. A soul cannot persevere in this determination. The real object of such a soul is to please itself, to seek self-satisfaction, but it wants to do this without offending God. To please God is not its first objective. The spiritual outlook of such a soul will soon become clouded, and the determination of its will, being without the support of abundant grace, cannot last. Safety, for such a soul, is in a change of purpose, 
It should aim at pleasing God. It must give up the positive pursuit of gratifications for their own sake, without dependence on God. The character it must look for in an act is not that it is not wrong, but that it is right and proper and pleasing to God, and hence profitable to eternal salvation. In a word, such a soul must strive to destroy self as the motive force in its activity. The principle just stated is of supreme importance. Those who try to avoid evil, and this only, will never succeed. They are for the most part self-seekers already. But those who try to please God will be blessed by Him and will succeed in avoiding evil. The fatal error of trying to satisfy self without offending God has wrecked the spiritual life of innumerable souls that to all appearances were ordinary good people. Hear the words of Christ, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world keepeth it unto life eternal. The Characteristics of Self-Abnegation To strive to please God in all things, and not merely to avoid displeasing Him, involves going against the inclinations of our fallen nature. It involves severe and constant self-abnegation. Self-abnegation, or self-denial, as we've said, is the violence we must do to our nature in order to keep ourselves in our true position before God, that is, in a position of childlike docility, being ruled by His will in all that we do. Now there are some characteristics of self-denial that we should keep in mind. In the first place, self-denial must be a daily exercise. Our Lord asks for this, saying, If any man will come after me, that is, if he will be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross every day. These clear words of Christ imply that it is not enough to practice self-abnegation now and then in seasons of penance. Self-denial, self-abnegation, must be our daily bread. This follows from our state of continual and absolute dependence on God. Hence, St. Paul, speaking of himself, said, I die daily. That is, I die every day to self, that I may live to God. It is easy to see that the constant resisting of the impulse of sense and the impulse of independence demands a daily going against ourselves, a daily self-abnegation, a daily death. The word daily implies another important truth. Self-denial must consist in little things, because opportunity for great things does not come every day. Now where shall we find most readily the occasions for daily self-denial? The commandments, charity in particular, the religious life, the annoyances of each day, all these present to us abundant occasions of conquering our self-seeking tendency. But if we particularize, we shall see more readily what we can do. Take one of our besetting infirmities. In resisting this, we have our first self-denial. Following from, and indeed included in, the necessity of daily self-denial is a second characteristic, namely, that self-denial must be universal. All along the line we must deny our tendency to seek self. Our Lord is here our example. St. Paul quotes the prophetic 39th Psalm, in which the psalmist, speaking in the person of Christ, says, In the head of the book it is written of me that I should do thy will, O God. And in another place, the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of St. Paul, says, Christ did not please himself. Christ did not act merely from the motive of pleasing himself. He did many things that pleased him, because it was the divine will that he should so act. But Christ, as man, never sought for satisfaction independently of the divine will. He himself sums up all his activity by saying, I always do the things that please him. The words did not and always spoken of Christ tell us of the necessity of our being constant in refusing our inclination to make self-satisfaction our object and to rest in this object. Do not think you are safe if you do your duty in ninety-nine points and neglect the hundredth. The hundredth is the ground of your self-denial. 
We must therefore stand by our Lord's words, in which he asks for daily self-abnegation, and we must stand by his example. I always do what pleases him, he said. And St. Paul says, Christ did not please himself. False Ideas of Self-Abnegation, What Self-Denial Is Not Our understanding of the nature of self-abnegation will become still more clear if we investigate the false ideas of self-denial, which coming before the mind cause a certain confusion in our understanding of this fundamental principle of holiness. Self-denial is, as we've so often repeated, the handing over to God of the reins of the control of our life. Self-denial involves the violence we require to do to ourselves, that we may keep ourselves in a state of docility to God. With this description before us, we can proceed to answer the questions which propose themselves to all who seriously consider the law of self-denial. The answers will clear our minds regarding some false ideas of self-denial. The questions are, does not constant self-abnegation seem impossible and unreasonable? Is sinless self-seeking possible? Is it ever possible to seek self-satisfaction without displeasing God? The answers are simple. There can be no such thing as impossibility when it is question of a law laid down by Christ. The law of self-denial must be reasonable. A little explanation will make this manifest. Self-seeking, in the strict sense, can never be lawful, can never be orderly, because self-seeking means seeking what suits ourselves without reference to God, and hence without due dependence on Him. Self is the moving power of our activity. We seek and we rest in self as our end. This involves our ignoring the full meaning of the fact that we are God's creatures. But if we seek something that suits us, something that gratifies us, because this seeking is according to the divine will, then what we do is good, for example, reasonably seeking food. In reality, this is not self-seeking, but seeking to please God. Thus we can choose the recreation we like when we know that it is God's will that we recreate ourselves, provided the recreation we select is reasonable. Disorderly self-seeking rests on self-advantage as an end. Orderly seeking for what suits us makes self-advantage to be a means to God. To put this in a few words, we must seek to possess God and all that leads to God. If we do not seek God, we are naturally led to seek ourselves. The wrongness of disorderly self-seeking is in the fact that it ignores the full consequences of the truth that we are absolutely dependent on God. Hence we may define self-seeking as a practical refusal to live in total subjection to our Creator. God has appointed an excellence which He desires us to seek. This excellence is the possession and the development of that divine grace which makes us His friends and His children and leads to His kingdom. It is therefore our duty to seek this supreme excellence to strive to advance in grace. And we can also seek whatever helps us to this excellence, but all this must be done in the way appointed by God. From this it is manifest that to seek an earthly excellence or gratification which is not a means to grace is inordinate self-seeking, because we are both seeking a false excellence and pursuing it independently of God. It is also inordinate if we seek to advance in grace in ways not appointed by God but chosen by ourselves. This, again, is obvious self-seeking. In a word, earthly things must be sought as means, food, rest, and so on, as means to fulfilling God's will, to possessing God more perfectly by increasing in grace. Things must not be sought for their own sake, in other words, as an end. We cannot put this doctrine better than by repeating the words of St. Paul, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever else you do, do all for the glory of God. In a word, it is the intention, it is the motive that determines the value of acts which are not in themselves sinful. From all this it is manifest that we can seek pleasure as a needful or useful recreation. God wishes this. 
St. Thomas speaks of the virtue of etrophilia, which directs and moderates our recreations, and he reminds us that in such relaxations we must never let ourselves get completely out of our own control. From this it is also manifest that provided we do all things to please God, we are not displeasing Him, though we find that what we are doing gives us pleasure. Our Lady took every care of her divine babe, because it was the divine will, and the joy she experienced in ministering to him did not diminish the perfection of her act. We are now in a position to realize the falsity of certain ideas of self-denial. We can state clearly what self-denial is not. Self-denial is not the refusal of all satisfaction. Pleasure has its use. God wishes us to use pleasure, but as a means, not as an end. Self-denial is not the exclusion of seeking what we, as a fact, find to be pleasant. Seeking for what, in fact, satisfies us may be obligatory. Self-denial is not the same as mortification or penance. It is wider, more universal than either. This last point requires some further explanation. And we will take that up on side B of this tape in the book Learn of Me by Reverend John Kearney. We continue now with the book Learn of Me and the chapter on self-abnegation. Mortification and self-abnegation are often confounded and as a result what is correctly affirmed of one is incorrectly applied by the hearer or reader to the other. Much confusion of thought follows in these most important matters. For instance, people come to the conclusion that since mortification cannot be continuous, self-abnegation may be left aside for a time. This is absolutely false. Self-denial is necessary for all, and at all times. Without it, we cannot live in perfect union with God. Mortification is, for the most part, something added to this necessary self-denial. It is the outer defense. It is a preservation of what is necessary. I chastise my body, says St. Paul, and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself may become a castaway. The self-seeking tendency in us leads to acts which are in themselves sinful. It also leads to acts not wrong in themselves, but defective when they are done without due dependence on God. The self-abnegation that resists this twofold tendency is clearly of obligation. But there are many free acts which are lawful, and which are at times very pleasant, and which we may do to please God, such as, for example, lawful and suitable recreation. If for a supernatural reason we refuse ourselves these pleasures, we are practicing mortification. It will be easily seen that on account of our self-seeking tendencies, most acts of self-denial are also acts of mortification. Mortification need not be constant. Self-abnegation must never cease. Mortification need not be universal. Self-abnegation must be all along the line. Self-denial is related to the precepts. It is a precept itself. Mortification is a counsel, at least in general, although some mortification must be practiced. Hence the Church imposes fasting as a reminder of the utility of mortification and the necessity of some mortification. The choice of further mortification is left to the individual. Mortification consists in doing something painful to self, or refusing to gratify self. Self-denial consists in relinquishing self. Mortification is a help to self-denial, but a necessary help, in the sense that we must practice some mortification. Those that are Christ's, says St. Paul, have crucified their flesh with its vices and desires. That is, the disciples of Christ have practiced severe mortification, but self-denial is wider, is more universal and more continuous than mortification or penance. Mortification is the doing to death of a particular disorderly inclination. Self-abnegation is the obliteration of ourselves as a controlling power in all our activity. Mortification may proceed from self-determination, and hence it must be controlled by direction. 
it may go to excess, and hence must be limited. Self-abnegation, which subjects our will to the divine will, needs no limitation. Mortification may be positive by inflicting pain, or negative by refusing pleasure. Self-denial need not involve pain. We can practice self-abnegation when we do the very thing we like, when we enjoy what we do. It is a question of our motive. But self-denial usually includes mortification. Mortification is not as difficult as self-abnegation. It implies giving pain to self. Self-abnegation consists in ignoring self. Mortification can coexist with self-seeking of a marked kind in some direction. From all the above it is manifest that the boundary line between self-denial and mortification is not perfectly definite. Because of the difference of temperament and the presence of habits, good or bad, the extent and limit of self-denial may vary very much, so that a practice which would be a necessary self-denial for one might be a free act of mortification for another. For example, under self-denial some come such acts as refusing ourselves a particular satisfaction, innocent perhaps in itself and lawful perhaps for others, but which for us is an occasion of sin. To refuse ourselves this is not a free mortification, it is a necessary self-denial. In summary, in speaking of self-abnegation and mortification, we should keep well in mind these characteristic distinctions. Self-denial must be continuous, because we must always be subject to God. We must never rest in self-satisfaction as a final end. Mortification, which is the outer defense, needs not be continuous. By mortification we prepare ourselves for the self-abnegation which is implied in our being always subject to God, always keeping our will in loving conformity to the divine will. Our attachment to self-satisfaction as an end is so rooted in the disorder of our nature that even with genuine mortification we shall not reach perfect detachment from self, perfect self-abnegation, until God takes our soul in his own hands and purifies it by suffering. Hence it is that the mortified saints suffered so much exteriorly and especially interiorly. Our Lord was always subject to the divine will. I always do what is pleasing to him, he said. Self-seeking was utterly and absolutely absent. But mortification appeared only at times in his life. He fasted and was hungry. He spent nights in prayer. Mortification was not the outstanding character of our Lord's life, but his self-abnegation was absolute and continuous. Christ did not please himself, said St. Paul. He himself said that he came eating and drinking, and that men in consequence reproached him as a glutton and a drinker of wine. They said he was not as mortified as the Baptist. But his life was lived each moment in dependence on the divine will. My food, he said, is to do the will of him that sent me. An Examination of Conscience on Self-Abnegation How can we examine our conscience on this great law of self-abnegation? First of all, let us keep before our minds that as creatures of God and as children of God, we must live in docile dependence on his divine majesty. This means that we are permanently disposed to accept from God's hands the cross of each day, that is, disagreeable events, contradictions, failures. How do we accept and carry these crosses? If we do not accept these, we are self-seekers. If we do not accept, we are self-seekers. If you do not take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. In the second place, all our activity must be governed by the desire to please God in every respect. I always do what pleases Him, said Christ. Now is our dominating intention the intention to please God. If we're merely determined to avoid sin, we are still, almost certainly, self-seekers. We may, with profit, concentrate on some particular action, and regarding it we may ask ourselves, was that done to please God? Could that act as we did it, and with the motives that impelled us, be offered to God? 
could we say that it was done for the glory of God, as St. Paul directs? To practice self-abnegation, it is not necessary for us to be continually thinking of pleasing God, but this must be our dominant intention. It must govern our lives. The mother who has full care of her baby is not always thinking of her child, but the welfare of the little one is the dominant desire and intention that both directs and checks her activity. What counts in the spiritual life is our permanent disposition to please God, not merely to avoid displeasing Him. This constant disposition is the result of repeated acts. And for our consolation, let us remember that this disposition is not utterly destroyed by passing faults of weakness. The compass needle has a permanent tendency to point to the pole. If it is diverted to one side or the other, it rights itself immediately. There is a force which, acting on it, brings it back to the position in which it points to the north. So it should be in our spiritual life. The permanent and dominant aim must be to please God and to carry our cross in patience, to which disposition we return at once, after any passing disturbance or fault. A correct idea of a dominant intention is so important that we may consider some other examples. A serious-minded student is preparing for a difficult examination. He is competing for a very prominent post. If he succeeds, his future in this world is safe and suited to his tastes. He is set on securing success. He is determined to strive to win it. For this he knows that every hour of clear-headed study will count. During the weeks and months that precede the test, he has one dominating idea, the examination. He takes his rest and his recreations, but the dominating idea, as it leads him to take these, also guides their length and quality. He does not think continually of the examination. He takes real relaxation. But the fact of the examination is always influencing his life. His activity is governed by it. It acts both as an inspiration and a restraint, an inspiration to work, a check on excessive, if innocent, recreation. Consider a man who has a fixed determination to make money. This idea directs his activity. He's not always thinking of money-making. He may think of other things. He may even be generous sometimes. But the idea of profit to be made, or loss to be feared, is always ready to influence him in whatever he does. He's never really free from the influence of this dominant idea. To take another illustration. Consider the tide and the waves of the sea. The tide is steady in a fixed direction. The waves may vary. They move across the tide or against the tide. They come from accidental causes, the wind, the coastline, or even the passing of a large vessel. In spiritual life we must see to the set of the tide, the permanent tendency, the constant desire to please God, to do His will, to carry His cross. This fixed disposition can be acquired by frequently determining to be guided by God's good pleasure in all that we do. The waves, the casual disturbances, the passing weaknesses will not do much harm if the spiritual tide sets steady in the one direction. The short weakness of St. Peter did not prevent him from being a great saint. These considerations make it plain that a mere offering of our day to God will not be very effective if the dominant and permanent motive in our life is to extract self-gratification from living. The influence of such an act in these circumstances will not extend very far. Many are deceived in this. The morning offering should be the expression of the state of a soul which wishes to please God positively in all acts of that day. In this case, the morning offering intensifies that existing disposition and is thus very valuable. To preserve in us the dominant idea of doing all and bearing all to please God, we should pray frequently for the grace needed, renew this intention often and earnestly, and keep in mind that God dwells in our soul. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Self-Abnegation and Charity 
It is very remarkable that our Lord in the Gospel emphasizes the doctrine of the self-abnegation much more than the doctrine of love, of love for God and for our neighbor. He undoubtedly declares clearly and strongly that the commandment of love is the first commandment, that on this commandment depends the whole law, that love is greater than holocausts and sacrifices. But he declared this only when asked what was the greatest commandment. The Holy Ghost has recorded his answer three times in the Gospels. On the other hand, our Lord, without being asked, came back constantly to the doctrine of self-abnegation, and he stated it in terms which perplex us by their strength and their absolute character. Thus we read in St. Matthew, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. St. Luke adds that he must do so every day. And in the same gospel, we find the doctrine repeated with the addition that if a man does not accept it, he cannot be a disciple. St. Matthew, according, recording another instance of similar teaching, says, He that taketh not up his cross and followeth me is not worthy of me. All these are powerful and penetrating assertions of the necessity of self-abnegation. But we have other presentations of this necessity. Our Lord propounded the same doctrine in the paradoxical form. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world keepeth it unto life eternal. These remarkable words, so arresting, so provocative of thought, occur with variations as many as seven times in the Gospels. The repetition indicates the frequency with which our Lord must have used them, and also the desire of the Holy Spirit that we should observe them and consider them. The reason for the contrast between the brief statement of the law of love and the repeated statements of the law of self-denial is this. We cannot be lovers of God unless we practice self-denial. The more we eliminate love of self, the more the love of God will develop in us. Once we're in a state of grace, we have in our soul the infused theological virtues. They come with grace. In particular, we have the infused virtue of charity, which is inseparable from grace. This virtue is the power by which we can love God in a divine manner, in such a divine manner that we really enjoy friendship with Him. It is by returning His love in a divine way which is absolutely above our natural powers, that friendship is possible, for friendship is a mutual love, and it is by charity, therefore, that we live as God's friends. Now there's one thing that prevents the virtue of charity from blossoming out into acts of divine love, and that thing is the disorderly love of ourselves, our disorderly self-seeking. In consequence, there's only one way for us to become great lovers of God. We must destroy self-seeking. We must destroy it utterly. This explains why our Lord so emphatically and so repeatedly insisted on the need of self-abnegation. If we do not seek to satisfy ourselves, we shall advance in love, for we are setting free the virtue of charity. And the more we deny ourselves, the more the virtue of charity will influence our life. The virtue of charity, given us with grace, is accompanied by another set of favors, the gifts of the Holy Ghost. These produce in the soul a certain sensitiveness and docility to the action of the Holy Spirit. The sails of a ship, if spread, make the vessel sensitive to the least breath of wind. If they are furled, the ship is not sensitive. In like manner, the gifts of the Holy Spirit make the soul sensitive to the least influence of the Holy Ghost. Self-seeking thwarts this effect. It's like furling the sails. Now the action of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of love, is to develop love in us, to develop charity, and make it manifest itself in our doing everything through love. All this magnificent machinery, devised by the goodness of God, to enable us to advance in love, and thus to enter into more intimate friendship with Him, all these marvelous virtues and gifts and graces are held up, as it were, by our self-seeking. 
No man can serve two masters. We cannot seek God and seek ourselves independently of him, but cast aside self-seeking and we shall naturally and easily seek God. Charity will be unhampered. Charity will develop in our souls. We shall become great lovers, and even for creatures like us, by the divine goodness, it will be possible and easy to love God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and all our strength. Chapter 7 In the Book Learn of Me Our Savior Before Pilate Sincerity and Compromise A Typical Self-Seeker, A Man Who Compromised there are certain fundamental truths related to our Lord's Passion, which, although very familiar and apparently very simple, are only penetrated and realized by prolonged pondering and repeated prayer. But to realize even one of them may have the most far-reaching consequences in our spiritual life. One such truth is the personal relation of the Passion to myself. Our Lord suffered every pain for me. He accepted every humiliation for my sake. It was all so much for me that it would not be mine in any greater degree if I were the only soul for whom he died. All this is very familiar doctrine, but its very familiarity seems to prevent our fully grasping its significance. Christ suffered each pain for me because he wanted to atone for my personal sins. He wanted to take the burden of my sins on himself. He accepted willingly all the shame all the humiliations, and the distress of mind and pain of body, because he wanted to merit for me the graces I need to advance in holiness. To remember this fundamental truth is most necessary, for we may all be tempted to discouragement, either on account of the weight of our past sins, or on account of our failure to advance in sanctity. To resist such a temptation, we should recall that he took all our sins on himself, and that through his blood all graces can be ours if we appeal for them through his merits. How generous Christ has been in bearing all for me! How completely he gave himself up for me! I must then serve him with generosity. I must then surrender myself, surrender my will to him without reserve. Anything less than this may lead to my losing him forever, or at least to my never attaining to the union with him to which, in his goodness, he has called me. And hence, to compromise with conscience, to try to serve both God and earthly interest, to give Christ only half-hearted service, half-hearted love, all this should be regarded with dread and horror. Now the history of a man who compromised with conscience is set before us in the history of Pontius Pilate. And the story of Good Friday morning put side by side the compromise of this man, and the completeness of our Lord's generosity. Let us consider this contrast. Pilate compromised because he was a lover of self. Our Lord was generous. He was a lover of men. Pilate compromised because he put his personal advantage before all else, his reputation with the emperor and the future promotion he wanted to secure. Given these, he would be just and even generous. Souls that are self-centered are often so in one point only. They're pious in a way, and want to do God's will in all things, except the things that concern that one point. They have their pet interest, or desire, or ambition. They cling to their will in this point, and this one thing in which they want their own way spoils the completeness of their surrender to God and keeps them on a low level of sanctity. This desire to secure the one thing on which their heart is set leads them frequently to compromise. To compromise means to steer a middle course between a great sin and a manifest duty. It implies a want of generosity with God. It is a shrinking from the hardship involved in duty. It is a fear of great sin, but a willingness to commit a smaller sin, or at least to be ungenerous with God. The Roman Governor The Gospel tells us that on Good Friday, when morning was come, all the chief priests and the ancients of the people took counsel against Jesus, that they might put him to death. It was the second time that our blessed Lord appeared before this tribunal of the Jews. 
After a short examination, they brought him, bound, and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Pilate at this time lived in the fortress called Antonia, which was adjoining the temple on the northern side, and there our Lord was brought. But as the gospel records, the Jews did not go into the governor's hall themselves, lest they might be defiled. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, was the least bad of all the bad men who had a hand in our Lord's death. He was not a very malicious man. His general intentions were good enough, but he was not willing to pay a great price for the carrying out of his good inclinations. He was like so many educated and refined people of the present day, both in the world and in religion, who will be good as long as goodness does not demand a real sacrifice. In a word, Pilate was a self-seeker. Our blessed Lord was not altogether unknown to Pilate. The Gospel expressly tells us that Pilate knew the priests had delivered Jesus up through envy. And indeed, the sharp Roman governor could not have been ignorant of the doings of the young prophet, who was so much talked about, who had worked such wonderful miracles, and whose triumphal entry into the city had taken place only four days previously. Pilate, therefore, was rather suspicious of the real nature of the case which the Jewish priests and the council were bringing before him. He went out to meet them, and at once asked, What accusation bring you against this man? And they answered, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up to thee. Now these words showed their determination. Pilate then said, Take him, you, and judge him according to your law, as if he said, the punishment of the lash which you can inflict ought to be enough for a case like this. It's not unlawful for us, they avowed, to put anyone to death. They wanted death. They made that clear at once. When the members of the Sanhedrin were pressed for a definite charge against our blessed Lord, they brought forward a threefold indictment. We have found this man perverting our nation, forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he is Christ the King. They wanted a death sentence given for political reasons, not for religious reasons. A sentence, an execution, by the Romans. The first few accusations could not deceive Pilate. This sudden zeal for Rome was not genuine, but the words Christ the King were something new. Pilate turned, re-entered the hall, and called Jesus before him. The Roman governor was now face to face with our Savior. What thoughts and feelings rose in his heart and mind as he looked on the meek Lamb of God? Most likely, pity, mingled with a little suspicion. The prisoner did not look like a malefactor, and Pilate knew that he was delivered up through envy. The Lord Jesus read his soul. He saw a cultivated mind, but an earth-bound heart, a man who would like to do the right thing, but who would make no great sacrifice to carry out his good intentions. Jesus had infinite compassion for one who had some good aspiration, and he who was so silent when accused was ready to speak at length with Pilate. The governor went straight to the point at once, and asked Jesus, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? The answer of Jesus was intended to make Pilate think, and thus see for himself the injustice of the accusations. Looking up at the governor, Jesus answered, Sayest thou this thing of thyself? or have others told it to thee of me? As if he had said, Do you really want information, or are you only repeating an accusation? If I ever claimed earthly royalty, you certainly would have known all about it. St. John has preserved for us a few lines of the conversation that followed. The conversation probably took place in Greek, which was well known in Palestine, and came to the apostles by the shorthand reporter's notes. Our Savior dismissed all idea of earthly royalty from the governor's mind, and lifted the discussion to a different and a higher level, by saying that his kingdom was not of this world, that he had come into this world to give testimony of the truth. What is truth? said the governor. He hardly thought of the meaning of his words. He wanted to break off the conversation, so he turned away without waiting for an answer. Pilate's mind was made up. He saw that the prisoner was in no way a conspirator or a disturber of the public peace. The very appearance and the bearing of our Savior, his meekness, his dignity, the divine expression of his face, the sight of all these was a grace. Virtue went out from him. 
The eyes that looked at Peter and so moved him had also looked in Peter on the Roman governor. The voice that spoke as no man had ever spoken, that had fascinated even those who were sent to take him prisoner, the mystic kingdom that was not of this world, that was not from hence, the life devoted to giving testimony of the truth, all these things had profoundly impressed Pilate. Grace had almost triumphed at the very outset. The prisoner must be released. It would be a crime to punish in any way such a man. So Pilate goes out at once to the Jews and declares, I find no cause in him. It was a sentence of acquittal. Pilate had just asked, What is truth? If he had really meant the question and accepted the truth and acted upon it, he would be a saint in heaven today. But he only played with the word truth. We should ask our Lord to give us the grace to do what Pilate neglected to do, really to desire to know the truth, to accept the truth when we know it, and to do what truth demands. Our Savior Sent to Herod The sentence of acquittal was received with loud clamor and renewed accusation. Jesus was brought out and accusations redoubled. Amid all the confusion Jesus was silent. And then Pilate said to him, Dost thou not hear how great testimonies they allege against thee? But Jesus was still silent, so that the governor wondered exceedingly, and this wonder confirmed his opinion of the innocence of Jesus. But the determination of the accusers made Pilate hesitate. His self-seeking began to appear. He did not wish to become unpopular. He saw his duty clearly. He said to Jesus, I have power to release thee. He should have used that power. He should have acted as the proconsul Gallio acted when St. Paul was brought before him in Corinth. He should have cleared the court and dismissed the case. He should have acted as he himself acted when he said, What I have written, I have written. In like manner he should have said, What I have judged, I have judged. It was the personal interest of Pilate that made him hesitate. His foot was on the ladder of promotion, and he did not want his ascent impeded by any report of unpopularity in Judea. As the accusation continued, he heard, This man stirreth up the people, beginning from Galilee to this place. The word Galilee struck him. Jesus was a Galilean. He saw a way out of his difficulties now. He would send the prisoner to Herod, who ruled in Galilee. In a word, he would compromise. It was his duty to see that justice was done in the cases brought before him. He wished to avoid condemning this innocent man, but he also wanted to shirk the duty of liberating him. So he compromised, and Jesus was conducted across the city to the palace of the Maccabees, where Herod lived. The judge had compromised. He had taken a middle course. But the Lord Jesus did not compromise. He did not take a middle course. He did not use his divine power to escape from or to diminish, diminish his sufferings. He wished to bear them for our sake. He had taken the chalice his father had given him, and he would drink it to the dregs. All through the morning hours of Good Friday we have before us the compromise of Pilate and the completeness of the sacrifice of himself which our Lord made. Pontius Pilate was greatly relieved now that he had managed to pass on to someone else the final decision of this unpleasant case of the young prophet from Galilee. Jesus was gone, the governor was satisfied, and yet he felt he had not acted justly. He was not absolutely a hard-hearted man. In a certain way, he was just, but he was not prepared to suffer for justice' sake. Blessed are they that suffer for justice' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The vision of the prisoner, his dignity, his patience, the words he spoke, all these kept coming back to the mind of Pilate. This we can hardly doubt. God's grace was knocking at his heart. As Pilate was musing on these things, word was sent to him that Herod had sent back Jesus, that he did not consider him deserving of any special punishment. It was, moreover, announced that the Jews were again outside in the court, clamoring to see the governor about the same case. Pilate was vexed that he had to face this unpleasant question once more. What was he to do now? The innocence of Jesus was confirmed by Herod. It was certain. 
but there was the clamoring crowd to be satisfied. Conscience called one way, temporal interest called the other. At last he hit on a new plan for escaping his difficulty. He had at the moment a notorious prisoner called Barabbas, lying under sentence of death for robbery and murder. Pilate knew that, according to custom, the governor always released one prisoner on the festival day of the Pasch. He would give the people their choice between Jesus, who had gone about doing good, healing their sick, and the scoundrel Barabbas. Jesus had done good to the people, their vote would save the situation. He went out, therefore, to meet the people, and as St. Luke records, he spoke, saying, You have presented to me this man as one that perverteth the people, and behold, I have examined him before you, and find no cause in this man, in those things wherein you accuse him. No, nor Herod either, for I sent you to him, and behold, nothing worthy of death is done to him. And then he made his proposal. Whom will you that I release to you? Barabbas, or Jesus that is called Christ? Pilate began by once more proclaiming the innocence of Jesus, but mark the injustice of the compromise that follows. The prisoner is a wronged and injured man. Pilate has power to release him. Justice calls for his release. But no, he's put in the scales of opinion with the murderer Barabbas. After having declared him innocent, Pilate compares him with a man known to be guilty. Yes, the all-holy God, the good and compassionate Lord Jesus, is put in comparison with a murderer. He had foreseen it last evening in the garden. He had accepted it. Not my will, but thine be done. It was for us, for our sins, he had accepted this fresh injustice. Alas, the sacred heart of Jesus has often received similar humiliations, for even those whom he has dearly loved have gone so far as to put his love and friendship in comparison with an earthly attraction, with something viler, perhaps, than the wretched Barabbas, and to decide against him. But even for such, the Lord Jesus is unbounded in his goodness, and he will come, he will even run to meet those who have put his friendship in the scales with a thing of this earth if only they will turn to him. The Vision of Pilate's Wife While waiting for an answer from the people, as appears from St. Matthew, Pilate gets another grace. He gets a warning of the gravity of his crime if he condemns this innocent man. As he was sitting in the place of judgment, his wife sent to him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. What was the vision that so terrified this Roman matron and made her suffer so much? Was it the vision of this just man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and majesty and calling all mankind, calling Pilate himself, to appear before him for judgment? Was it the vision of the future of Pilate, his recall to Rome after three short years, the confiscation of his wealth and his banishment to exile? The very words of the message tell us that the vision in dream must have been serious and terrible, and the warning fitted so well with Pilate's mind at the moment that for him it certainly was a strong reminder of his duty. It was another appeal of grace. The leaders of the Sanhedrin had meanwhile been busy among the people, persuading them to ask for Barabbas. Their influence prevailed, and soon Pilate heard the choice, Not this man, but Barabbas. It was a public rejection of Christ by the whole people. The governor's plan had failed. His second attempted at compromise had only entangled him all the more in the difficulties of the case. Pilate did not wish to proceed to the crucifixion of a man against whom he found no case. The mysterious dream of his wife and the words of her message moved him much and determined he determined to make another attempt to avoid pronouncing the capital sentence but at the expense of a new and brutal injustice. All for some trace of an honest man's generosity in the heart of the cowardly governor, and the court would be cleared, the case would be over, and justice would be done. But generosity was wanting. Pilate would try another compromise, but first he would speak in favor of him who he knew to be innocent. 
St. Luke records how at this stage Pilate again spoke to the people, desiring to release Jesus. Ah, these false and unreal desires that have no positive will behind them. But they cried out once more, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, Why, what evil hath this man done? I find no cause of death in him. I will chastise him, therefore, and let him go. He begins again by declaring the innocence of Jesus, but look at the logic of the compromise. I find no cause in this man, therefore I will chastise him. This man has done no evil, therefore I will scourge him. Our dearest Lord was now abandoned to the cruelty of the soldiers. He was stripped of his seamless garment, he was bound to a pillar, he was brutally scourged. Profane history tells us what a Roman scourging was like and we shudder to think of what our beloved Lord suffered under the lash. He bore it in patience. He thought of each one of his children. He offered the pain of his scourging for all sins of wicked indulgence. His generosity in bearing all for us contrast with the compromising spirit of Pilate. He had taken our sins upon himself, and hence he was like a lamb before its shearers, and he opened not his mouth. To atone for our disobedience, he was obedient, even unto death. Pilate tried to reflect and rest during the scourging. He was weary of this case. Surely scourging would satisfy the people. He gave the soldiers ample time to work their will on the helpless prisoner, and then he once more summoned Jesus before him. Our Savior was led in, clothed in the purple garment, crowned with thorns and streaming with blood. Pilate was moved. Grace spoke to him again. These soldiers of mine have gone too far. But the sight of the man in this pitiable condition will certainly soften the people, and my difficulty will be settled. Ordering Jesus to be led after him, Pilate went forth again and said to them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no cause in him. Jesus therefore came forth, bearing the crown of thorns and the purple garment. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Look at the condition to which he's reduced. Is he not punished enough? Yes, the pitiable condition should soften all hearts. It should soften ours. Where is our faith if it does not move our hearts and turn them to him? Jesus, our Redeemer, our King, our God, crowned with thorns, streaming with blood. But look into his sacred heart as he stood before the crowd. He'd been the subject of compromise all the morning. Compromise that had ended in the deadly scourging, in the shame of the crowning, and in the ignominy of the purple garb. But that sacred heart was unchanged in the way he looked on his sufferings and looked on us. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. There was no compromise in him. The sight of Jesus in this most wretched condition had no effect on hearts that were hardened by envy or blinded by prejudice. St. John records that when the priests and their followers saw Jesus, they cried out again, Crucify him! Crucify him! Jesus was rejected in public for the second time. The governor's plan had once more failed. He had tried to serve two masters, conscience and temporal interest, and he had failed. As Christ had said, he must fail, for no man can serve two masters. We will continue with our Savior before Pilate, on the next tape, in the book, Learn of Me. We continue now with the book, Learn of Me, by Rev. John Kearney, CSSP, and the chapter on Our Savior Before Pilate. Pilate heard the shout, Crucify Him. He saw the surging crowd. He still hesitated. He would like to deliver Christ, but he would not risk his promotion in so doing. Take him, you, and crucify him, he cried, for I find no cause in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Pilate now heard for the first time this accusation. The prisoner had claimed to be the Son of God. At once there rushed to his mind all he had heard about the miracles of Jesus, the vision his wife had seen that very day, the patience, the majesty Jesus had shown, the kingdom that was not of this world. 
St. John tells us expressly that when Pilate had heard this saying, he feared the more. Was the prisoner, perhaps, more than man? It was another grace. Pilate entered the hall again and called Jesus. He was subdued now, and fear was in his heart, and with something approaching reverence he said to Jesus, Whence art thou? Jesus gave him no answer, because Pilate could find the answer he wanted in his own heart. Pilate therefore said to him, Speakest thou not to me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and I have power to release thee? Yes, he had the power to release, the power to do what was right, and it was just the possession of this power that made him uneasy and anxious in conscience. Jesus reminded him that this power which he possessed would have to be accounted for before God. Thou shouldst not have any power against me unless it were given thee from above. Therefore he that hath delivered me to thee hath the greater sin. By these last words our Savior let Pilate see that he read his heart, and that in his justice he distinguished his sin from the sin of the Jews. The virtue that came out from our Lord again moved Pilate. St. John tells us, from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. Grace seemed to have conquered. The governor was at last determined to do what was right, and to exercise his power in the interest of justice. But when he came before the people he was greeted with a last threat, If thou release this man, thou art not Caesar's friend. It was all over now. His weak and half-hearted good resolution could not face the prospect called up by these words. The displeasure of the Roman emperor, the displeasure of the man that ruled the world, meant ruin for Pilate. So he cast justice and virtue to the winds, and through fear of temporal loss yielded consent to the very crime which he had been weakly trying to avoid all the morning. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. He sentenced Christ to be crucified. O oh God, what thought the angels as they gazed on the scene with adoring love? Jesus, the all-holy God, the just man, Jesus is condemned to death, condemned to the cross, condemned as one unworthy to walk upon his own earth, condemned by a cowardly judge, at whose heart God's grace had been knocking all that day, who received warnings from heaven and warnings from his own conscience. Yes, he'd been warned, but the warnings were not heeded. The voice of conscience was stifled, grace was resisted, and he was now condemning the innocent one to death, and he knew it. For even at the moment of giving sentence his conscience so smote him that he tried, even then, to shift the responsibility of his act to other so shoulders. So, taking water, he washed his hands before the people, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man, look you to it. Vain ceremony, which only testified to his guilt in condemning one whom he called and knew to be a just man. And the whole people answering said, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Jesus was rejected a third time by his own people. For the judge, compromise had ended in crime. Beaten and humbled, Pilate turned and entered his palace. Less than two months later, not far from the same spot, a fisherman stood and faced the crowd and said, Ye men of Israel, the God of Abraham, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom you indeed delivered up and denied before the face of Pilate, when he had determined to release him. But the author of life you killed, whom God hath raised from the dead. The story of Pilate is the story of those who are ungenerous in God's service. It is the story of everyone who tries to serve two masters, conscience and earthly interest, who wants to make a compromise when God calls him to be sincere and true. Such a man may keep off the sin he fears for a time, but sooner or later he will be driven from his illogical position and carried on to the very sin he was at first determined to avoid, carried on, like Pilate, to crucify again the Son of God and make a mockery of him 
as is done by every mortal sin. There always seems a great deal to be said in favor of compromise. This great deal to be said constitutes the temptation. There is apparently a lot to be said in favor of every temptation. If there were not, it would cease to be a temptation. There are many in hell today whose ruin began by a compromise with conscience. The voice of God speaking in their conscience called them to the right. The world and its spirit, its comfort and ease and convenience, in a word, self-seeking, called them to the left. They wanted to serve two masters. They wanted satisfaction in this life and salvation in the next. They failed because the thing is impossible, as Christ himself has said and they will curse their folly for all eternity. Therefore we have erred. The wicked one does not mind the means he takes, provided he does us harm. One man will be tempted to make a compromise with duty, with grace, on one particular point. Another will be tempted to compromise on a totally different question. But in one form or another we must all expect this temptation. Let us consider some examples. Compromise in charity. I've been very much offended or injured. Grace tells me how pleasing to God would be an absolutely generous forgiveness. On the other hand, retaliation is sweet to fall in nature. Now, I would never wish to harbor serious hatred or desire of serious revenge, but between that and generous forgiveness, how many degrees of compromise? And alas, self-seeking may take the way of compromise in this matter of charity and forgiveness. If you follow up the spiritual history of those that compromise, from slight resentment they pass to more serious resentment, and finally, by word or deed, they satisfy this resentment. They give in to the very sin they were determined to avoid in the beginning. Compromise in Affection I notice that there has arisen in my heart an inordinate affection for another person. I know that my intimate affections must be controlled, and I would not for the world admit any affection that would seriously displease God. I know also that safety and grace and facility for prayer lie in the sternness with which I refuse myself all indulgence in this matter. But between these two I may be tempted to try to steer a middle course and doing so often ends in yielding to the very captivation which in the beginning was regarded with horror. Compromise in Conversation Many there are who in the beginning of life were determined to preserve God's holy grace at all costs. They get among companions, they find themselves in society where the conversation is not what it should be, where all that is most sacred is spoken of with disrespect, where the holy practices and the wise laws of the church are scoffed at, or where the conversation is such as to make the angels weep. The warning voice of conscience is heard. It would be easy to express their disapproval by their manner, by leaving the company, or by speaking out their mind quietly when they know that they may do good in thus speaking. But no, they say nothing, they compromise like Pilate. They do not mean to approve of the sinful lives of those whose conversations they hear. They do not mean to commit a serious sin, but they fear what people would say. They want to satisfy conscience and human respect. They want to serve two masters. If their mother was insulted by word, they would not stand it. But if Christ is insulted, alas! Follow up the history of the man who thus compromised. From cowardly listening he passes to half-hearted but secret approval, and so on step by step, until he is led again to crucify by a sin the Son of God and make a mockery of him, to crucify the Son of God by the very sin he was determined to avoid in his first compromise. Compromise in Reading How many there are who begin life determined to be good Catholics, to keep the faith, to cling to the church, to make sure of the one thing necessary. Books come in their way which are written in a spirit of secret hostility to the faith and to the church. When they've read the first few chapters, conscience speaks to them in no uncertain voice and warns them 
that since they are not expert theologians, these books may be a danger to them, that the church forbids such reading. Conscience calls one way, and it would be easy for them to do the right thing, to shut the book and put it in the fire. But no, they compromise like Pilate. They do not mean to follow the author of the book. They do not mean to give up the practice of their holy religion. They mean to be good Catholics. But they object to the discipline of the all-wise church, which restrains their liberty in reading such things. They want to be able to say they've read this book, which other people have read. They want to be with God and to be with God's enemies. They want to serve two masters. They want to serve God and to serve the world. Follow up the history of those who thus compromise. You'll often find they've given up all practice of religion. They've lost the treasure of treasures, their faith, their holy faith, to which in the beginning they were so determined to cling. Compromise in duty. A responsible position has been given to me, and in consequence a duty has to be done, and by myself personally. It is my duty. Now I want to escape it, and yet I do not want to see it neglected. So I manage to pass it on to someone to whom it really does not belong, as Pilate sent Jesus to Herod. I think myself clever. I've wriggled out of the difficulty but it looks like a compromise. It is simply self-seeking. Follow it up. If this self-seeking view prevails, I will later on neglect the duty when I can find no one to do it for me. Compromise in Religious Vows We had the determination at the beginning of our religious life to keep our vow of poverty most carefully. We were willing to bear the sting of poverty. The temptation comes. We wish to keep something, or to dispose of something. We want to satisfy self. Of course, we'd never break our vow. We think we have a sort of permission. It's included, in some extraordinary way, in another permission. It's like a compromise. A vision comes in time of retreat. We can say we've suffered much in prayer because of this matter. It's the dream of Pilate's wife again. God is calling us to give up this thing. We fear that we may be led very far by it. We compromise again. We will practice poverty. We will give up this and that, but not the real thing. Pilate would release Barabbas, but not Christ. Later on we go a step further on the way of weakness. Rather than make the sacrifice now, we find ourselves ready to do something of which we would naturally be ashamed. Pilate was even led to scourge an innocent man. Finally, we hear a remark from a superior telling us that we have no permission. Then we give up. Things are gone too far. We cannot help it now. What would be said of us if we acknowledged what we've been doing, if we ceased our way of acting? We are forced, we say, to a breach of the vow. We never intended to come to this. It's again the case of Pilate washing his hands and vainly trying to show that he could do nothing to prevent the crime. In conclusion, we should fear lest the spirit of compromise find a place in our lives, for there is opportunity for it in almost everything we do. Continued willful compromise, even in small things, may be the turning point in our spiritual life. It may break forever the chain of graces intended by God to conduct us to high holiness, so that, in place of almost unthinkable intimacies with himself, which God had designed for us, even in this life, we may live a life of low spiritual attainments. The lukewarmness of compromise is particularly hateful to him. I would that you were hot or cold, he says. Pilate's faltering caused our Lord more pain than a straight downright condemnation would have done. Let us think of this when we're playing with venial sin, compromising between God and self, giving God something and keeping a little for ourselves. We are thus, at the very least, compromising our call to high sanctity. God in his goodness may still save us from eternal perdition. Let us ask our dearest Savior, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, who by Pilate was set beside Barabbas, 
who by Pilate was brutally scourged, who by Pilate was condemned to death, let us ask him in his goodness and mercy to give us that true and generous courage which is not afraid when God's honor is at stake. Let us ask him to keep us from half-hearted service, to keep us from trying to compromise with conscience. Let us ask him to make us realize and remember his own absolute generosity, the utter completeness with which he gave himself up to the pains of his holy passion. He loved me, and he delivered himself up for me. It was a complete giving up of himself, even unto death. The perfection of a man consists in his surrendering himself completely to God. Chapter 8 in the book Learn of Me Motives for Mortification Suffering in the Spiritual Life The whole question of the position of suffering, of mortification and penance in the supernatural order, is mysterious. Its complete understanding is beyond the human mind. Those who are advanced in love and union with God understand it best. St. Paul reminds us that the animal man understandeth not the things of God. The cross of Christ, Jesus Christ crucified, is to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles foolishness. To many Catholics, mortification is a stumbling block. They hesitate before it, but to non-Catholics, Christian mortification is simply folly. In a previous chapter we've outlined the distinction between penance and mortification. Penance regards our past sins, mortification regards the danger of future sin. We shall now consider both more carefully, and for convenience we shall deal with them together under the heading of mortification, since the same acts may be acts of both penance and mortification. Mortification in general is a suffering of mind or body which we deliberately bring on ourselves for a supernatural motive. This suffering may come by the infliction of pain or by the privation of legitimate satisfaction. It may come by a passing act or by our choice of a state of life. Our motive for mortification may be either to acquire the mastery of our passions, to atone for our sins, to obtain some grace, to live the higher life, to make reparation or to conform ourselves to Christ's suffering. The above motives show us, and we must always keep it in mind, that mortification is only a means, it is not an end. Mortification is dying so as to live. We must die to our self-seeking nature, that we may live to God. Unless the grain falling into the earth die, itself remaineth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. The law of death leading to life is all through the gospel. He that loseth his life shall find it. If thy right hand scandalize thee, cut it off. It is better to go into life with one hand than having two hands to be cast into the fire of hell. We shall never enjoy fully the life of God unless we have died to our selfish selves. This doctrine seems very severe, but if there were a way to salvation easier than the way of mortification, our Lord in his love would surely have taught it. The complete idea of mortification includes love. Love makes suffering sweet. A true lover is willing to suffer for the sake of the beloved or to reach the beloved, and suffering is changed by his love. And so the lovers of God will bear suffering for God in order to reach God, and love makes the pain to be the food of love. Lovers of God do not reject the dangerous joys of the world because they found them unreal, but because they reject everything that tends to separate them from Him. To cultivate love we should ponder on the life and passion of our Lord. We shall now consider the various motives that urge us to the practice of mortification and penance. The first motive that should lead us to the practice of mortification is the need we have of dominating the irregular tendencies of our inferior nature, so that they may not lead us to sin. 
Personal experience tells us clearly that our soul is the theater of a contest. St. Paul says, The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And again he says, I see another law in my members fighting against the law of my mind. Writing to the Colossians, the apostle speaks as if there were two men in us, the old man and the new. The work of mortification is to put off the old man and put on the new. But our own past history convinces us only too well of the truth of this warfare. The cause of this contest between the flesh and the spirit is the fall of Adam. His sin upset the harmony of our nature. It destroyed the gift of God by which our superior powers had dominion over our inferior tendencies. As man had refused to submit to God, so now his passions refused to submit to his will. To observe God's law fully, we must keep the inferior part of the soul subject to the superior part. Now, in order that we may be sure of the sufficient mastery over our inferior nature, it is necessary to conquer our inclinations, not merely in things that are forbidden, but also in things which are not forbidden. Mortification is necessary. We can never hope to avoid sin if we begin by saying, I will allow myself all things not sinful. I will stop at the line marked by sin. To do this is practically impossible. The man who decides to practice no mortification in the matter of drink, while resolving never to go to excess, usually ends by becoming a slave to drink. Alas, how many lives have been ruined through failure to realize this principle of the spiritual life. On the other hand, by mortifying our lower nature in things which are not sinful, we're training it to obedience, we're making nature accustomed to being refused when it calls for sinless things, and then when it clamors for that which is sinful, we are easily able to keep it in control. Our life here below is a contest, as we've seen, a contest of our mind and will with our disorderly inclinations. If we're riding a wild horse, we must keep the reins tight. He will bolt if we slacken the rein. If we have to pass life with a wild beast in a cage to make life livable, we must have him completely in our power. Draw his teeth, cut his claws, weaken him by starvation, and we are the master. This is precisely our case in the present life. It is by mortification that we control and weaken our unruly tendencies. St. Paul puts this motive before us, I chastise my body, he says. He is not satisfied with the sufferings that come to him. He is hard on himself. His immediate end is self-control. I bring it into subjection, into slavery, he says. His ultimate end is salvation, the possession of God, lest I become a castaway. Consider who fears. A saint, an apostle. Consider what he fears. To lose God. See how the supernatural motive is added to the natural. I bring it into subjection, lest I become a castaway. Note the possibility of seeking the merely natural end, self-control, simply for its own sake a pagan might do this. In the work of mortifying the passions, actual pain is not absolutely essential. It is otherwise in atoning for sin or in imitating Jesus. If the passion is so dominated that it does not feel the check, we are still keeping it in control by our continuing the practice of mortification. We are sinners. Another motive that should lead us to mortify ourselves is the need we have of expiating our past sins. We are all sinners. As God's creatures, our life should be ruled by Him. We should at each moment be fulfilling His holy will. If we go against his holy will, we're deviating from the direct and straight course in which our life should be directed to him. Now, as we've said, every sin is committed because we expect to get some satisfaction from our act. In every mortal sin, we have a seeking of undue satisfaction. In these sins, there is a turning to some created thing that we may get pleasure from it, and we judge this pleasure to be better for us than the friendship of God. We put God in the second place. Our blessed Lord atoned for all the sins of men, but his satisfaction must be applied 
to the individual soul. By the kind providence of God, it has been arranged that, for our great advantage, the merits of our Lord's atonement are applied to our souls when we willingly bear pain in union with the pain He took on Himself. He is the head of the mystic body which is His church. We are the members. When the head suffers, the members should suffer also. And by these sufferings they enter into the satisfactions and merits of the sufferings of Christ. They fill up, as St. Paul says, what is wanting in the sufferings of Christ. When a just soul recognizes the undue satisfaction it has taken, and understands how Christ atoned for it, it is led to inflict pain on itself. This is done by acts of penance. The soul wants to share in the expiation made by Christ. It wants to restore the balance of just dependence on God which was violated by its pleasure-seeking. It wants, by entering into the divine purpose, to secure immediate possession, after death, of the God whose attractiveness is so captivating. We should keep in mind the limits which separate necessary self-denial and free but advisable penance. The following example will make this clear. The virtue of temperance demands self-denial, because the virtue involves the restraint of our natural tendency. Penance involves something more. It involves refusing ourselves what we might have without going against the moderation imposed by temperance. St. Ignatius makes this distinction. Speaking of food, he says, when we take away superfluities, it is not penance, but temperance. Penance is when we take off from what is fitting that we should have. A St. Thomas, speaking of fasting, gives three reasons for this practice. It helps us in the controlling of our inferior nature, mortification. Hence it is a help to the necessary self-denial. It does the work of atoning for past sin, penance. The efficacy comes from uniting our self-inflicted pain with the sufferings of Christ. And it helps us to attain to more complete detachment, so that we may advance in the practice of contemplation. Making us like to Christ in suffering, it brings us special grace. Mortification makes our prayers effective. The third motive which leads to mortification and penance is the fact that by suffering willingly born we give a special efficacy to our petition for God's graces and favors. There's no doubt of this fact. God announced by his prophet that the city of Nineveh was to be destroyed. The people, by order of the king, prayed and fasted, even the little children, and God pardoned them. When the apostles failed to drive out the impure demon, our Lord told them that this kind was only driven out by prayer and fasting. Prayer was not enough. Penance was needed also. Our Lord himself said to the apostles, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Lest temptation get hold of you and enter into you, you must pray and also deprive yourself of sleep, a severe penance. In the breviary we read about St. Thomas Aquinas that when he sought the solution of difficult theological problems, he not only prayed, but he fasted also. St. Chantal was much tempted against the faith, and St. Francis de Sales advised her to use the discipline so that she might get the grace to overcome the temptation. We all need grace. We've prayed for special graces. We've asked for patience, for generosity, for love of God and love of our neighbor. Let us add some penance to our petitions, as all the saints have done. But we are not saints, you may say. This is true, but we should be aiming at sanctity and may cultivate the desire of using the means that the saints have found helpful to obtain the favors they prayed for. The gentle St. Francis de Sales, in his book An Introduction to the Devout Life, written for beginners, uses the words, the discipline is of wonderful efficacy for stirring up the fire of devotion, if it be taken with moderation. The reason of the power that penance adds to prayer seems to be the fact that penance is the expression of a humble soul that recognizes its sinfulness. And we read that the prayers of the humble 
shall pierce the clouds. Moreover, mortification clothes us, as it were, in the appearance of Christ, who for the sake of the joy that lay before him endured the cross. We practice mortification that we may live the higher life. The three motives given should be considered as necessary even from the early stages of the spiritual life. The personal element is very prominent in them. It is a question of my passions, my sins, my favors. These motives should always be present in the soul. But as the soul advances, they are not so prominent. Other motives enter, which bring God more prominently before the mind and the will. The first of the nobler motives for mortification and penance is our call to the higher life, to the life of union with God. St. Thomas speaks of this as one of the motives for fasting and distinguishes it from the motive of dominating our inferior nature. St. Paul puts the reason very clearly, If by the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. In other words, live the higher life, the life of union with God. We are all called to this higher life. We are called as Christians, as religious, as priests. We are called to a life for God, to a life of prayer, to a life of intimate union with God. We are called to be like Jesus. The great obstacle to the call is the want of mortification. This is the reason why we find the higher life so hard, the reason of our difficulty in prayer. If we seek satisfaction in the things and pleasures of this life, we cannot expect to find God waiting for us in prayer. And it is mortification that protects us from being dominated by the attraction of pleasure. The reason for this is not hard to see. All our perfection consists in the love of God. Our soul is placed midway between earth and heaven, between God and this world, and is attracted by both. Love is the moving principle in man. If the love of the things of the world, ease, comfort, our own will, predominates, we are drawn to earth and cannot rise to union with God. My love is my burden, says St. Augustine. If I love earthly things, no matter how innocent, they will bind me to earth. By mortification we free ourselves from these earthly inclinations, from these earthly burdens. Our soul is made for God, and as soon as it is freed from the attractions of the things of earth, it is drawn to God by His grace and lives in union with Him. We're speaking here of inordinate earthly attachments, even to trifles. Does it make any difference, says St. John of the Cross, whether a bird be held by a slender thread or a rope? While the bird is bound, it cannot fly, till the cord that holds it is broken. In like manner, the smallest attachment will prevent our rising to union with God. St. Paul expects us to be always bearing about in our bodies the mortification of Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our bodies. We must imitate St. Paul in his mortification, that we may live the life of Christ to which we are called. Since we are called to a higher life, we must strive to possess our higher souls in peace amid the storms of passion in our lower nature. We must in our souls reflect the things of heaven, and men must see in us the image of the lives of the saints, and even the image of the life of Christ. Have you ever contemplated one of those lakes hidden amid the mountains, surrounded on all sides by high cliffs? How calm it is! The storm may sweep the mountain, but it does not ruffle the surface of the lake, and in its calm waters we see the reflection, clear and beautiful, of the stars of heaven. This is a picture of the interior of the mortified man. His soul, surrounded by the mountains of mortification, is always calm amid the storms of this life, and his soul reflects the heavenly virtues of Christ and his saints. Another motive urging us to penance and mortification is the desire to make reparation. The first foundation of the desire to make reparation is the knowledge that the Lord Jesus is offended, is despised, is hated, that his church, his mystic body, is persecuted. Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? These words tell us that Jesus suffers in his mystic body. When the church is persecuted, Christ is persecuted. 
we are urged also by the further knowledge that all this contempt and hatred and sin and persecution is from those whom Christ died to save. The ever-present reality of sin comes home to us if we reflect on the immense number of times, even during this very day, that the souls of men have by sin despised the friendship of Christ, who died in great pain for them, who was scourged and crowned with thorns, and spat upon and mocked, and bore all to satisfy for their sin. We are now concerned not merely with our own sins, which call for satisfaction, we're concerned with the sins of the whole world, we're concerned with the fact that our Lord is sinned against. In those who love Christ, the knowledge that He is so offended leads to the desire of reparation, the desire of making up for the evil by acts to which they are not bound. Since every sin involves the turning of the soul away from God, reparation must first of all include our turning to God in fervent prayer. But there's another element in reparation. All sin involves turning away from God because of some satisfaction. This seeking of self-satisfaction in defiance of God's will is an element of every sin. Suffering is the opposite to satisfaction. Hence it is natural to seek to repair sin by bearing pain. This we do either by positively inflicting pain on ourselves, even in a trifling way, or by resisting the attraction of what gives us harmless gratification. We have opportunities for doing this many times a day, and it is a most practical form of reparation. But we must always keep in mind that suffering in itself has no satisfactorial value. To have this value it must be united by our intention with the sufferings of Christ. Reparation, therefore, implies the idea of sin, but not so much our own sins, although they are not forgotten, as the sins of men. It unites with this the idea of love. We make reparation not so much because men have sinned, but because Christ has been sinned against. The idea of reparation leads some to offer themselves as victims. I beseech you, says St. Paul, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing unto God. And many religious congregations have the idea of their members being victims of love and reparation as a prominent characteristic of their spiritual life. The motive of reparation appeals most widely to souls. There are few who are not moved by the idea, even among those whose lives manifest the imperfection of their love. And the motive and the practice, even in small things, leads to precious spiritual results. This motive will lead souls to the habit of resisting the attraction of pleasure, and in consequence will strengthen them against the excessive pursuit of pleasure, the excessive desire for a good time, which lead so many to forget God. The Church puts this before us in the Collect of the Feast of the Sacred Heart, where she speaks of the duty we have of making reparation. A Prayer O God, who in the heart of Thy Son, wounded by our sins, hast deigned in Thy mercy to pour forth on us infinite treasures of love, grant, we beseech Thee, that while we offer Him the devout homage of our piety, we may fulfill also the duty of making worthy satisfaction. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. A final and most perfect motive for mortification is to be like Jesus in suffering, to share the sufferings of the Savior we love. Those that really love are drawn naturally to desire to enter into the trials and sorrows, to sympathize with and even to share the sufferings of the person beloved. Consider the case of a guilty daughter whose innocent mother, by a wrong sentence, is in prison for the crime of her child. The daughter has before her mind the hard prison life and the prison fare that is the lot of the mother. She would consider it as something disloyal to her love if she were to seek to enjoy the good things of the table while her mother was almost starving. Nay, more, if she really loved, she would be drawn to desire prison hardship and prison fare just to share in the hard life of the mother who was suffering because of her crime. Her love could not get away from the memory that was on her account 
that she was suffering. It is recorded of a wife on board the Titanic before the vessel foundered that she would not go into the lifeboat and leave her husband to die alone. She would even share with him the death struggle in the ice-cold waters. Such things are a consequence and a testimony of love. We will continue with the book Learn of Me and the chapter on Motives for Mortification on side B of this tape. Please join us. Motives for Mortification A chapter in the book Learn of Me by Rev. John Kearney, CSSP The true lovers of Lord Jesus are not outdone by earthly lovers. They, too, sympathize with their divine lover, scourged, crowned with thorns, crucified with cruel nails, and dying between two thieves. Their love, their sympathy, draws them to desire to suffer with Christ, to enter into his suffering, to share his sufferings. And if they have nothing to suffer, they are not content. Their love seeks suffering in mortification. The last murmured words of a good lay brother in Black Rock College were, I am in a comfortable bed. I am cared for. I have the infirmarian nuns and the priest of God beside me. And he died on his hard cross. He was abandoned. It is the same idea. He saw that he was not sharing in the sufferings of Christ, whom he loved, and he felt this. Constant meditation on the Passion leads easily to the same desire of sharing the sufferings of the Lord Jesus. When we desire this, mortification and penance cease to be a pain. They become a relief to the pain of love. St. Teresa speaks thus in her life, and St. Teresa writes, I have learned to find my joy and sweetness in all that is bitter. The Holy Father, Pius XI, in his encyclical on reparation, points out to us that we can really console Christ our Lord by our reparation, and by sharing his suffering. He is outside all time. All things are present to him. He foresaw in Gethsemane our reparation and our desire to share his sufferings, and this was part of the consolation which the angel of the agony put before him to strengthen him in his anguish. The Practice of Mortification The three great mortifications by which we deliberately inflict pain are fasting, depriving ourselves of food. Now under fasting we may place the giving up of things that gratify the body, alcohol, tobacco, long hours in bed. Watching, depriving ourselves of sleep, using instruments of penance. Our blessed Lord fasted for forty days and felt hungry. He spent nights in prayer. He has thus consecrated and approved of the first two means, and the Church has approved of the third by giving her approval to and commanding the observation of the rules of religious orders which prescribe the use of the discipline. But besides the above three great forms of penance and mortification, there are many other kinds of mortification not so severe, but just as necessary, if not more necessary. These consist in refusing to our senses and to our emotional and imaginative faculties the satisfaction they seek. All these may be classed as mortification of our appetites or desires. St. John of the Cross puts mortification of our desires as the fundamental mortification, the mortification that will ensure our advancing rapidly in union with God. The saint evidently includes all desires, both lawful and unlawful. That is, he includes in one advice necessary self-denial and advisable mortification and he declares that by persistent mortification of our desires we will make more progress in a month than we would make in years by any other method. It is to be noticed that the mortifications of St. Therese of Lisieux were from her early years mortifications of desires. Coming down to details, we find that in dealing with the mortification of desires it is not practical to distinguish between the acts of necessary self-denial and the acts of free mortification. The line of demarcation is not always easily seen at once and may vary with different persons. In the practice of mortification of our desires, 
The first field of operation is in the senses. Sense gratification, in moderation, is a factor in many forms of necessary and useful recreation. But we all know how desires for useless sense gratification appear constantly in our life. Here we have a field for the best of mortifications. In the second place, we must mortify our desire to be prominent, to be esteemed, to be great, to be somebody, in one department of life at least. Finally, we must mortify the desire of what gratifies our mind, useless knowledge, mere news. In conclusion, we are inspired to be generous in this matter of mortification when we think of the poor and their wants, consider their food, fasting and abstinence, one meal and glad to have it, their want of comforts and convenience, the patience with which they bear these. The soldier and the sailor, consider the hard times they have for the interest of this world during war, food, convenience, treatment in time of sickness. Are we to do less? The seeker after health. Consider mortification imposed by the doctor. See what men do for a few years of temporal life. Are we to do less for eternal life? We must be systematic in mortification. We must select a point to be carefully followed up. We must be persevering in this. We must both practice a certain amount of mortification and also develop in ourselves the conviction of its necessity. It is good to make our particular exam on our fidelity in responding to the inspiration of grace which leads us to make acts of mortification. Always bearing about in our body the mortification of Jesus that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our bodies. Chapter 9 Spiritual Failure Followed by Spiritual Success The Two Miraculous Drafts of Fishes Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. These words spoken by our Lord to the Apostles contain a twofold invitation. First, come after me, be my disciples, imitate my life and become holy by this imitation. Secondly, if you come after me and sanctify yourselves, I will make you fishers of men. I will make you to be sanctifiers of others. A similar twofold call is given to each of us. First we are called to sanctify ourselves. Come after me, he says, be my disciples, imitate my life. These words are addressed to each of us, and then we're called to labor to sanctify others. We're called to lead to holiness all those under our care, and this applies to all in authority, to parents and teachers especially. If you follow me, he says, I will make you fishers of men. I will use you as my instruments for drawing souls to myself, for making them holy and pleasing to me. We have, therefore, to be prepared to guide souls to sanctity, and first of all, to guide our own soul. The circumstances in which our Lord spoke these words suggest to our mind a spiritual problem which may come before us in the souls of others, and may also come before us as a personal matter. The problem in question is that of real or apparent failure in the spiritual life. It will be useful to reflect on this question, for the consideration of this particular problem will help us to keep from certain fundamental mistakes in our spiritual life, or will help us to direct our course wisely in case we find ourselves faced with the problem in actuality. Let us then put before ourselves failure in spiritual life as a personal problem, just as if we were actually facing it ourselves. If we are only beginners and have hardly had time to fail, let us listen to the words of those who know what failure means. One who is conscious of spiritual failure might express his anxiety and give his history somewhat as follows. The dissatisfaction that I feel at my position in the spiritual life is something that is very real. The sense of spiritual failure presses upon me. Life is passing. Death is approaching. I'm keenly conscious that spiritually I'm not where God has a right to see me. I know the truth of St. Paul's words, 
we must work out our salvation in fear and trembling. But now I see myself to be a failure in this work. I do not seem to know how to do the work properly. How different is my present position from what I had hoped for in the beginning of my spiritual life? I can recall my early ideals, the standard of sanctity I put before myself, my generosity, the desire to give up all, to sell all I had, my hopes for the graces of prayer, for the graces of self-denial, for the grace of carrying the cross, for the grace of working for God. I remember my determination to be faithful to all duties and to take all means that would bring me near to God. During a private retreat, my failure to get near to God came home to me. In those days of recollection, I realized my spiritual poverty, my failure in prayer. I was humbled by these facts. I was humbled by the history of my own spiritual life. I would begin again. I pondered over my position. I tried to detect the root cause of my failure. I thought I recognized a special weak point, a matter in which I had repeatedly broken down. I made resolutions, I wrote them out, I started my spiritual life over anew. This time I looked for real spiritual success in my life of prayer and union with God. And again, I had little to record but failure. And failure in the very point on which I had so strongly determined to be firm. I seemed to have lost my taste for spiritual things. Thus, the years have slipped away. I've had good resolutions and new beginnings, followed by no results of consequence. And here I am, after long years, disappointed, conscious of failure, impressed with the sense of my having made no spiritual advance. And with this, the temptation has come. Has God ceased to care much for me? The thought, untrue as I know it to be, seems to come back to me, and all unbidden, to suggest obscurely that sanctity is hopeless for me, that I am not made or called to be a saint. THE FAILURE OF THE APOSTLES IN FISHING in such words as these, many of us might describe our spiritual life. This series of seemingly unfruitful beginnings has been our very personal experience. We can class ourselves as spiritual failures. Now there is in the Gospel an episode whose record presents a striking parallel to the history of our spiritual failure. But the failure recorded in the Gospel was turned into success, and the consideration of it will show us how our own spiritual failure may, with God's help, be followed by spiritual success. Twice in the Gospel, at the beginning and at the end of the public life, we read of a night of labor in fishing that was a failure. These failures in fishing are recorded in St. Luke and in St. John. Let us consider the first episode. The apostles were fishermen by trade. They knew the lake of Gennesaret, every part of it. They knew the likely banks, the places where the fish would most frequently be found. The signs of the sky and the sea were familiar to them, and from these they knew the suitable times. The gospel record tells us that it was evening when they set out. It must have been a likely evening. The sky and the sea and the wind promised well. They were in high hopes, and their hopes buoyed them up with the buoyancy which confidence gives. Not merely were they in hope, but they were determined to take all care and spend themselves in the work, and the expectation of the rich result encouraged them in their determination to see to all the details. They pushed out from the land, they selected a likely spot, they cast their nets, they held the lines, they watched. Night gradually came down upon them. But the fisherman knows how to be patient. In patient expectation, they waited for the well-known strain on the line that indicated that the fish were in the net. But they felt nothing. The hours of the night passed. So far, they had failed. They would change their place and begin again. It is all so like our own spiritual history. They considered carefully what they should do. They talked their plan over. Finally, they rode to another spot where they knew fish were often found. Again they cast their nets. Again they watched and waited. They brought all their skill into play. They showed patience. The hours passed. There was no result. Failure was following them. 
They felt the cold of the night, and the sense of success was not there to help them to bear it. At length morning dawned. They drew in their empty nets and pulled to the landing place. As they came near the shore, they decided to try again. They would use the hand net. So Simon and Andrew cast it. This time there was one watching them. The Lord Jesus, says the gospel, walking on the shore, saw the two brothers, Simon and Andrew, casting a net into the sea. The cast had no result, another and a final failure. They turned their boat to the strand. In a few moments they grounded the boat, and then they landed. The empty boat told the story of the night. As they stood on the shore, the buoyancy of the starting was gone. A tendency to depression made itself felt. But the nets had to be cleaned from the seaweed. So they set to work. They were tired by their long night of toil. When the nets were clean, they would go home for food and for rest. The story of that night was the history of a failure. We have labored all night and have taken nothing. It is a parallel to the story of our own spiritual failure. As the apostles were cleaning their nets, a marvelous episode was beginning. The Lord Jesus was on the shore of the lake. His sacred human heart must have been full that morning. It was a great day in the designs of his mercy, for he was about to make a beginning in the selection of his special followers, his apostles. He saw the brothers Simon and Andrew, and the brothers John and James, but the time was not yet come. He would not speak of his plans to them until their minds had been prepared. And now the people began to gather round him to hear his words. Our Lord had already been preaching for a considerable time, several months probably. The previous chapter of St. Luke records his return to Galilee and his first visit to Nazareth after the temptation in the desert and his baptism by St. John. The text also records the many and mighty miracles he worked and the fact that his fame went out through the whole country. At this time his enemies had not yet begun to speak against him. The people were still in their first fervor and first admiration of his miracles and his doctrine. Hence, on that morning beside the lake, they crowded after him to hear his words. No man had ever spoken as this man. As the Lord Jesus was preaching, and the people pressed upon him, he saw two boats standing by the lake, Simon's boat and John's boat. He entered into the boat of Simon. He knew of the night's failure, but he said nothing. He never inquired. He gave no word of sympathy or encouragement. Yet he is the great sympathizer. He's the great source of encouragement. The chosen fishermen were not yet ready. They needed the instruction contained in the events of that very day. He asked Simon to pull the boat out a little from the land, and he continued his teaching from the boat of Peter. What a figure of the church! Christ is still teaching from the bark of Peter. But on that morning Peter and Andrew seemed to be forgotten. As recorded in the previous chapter of St. Luke, Peter had seen the cure of his relative. He'd seen many miracles work. He believed Jesus came from God. He believed that God was with him, and hence he listened attentively to the teaching of the new prophet. When the divine master had finished his instruction, he turned to Peter and spoke the unexpected words, Push out into the deep and let down your nets. It was about the last thing the fishermen expected. Peter had toiled all night and had failed. He'd given up the idea of securing any result that day. Consider the situation consider the speakers. Teacher and prophet, though he was, Christ was not a fisherman. By trade he was a carpenter, and now this carpenter was advising the fishermen on the method and the time of fishing. They knew the trade. They had the knowledge of the method and the time and the way of fishing. These fishermen had worked all night and had not succeeded. They were tired out by their toil. And here, was a carpenter from Nazareth telling them to launch forth in full daylight at the most unlikely time. Humanly speaking, it did not seem very prudent to follow such an advice. Consider now the action of Simon Peter. He believed the master came from God. He's docile, 
be submissive to him who has God's authority. Andrew, his brother, had already told him, We have found the Messiah. And then Andrew had brought him to Jesus, and in this first interview Simon heard from Jesus that he was to receive a new name, that he was to be called Rock, that he was to be called Peter. Most likely he must then have received some invitation to follow the Master. After that he had seen and heard of the miracles worked by this teacher from Nazareth. Like Nicodemus, he knew that no man could do the signs Christ did unless God was with him. Hence he believes in Christ, and he accepts guidance from Christ. He surrenders his own will. He does as he's directed. He himself had tried and failed. He had worked all night and failed. He had exercised all his own skill and patience and had failed. But he had faith in the envoy of God. At thy word, he said, I will let down the net. The labor of the night had not been lost for Peter. He had learned the lesson of failure. His opinion of the value of his own skill and his own work was lowered. He was in humility. He was ready to accept the divine advice. There's yet another point to be noted. Peter must have been utterly tired. He had worked a long night. He had just cleaned his nets, as the gospel tells us. He had freed them from the seaweed they'd gathered. It was time for him to get home and take some rest and refreshment. But the master had spoken. Peter made no reference to his personal fatigue. He spoke of the fact of his failure, and at once he prepared to obey. At thy word, he says, according to thy will, I will let down the net. The success was marvelous. The reward of Peter's faith, of his confidence, of his docility, came at once. The nets were hardly cast when they were filled with fish. They began to haul them aboard, but the strain was so great that the nets began to break as the gospel records. So they stood by until John and James, to whom they beckoned, should come to give them help. When they came, the immense draft of fish filled both the boats, so that they were almost sinking. The apostles were beside themselves. They were wholly astonished, as the gospel says, at the draft of fishes they had taken. It was all so rapid. It was all so unexpected. There was little labor. There was no waiting. No patience was called for. What they fail to secure by a night of toil is secured for them in a moment by the power of him who said to Peter, Push out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. When Simon Peter saw the miraculous success, he recognized the majesty of the Master, and like the centurion, who openly professed his unworthiness, he cast himself at the knees of Jesus and broke out into a confession of his lowliness. Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. He was pierced with the sense of his unworthiness and with the sense of his close intimacy with the Master who held such divine power. The Lord Jesus looked upon Peter in his abasement, his sacred heart opened to this humble man, and in a word he swept away all hesitation and doubt. Fear not, he said, fear not. How often these words were used by Jesus. How often they're recorded in the gospel. And then he set before the apostle the whole life work to which he was called, saying, Fear not, Peter, from henceforth you shall catch men. It was the final and definite call. As he spoke these words, the sacred heart of our Lord must have rejoiced exceedingly. It is his great joy to give his treasures to his human children, to open up to them the riches of his heart. And now, by these words, he has begun the work of the church, which will bring so many souls within the influence of his love. He has called the first of his apostles. The two boats, laden with the capture, quickly came to land. The four apostles, Simon and Andrew, and James and John, were at a crisis in their lives. The master now extended his call to all four. Come after me and I will make you fishers of men. They hesitated not. They gave themselves to the divine master. St. Luke states that in simple words, leaving all things, they followed him. They were fishers. They knew the meaning of the term fisherman. Jesus had called them to follow him, saying, as he had said to Peter, Come after me, and I will make you to be fishers of men.
it was a call to a work so far beyond their powers as to make the boldest hesitate. But the lesson of the morning's fishing was before them. The extraordinary success that followed their obedience, success out of all proportion to the effort they had made, such success told them that, in the work of fishing for men, in the work of sanctifying souls, they could count on the divine help, which would bring them results absolutely beyond what they could affect themselves. And the divine master, by his very words, had indicated that he and his power would be with them in the work of fishing for men. I will make you fishers, he said. I will make you successful fishers. The miraculous draft of this morning shows you what my power can do. All I ask is that you be docile, docile as Peter was this morning, when he said, We by ourselves have taken nothing, but at thy word I will let down the net. Divine grace, flooding the souls of the four chosen apostles, they saw what the Master wanted. Leaving their boats and nets at his word, leaving all things, says St. Luke, they followed him. A similar set of facts is recorded after the resurrection. Peter and John and some of the apostles went fishing. They labored all night and caught nothing. When morning came, Jesus stood on the shore, and he called to them, Children, have you wherewith to eat? The laconic no told the story of their failure, and Jesus directed them, Cast the net, he said, on the right side of the ship. And they obeyed his direction. Again, a miraculous draft. They could not draw the net into the boat on account of the multitude of the fishes, so says the gospel. This night of failure and morning of success were followed, just as in the previous case, by the twofold call to personal sanctity and to the apostolic life. Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? said Jesus. He asked for a profession of personal devotion, of personal love, and this personal love is consummate sanctity. And Peter responded to the threefold request by his threefold profession of love. Lord, thou knowest all things, he said, thou knowest that I love thee. And then followed the perfection and the climax of the first call of St. Peter to the apostolate. He was now given the order and commission to feed the lambs and the sheep of the flock of Christ, the commission to instruct and govern and sanctify all the children of the church. It was indeed a suitable moment for giving this commission. The failure of the night without Jesus, the success of the morning with Jesus, would tell all those called to shepherd the flock of Christ that no spiritual work can succeed except through him and with him and in him. Twice in the gospel, at the beginning and at the end of the public life, we have a night's fishing that was a failure. Twice we have submission to the direction of the Lord Jesus. Twice we have a miraculous abundance in the successful result. In summary, the application of both episodes to our spiritual life is very obvious. Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. This momentous invitation was spoken amid surroundings that were, so to speak, a background which threw into relief these epic-making words. The twofold call to personal sanctity and to the apostolate, was given by our Lord at such a moment that the very history of the day explained and illuminated the call. The mental outlook created by the facts of the day's history made the apostles ready to understand what the call required from themselves. A night of personal labor in fishing was a failure. Their own will had been the directive power, but in the morning, when the will of the Lord Jesus was the directing power, the results were marvelous and rapid. And so in the spiritual life we may toil for years, but if our will be not perfectly one with the will of the Lord Jesus, the result will be failure. On the other hand, once our will is surrendered to Him and absolutely one with His will, spiritual results will come surely, rapidly, abundantly. These conclusions we shall now consider more in detail. The Lesson of the Two Gospel Episodes The lesson is threefold. It puts before us our personal incapacity, 
in spiritual things, that the secret of spiritual success is in the surrender of our will to God, and the confidence we should have in the goodness of Jesus, who will enable us to make this great surrender. The Lesson of Humility The first lesson this gospel put before the apostles and puts before us is the lesson of our own powerlessness in the supernatural order, our own personal incapacity to advance in the spiritual life, our spiritual helplessness. The powerlessness of the fishermen while working in the night was a figure of this spiritual powerlessness. To realize this spiritual helplessness is for us of fundamental importance, for to realize our incapacity in supernatural things and to accept it places our soul in that position of humility which is of absolute necessity if we are to open our soul to God's sanctifying action and to do good to others. For many of us, the lesson of humility given by the gospel is strikingly confirmed by the history of our own life. We've touched with our own hands our supernatural infirmity. It is woven into the story of our spiritual life. It has been brought home to us with pain to our pride, perhaps. We are fools if the gospel and our own experience have not burnt the truth into us that by ourselves we are incapable of any supernatural good. In the first letter he wrote to St. Chantal, whom he directed to the highest sanctity, St. Francis de Sales speaks of the two columns of the tabernacle of her perfection. These columns are the frequent memory of her weakness and her incapacity. The word used is imbecilic, a very strong word. The love of her widowhood, her determination not to seek the consolations of earthly affection, her detachment from creatures. Once a month, she is to examine if these columns are quite sound. We see here how the saint's director puts in the very forefront the knowledge of her weakness and foolishness. The venerable Father Lieberman teaches the same spiritual doctrine when he says, From the moment we cease to realize our utter misery, we lose all, even the most precious graces. And in another place, Let your daily bread be your misery and abjection before God and men. St. Catherine of Siena, in one of her letters, writes, The pain of being deprived of the consolation of every creature made me discover my little virtue and recognize my own imperfection. I beg you not to cease praying, indeed redouble it, for I have greater need of it than you can know. Those who do not realize their spiritual poverty, their spiritual incapacity, may be in great danger. We sometimes find cases of those who seem to be very good, who seem to practice virtue without effort, who seem to be charitable and devoted and careful of regular observance. And yet a moment comes, a moment of trial, and they break down badly, sometimes in the very evening of life. May we not suspect that they would have been better prepared for the trial if they had been very conscious of their spiritual infirmity and if they had learned how incapable they were by themselves of rising from their spiritual weakness. This most necessary knowledge of our spiritual incapacity, of our spiritual poverty, of our spiritual weakness, comes to many of us only when we realize as a fact that spiritually we are a failure. We see our spiritual poverty when we are conscious of the fact that we have not made progress in the spiritual life that instead of living very near God, we are living far from Him. It is when we are conscious of this failure that we can, with the help of grace, come to the clear knowledge of our spiritual incapacity. Of course, there are other ways by which we can reach the conviction of our spiritual, supernatural powerlessness, but to learn this by our actual failure is what usually takes place. The First Great Lesson may now be stated in few words. In our own spiritual life, we cannot attain to sanctity by ourselves. We cannot by ourselves do real good to our own souls. We may labor all the night of this life. If we labor by ourselves, our labor will be in vain. We shall secure nothing. In the work for the souls of others, in the widest sense, we can do nothing ourselves. 
we cannot ourselves do good to the souls of men. The Gospel story shows us also how spiritual failure may be changed into spiritual success. In both episodes, our Lord gave a direction. In each case, St. Peter was obedient. He conformed his will to the will of Jesus. He cast the net into the deep sea, or at the right side, just as he was directed. This subjection of his will, this surrender of his will, was the necessary condition for success, and success followed at once by the divine power. Failure was changed into success, with the conformity to the divine will. It is the same in spiritual life. Real success depends on one condition, and on one condition only. God is more anxious for our sanctification than we can ever be. And He will sanctify us, He will make our spiritual life a success, if we surrender our will fully and completely to His divine will, by accepting the cross He sends, and by keeping His holy law. Let us contemplate again the central act of that morning at the Lake of Gennesaret. Simon Peter, in spite of all natural objections and in spite of all previous failures, let himself be guided by the Divine Master. At thy word, he said, I will let down the net. He made his will one with the will of Jesus. This surrender to the will of Jesus, this union of his will with that of Jesus, was the great act of the Apostle Peter on that morning, and the Holy Spirit makes it stand out in the very center of the gospel picture that we may easily see its importance. It marked the end of the time of failure. Now we should note that our Lord did not ask Peter to do anything extraordinary. There was little labor in the successful letting down of the net. The labor was just of the same kind as the labor during the night, which had no result. And note also that the fishes were not lifted miraculously into the boat, as Christ could have done had he so pleased. They had to be taken in the usual way and yet the difference was great. This time the will of the fishermen was one of his will. They cast the nets because he willed it. They were docile to his will. This made all the difference in the act, and gave the Lord Jesus the opportunity of bestowing his benefits, and bestowing them generously, as he loves to do. The work of sanctifying our own souls or the souls of others is really done by God. It is his work but he wishes us to cooperate with his grace, to labor in this with as much care as if all depended on our constant efforts. We must instruct others, and we must also instruct ourselves by reading, by hearing the word of God, by meditating. Meditation is in its first stage, at least, is like a sermon preached to ourselves. We must exhort others, and encourage others, and correct others. Argue, says St. Paul, and we must exhort and encourage and correct ourselves. But this labor for our sanctification, or for the sanctification of others, must be done in union with the Lord Jesus, in docility to His will. Our will must be one with His will. To work alone at our sanctification, or to work with confidence in our own efforts, is to labor in vain. Such work ends in failure. We have labored all night and have taken nothing. On the other hand, if we labor at our sanctification in docility, in dependence, in submission to the divine will, knowing that the work must be done by the divine power, then we are sure of an abundant result. The Lesson of Confidence The absence, real or apparent, of success in the spiritual life presses severely on every earnest soul. But the knowledge of our failure or of our infirmity is, as we've seen, most useful, since it leads to fuller self-knowledge. However, it has one great danger, the danger of discouragement. And that we may resist discouragement, it is most essential that we cultivate confidence in the goodness of God. Now the gospel story we're considering gives us, in a special way, a great lesson of confidence. Fear not, said Christ to St. Peter, who had cast himself down before him in his lowliness. Fear not, although you are a sinful man, and deserve that I should depart from you. Fear not, I can do all things. 
I can and I will make you successful in my service. And along with this word we have the divine power set before us in the fact that the night of failure was followed by a morning of success and such success. And so, in our spiritual life, long years of failure may be followed by spiritual success. It's not too late yet. The infinite goodness and absolute power of the Divine Master are not exhausted. With His help, His miraculous help, we can still hope to regain in a short time all the spiritual losses of even a long lifetime. God can do a great deal in a little time. But there is one condition. Success requires absolute surrender, absolute surrender of our will to Him. It was not due to a mere chance that our Lord selected this occasion to call the apostles in a definite manner to the work of the salvation and sanctification of souls, their own souls and the souls of others. The whole episode of the night's failure and the morning's success spoke eloquently to all who would listen. It showed forth vividly the fundamental disposition required for the work to which the apostles were called, and to which we are also called. The disposition was obedience, subjection to God, and surrender of their will to the divine will. And when we've surrendered our will to Him, when our will is one with His will, we must, as He desires, cast the net of petition, and we must cast it in all confidence. Ask, he says, and you shall receive. Cast the net of petition in confidence, and you shall draw to yourselves all the graces of sanctification. And thus, through docility to his will, and confident and persevering petition to his goodness, our spiritual failure shall be changed into spiritual success. When we continue on tape number five, we'll talk about real and apparent failure, a closer study. Please join us. We continue now with the book Learn of Me by Reverend John Kearney, CSSP, and the chapter on Miraculous Drafts of Fishes, Real and Apparent Failure, a Closer Study. There are many souls who are conscious of their spiritual failure and are anxious about it. They've not been generous with God, and God is letting them recognize their breakdown in the spiritual life, that they may trace it to its source in some fundamental defect. For many, it is easy to find this defect, and if so, the work God wants them to do is very clear. In such a case, there is some definite sacrifice to be made, some definite attachment to be broken off. But there are many others in whom the root defect is not so manifest. On first examination, there seems to be little wrong with their lives. The main practices of the Christian life are all adhered to. Holy Mass is attended. The sacraments are frequented. Morning and evening prayers are recited. Spiritual reading is practiced. They even make open avowal of wanting to please God in all things. Yet they know they are failures and God has allowed them to perceive their failure, that they may pierce below this superficial spiritual well-being and perceive that deep down in their hearts there is something wrong in their fundamental attitude towards God. When such souls make a more critical examination of their lives, they will find that in practice very much of their conduct does not square with the ideals they openly profess they will almost invariably recognize that they are impatient and resist and chafe under the various trials God sends them. They repine under their daily cross. They're sorrowful when what they dislike comes their way, and they strive to make things be according to their own likes. They're unwilling to submit themselves fully to those in authority. They're unwilling to admit their own limitations and slow to attribute to God's loving generosity the successful exercise of their gifts of nature or of grace. And all this shows that there is in them a fundamental want of conformity to God's will. They profess to have surrendered their will to Him, and in point of fact they are ruled by their own will rather than by the will of God. 
This want of complete and absolute surrender to God's will is the radical defect which makes so many souls, whose lives are to outward appearances very good, to be spiritual failures. When therefore we are conscious of our spiritual failure, let us seek its cause, and if the cause be not very manifest, let us see if our will is perfectly surrendered to the will of Christ, and perfectly united with His will. Let us then cry to God in humble petition that He would give us the grace to determine, to determine firmly, to make and to persevere in this great act of surrender, which means to keep His holy law and to carry our daily cross, because it comes from Him. And when we find that surrender of our will to be beyond our power, let us repeat frequently this touching and humble prayer of the Church. Receive our prayers, O God, and be appeased thereby, and mercifully compel our rebellious wills to yield to Thee. It is thus the Church prays when she has read in Holy Mass the gospel of the miraculous drafts of fishes. As we've already indicated, those who are faced with their failure in the spiritual life may be divided into two classes, the ungenerous and the generous. In the first class we have those who have not been generous with God, perhaps only in small things, and whose want of generosity is somewhat permanent in character. These we have just considered. In the second class we have those who have been generous with God and do not want to refuse Him anything, although they have some human infirmities of a passing character. For clearness, we have to consider these two cases separately, although many souls are between the two extremes and seem to belong to both classes. The Apparent Failure of the Generous We have now to consider the case of those who are sincere with God and lovers of God, and yet are crushed with the sense of their spiritual poverty and spiritual perversity. They see in themselves something that keeps them from the God they love. They have really served God well and faithfully. They have really lived for Him. They have mortified themselves, lest earthly attraction might diminish the perfection of their love. And yet a day comes when they are overwhelmed by their spiritual perversity and misery. The knowledge of this is to them an unspeakable pain. They have, unknown to themselves, because unfelt, a great love for God, a great longing to be united to Him. But now the vision of their own spiritual failure and perversity comes to them, and shows them the chasm that separates them from their Creator and their Father. It is unspeakable wretchedness. The very wretchedness that presses upon them seems to prevent their prayer. They seem to be unable to lift their mind and heart to God, and yet the thought of God in some obscure way seems to follow them. This vision of the infirmity and perversity of their fallen nature was needed. It is all God's doing. In His special love for them He has withdrawn His support. He wants them to understand their spiritual weakness. He wants them to know, by the very bitterness of their trial, how great is the chasm between God and themselves, that they may thereby dimly recognize His absolute goodness in descending to them. This vision of their own infirmity is often accompanied by severe and special and unexpected temptations. Thus, for instance, experience shows that those who are generous with God, those who are great lovers of God, have frequently to pass through the trial of being oppressed by the idea that God has abandoned them. Their agony is bitter. Souls who are thus tried can advance further into the understanding of our Lord's agony when He cried, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? But through all this trial, the generous soul does not waver in its desire to be absolutely ruled by God, to accomplish His holy will, and to carry the daily cross. It is faithful to all its duties. It is in this we have the real proof that the trial is not a punishment, but a purification. St. John of the Cross describes the spiritual state of those generous souls who are thus tried. The greatest affliction of the sorrowful soul in this state is the thought that God has abandoned it, of which it has no doubt. 
that he has cast it away into the darkness as an abominable thing. The thought that he has abandoned it is a grievous and pitiable affliction. David experienced the same trials when he said, As the wounded sleeping in the sepulchres, of whom thou art mindful no more, and they are cast off from thy hand. They have put me in the lower lake, in the dark places, and in the shadow of death. Thy fury is confirmed upon me, and all thy waves thou hast brought in upon me. And again, in another place, the saint repeats, When the rays of this pure light strike upon the soul, in order to expel its impurities, the soul perceives itself to be so unclean and miserable that it seems as if God had set himself against it, and itself were set against God. So grievous and painful is this feeling, for it thinks that God has abandoned it, that it was one of the heaviest afflictions of Job during his trial. Why hast thou set me contrary to thee, and I become burdensome to myself? The soul, seeing distinctly in this bright and pure light, though dimly, its own impurity, acknowledges its own unworthiness before God and all creatures. That which pains it still more is the fear it has that it will never be worthy, and that all its goodness is gone. This is the fruit of that deep impression made on the mind in the knowledge and sense of its own wickedness and misery. For now the divine and dim light reveals to it all its wretchedness, and it sees clearly that of itself it can never be other than it is. In these marvelous words, St. John of the Cross puts before us the trials of those good servants of God who are permitted by him to be oppressed by the practical knowledge of the perversity of their fallen nature, that they may thereby be purified from all that would oppose their union with the divine goodness. In the life of St. Chantal we find a striking illustration of the reality of the trials described by St. John of the Cross. St. Vincent de Paul, who was spiritual director to St. Chantal, thus wrote of her, We, Sir Vincent de Paul, unworthy superior general of the Congregation of the Mission, certify that about twenty years ago God gave us the grace of becoming acquainted with the deceased, our worthy Mother de Chantal. It always seemed to me that she was perfect in all kinds of virtue, and especially that she was full of faith, although she had been tried all her life by contrary thoughts. Although she apparently enjoyed that peace and tranquility of mind, possessed by souls who have reached a high degree of perfection. Yet she suffered from such interior trials that she said to me, and on several occasions wrote to me, that her mind was so filled with all sorts of temptations and abominations, that her constant practice was to turn away from the sight of a soul so horrible as to seem to her to be a picture of hell, and that, although she suffered in this way, her countenance never lost its serenity, nor did she relax in the fidelity that God required of her in the practice of the Christian and religious virtues. We should note a danger in trials that seem to be such as these. Not, Not all those who are keenly conscious of spiritual failure are afflicted because they love God. Some are afflicted because they love themselves. It is possible to be afflicted through pride. When we see clearly our low degree of perfection, we see the stamp of spiritual inferiority on us. Our pride makes us shrink from inferiority, and we feel pain in the knowledge of our spiritual mediocrity. In this matter, we can often detect the pain that comes from pride by the fact that such pain is frequently accompanied by a certain agitation. If we suspect pride in the pain we feel at our spiritual infirmity, the remedy is to acknowledge fully before God our true position, our spiritual incapacity, and then to appeal to the merits of the Lord Jesus, beseeching Him to lift us out of the depths and place us in the degree of grace that He wishes us to have. In conclusion, the sense of failure in the spiritual life may exist side by side with real success. Apparent failure is found in the saints, and this should help to give confidence to those who, although not saints, desire really to please God in spite of their weakness.
but real failure is more common. It should be feared, and yet, even in this case, success is still possible for the soul that submits to the guidance of Jesus, that submits to be ruled by those that speak in his name, that desires to do his will and carry the daily cross. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? The chalice which my Father gives me, shall I not drink it? All is possible to the power of the Lord Jesus. Fear not, he said. With his blessing, the net of petition that we cast, in his name and at his word, will draw to us a miraculous draft of most precious graces, and our failure will be, by his power, changed into success. Chapter 10 in the book Learn of Me The Power of Petition and the Four Conditions it Demands The Power of Petition Our Lord has given us the Our Father, the supreme model of prayer, and that model is a prayer of petition. Is it not a wonderful fact that poor creatures such as we are should have any power over the heart of God? Is it not a wonderful thought that we should have such power as to bring down on ourselves heavenly graces which, without our petition, would not be given us? Truly the power of the prayer of petition is a profound mystery. It is the mystery of God's goodness. Our Lord, knowing the importance of convincing His faithful of the power that they have in petition, followed up the Our Father with two parables, which set before us, in clearest light, the extraordinary truth that God will hear our cry to him and will grant us what we need of spiritual graces. The Parable of the Three Loaves And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go to him at midnight, and shall say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, because a friend of mine has come off his journey to me, and I have not what to set before him? And he from within should answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. Yet, if he shall continue knocking, I say to you, although he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will rise, and give him as many as he needeth. And I say to you, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Could anything be clearer than this astounding statement? If a selfish man, who only cares for his own comfort, will get up and give his friend what he wants, because he has persisted in knocking, how much more will not our Heavenly Father listen to and grant the prayers of his children? If he ask his father bread. Our Lord was not content with one convincing parable. He followed it up with another, still more convincing. He said, What man is there among you of whom if his son should ask bread, will he give him a stone? And if he shall ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he reach him a scorpion? The comparison is perfectly clear, but our Savior makes the application himself. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father from heaven give the good spirit to them that ask him? What an amazing comparison this is. It comes home to everyone. If an earthly father knows how to give good gifts to his children, how much, much more our heavenly Father, who is infinitely good, who is goodness itself. St. Augustine says he is more anxious to give than we are to receive, more desirous to show mercy than we are to be freed from misery. The Holy Scripture contains many other passages which illustrate the power of prayer. In the book of Exodus we read that when Moses was speaking with God on the summit of Mount Sinai, the people at the foot of the holy mount so far forgot God that they fell into idolatry and worshipped the golden calf. And then, God said to Moses, Let me alone, that my wrath may be enkindled against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make of thee a great nation. But Moses besought the Lord and prayed, 
and the text continues, The Lord was appeased from doing the evil which he had spoken. Comment on this extraordinary passage is unnecessary. It shows us clearly the power of petition. The philosopher Archimedes, when he had studied the laws of the lever, cried out in joy, Give me a fulcrum, and I will move the world. He asked the impossible, But we have the fulcrum, the fatherly goodness of God, on which we can lean, and we have the lever of prayer, which rests on that fulcrum. And if we use that lever, we can do a greater work than moving the world. We can move God himself, the creator of the world. We can move him to grant us all we need. Why Our Petitions Fail The doctrine of the Scripture and the teaching of the saints should convince us of the power of petition. But perhaps the testimony of our own experience may seem to contradict this. Our prayers, we say, have not been heard. We have asked and we have not received. We have sought and we have not found. We have knocked and it has not been opened to us. The reason of the apparent contradiction is this. Our petitions have been wanting in one or more of the conditions which are essential to perfect petition. Petition is the key of heaven. It is the key by which we can unlock the treasure house of God's grace. But to open the lock, the key must be used correctly. It must be put properly into the lock and turned in the right direction. It is so with petition. If the conditions of perfect petition are present, petition is simply infallible. This is the constant teaching of doctors and saints. St. Thomas gives these conditions. Speaking of the prayer of petition, he says, There are four conditions, and if these are together fulfilled, one always obtains what is asked. The conditions are that one asks for oneself, for things needful for salvation, with piety, and with perseverance. We should notice how the holy doctor expressly states that if the four conditions are present, we always obtain what we ask. This positive statement puts clearly before us the extraordinary fact of the infallibility of prayer. This certainty, or infallibility, rests on the divine goodness and the divine promise, and is set forth in a mass of scripture texts. We shall now examine the four conditions. The first condition for successful petition is that we pray for ourselves. Prayer for ourselves, if quite sincere, implies that we are prepared to put no obstacle in the way of God's grace. The single word sincere means a great deal. It means that we are really and truly determined to be generous with God. We must always pray with this sincerity. When we pray for our neighbor, we are never sure of his dispositions. He may be resisting God's grace. Hence our petitions are not infallible. Nevertheless, prayers for our neighbor are very effective and very meritorious. Pray one for another that ye may be saved, says St. James. And Christ says, Pray for them that persecute and calumniate you. The second condition for successful petition is that we pray for what is necessary for salvation. Our Lord tells us that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his justice. And as we've seen, the great model of petition, the Our Father, is concerned nearly altogether with spiritual things which are necessary for salvation. The gift of himself, the eternal possession of himself in heaven, is the great gift that God wishes to give us. It is a gift worthy of God. All other gifts, whether spiritual or temporal, are given by him as means to prepare us for the gift of gifts, himself. Not only does God give himself to the soul in heaven, but even on earth there is a beginning of this donation, for he gives himself to all who are united to him by grace and charity. Hence St. Ignatius prayed, saying, Give me thy love and thy grace, and I am rich enough, and I ask nothing more. When we ask for the spiritual favors which lead to the more perfect possession of God, we must not limit ourselves to asking something small. It would be an insult to a king if we came and besought him for a farthing. We should therefore ask God for great and precious graces. 
we should aspire to great holiness, and his power and goodness and promises are there to encourage us to ask for the graces we need to become saints. In asking for God's favors, we should keep in mind that he can give such strong actual graces that even our perversity and weakness are overcome by them. They carry us forward with divine power. These are the gifts we should ask for. And as we said, we should not fear to ask for these efficacious graces. They will ensure our advance in holiness. To come down to details, there are many precious graces for which we may ask, all of which lead to the possession of God here and hereafter. Thus we may ask for the grace of charity, for the grace to love the Lord Jesus with all our heart. Give me thy love and thy grace, and I am rich enough. This prayer must never cease. For the grace to practice fraternal charity, for an increase in faith. Lord, increase our faith, said the apostles. We may ask that we may seek God only and not seek ourselves, that we may have light to see how we are opposing the divine action of grace in our souls, that we may have perseverance in going against ourselves and so rooting out vice that we may have the desire of holiness, the desire of being pleasing to God, that we may have a taste and attraction for prayer, and that we may find facility in communing with God, that distractions may diminish, that we may have a real devotion to the Blessed Mother, that we may be preserved from all sin. Keep us this day from all sin, O Lord. Pray that you enter not into temptation that God would give us the graces he has designed for us if we had been faithful. They were given to the prodigal, the food, the robe, the ring, and the shoes, but he had to toil a long, weary way home. And finally, and especially, that we may be given the actual graces, the series of graces, which we need to enable us to know God's will in our regard and to surrender our will to him, to conform our will to his divine will, with ever greater perfection, thus removing the obstacle in us to the divine action by which we are sanctified, by which God gives himself to us with ever closer intimacy, through the sacraments and our meritorious works. We should keep well in mind that to ask for what is necessary for salvation implies that we ask for it precisely because it is necessary. Many prayers remain unanswered although they are offered for spiritual favors, because the motive prompting the prayer is not the securing of salvation. An example will explain. Suppose a person is living with some others who are really given to God and living lives of holiness. He cannot help seeing this sanctity, and he becomes keenly conscious of his own spiritual poverty. If this leads him to consider what he is before God, how displeasing to God is his unspiritual life, and if, in consequence, he asks God to help him to become pleasing to his divine majesty, if he thinks and prays thus, his prayer will be acceptable to God. But all may not look at things thus. Some, when conscious of their spiritual poverty, are stung by it, since it wounds their pride by stamping them with a stamp of inferiority, inferiority in spiritual things. When they pray, their principal motive is the desire to shake off what hurts their pride. Although they ask for something that is necessary to salvation, they do not ask because of this necessity, but because their pride is wounded. Such prayers are often unheard. It is very useful practice to make a list of the spiritual favors we need. This list need not be changed for a long time, and we can make use of it each day when we ask for what we want to advance in holiness. Such a list will be helpful after Holy Communion, and indeed at all times of prayer. If a spiritual favor is not good for our salvation at present, God will not hear us, even if all the other conditions of petition are fulfilled. Hence the wisdom of petitions for the graces of God wishes to give, Do unto thy servant, O Lord, according to thy mercy. We may also pray for temporal things. Consider the example of the church in praying for temporal favors, the prayers of the Missal, 
and the example of those who asked our Lord to be cured. Hence it is lawful to ask, but we must always do so on the condition that what we ask is good for our salvation. We cannot ask temporal favors absolutely as we can the spiritual graces which are clearly good for us. God knows whether certain temporal things which we desire are good for us or not, like the doctor who knows best what is good for the sick man. Hence, we must commit our temporal petitions to the care of his goodness. Our Lord in the garden prayed for a temporal favor, but he committed the result to his heavenly Father. The third condition for successful petition is that we pray with piety. The word piety expresses the devotion we have to God as our Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We shall fulfill the condition of praying with piety if we pray with humility, with confidence, and in the name of Jesus. To pray with piety we must pray with humility. The prayer of the humble man shall pierce the clouds, and again God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humility means, in the first place, the profound realization and willing acceptance of the fact of being a creature, of being constantly upheld and kept in existence by the divine power. In a word, the profound realization of absolute dependence on God, and willingness to shape our conduct accordingly. Humility means also the realization of the fact that our human nature is fallen, and that in, in addition to our nothingness as creatures, there is in us, as children of Adam, a tendency to things forbidden, and moreover an intensified perversity due to our sinful past. From all this knowledge there flows, by the help of grace, the keen sense of our incapacity for any supernatural good, and our absolute need of the divine help. This deep sense of incapacity for good is the true characteristic of the humble soul, the characteristic which finds expression in humble petition. The example of the saints teaches us that when we pray we must not confide in our own strength, but we must acknowledge our weakness. St. Tice, a great sinner, was taught to say, O thou who created me, have mercy on me. She became a great saint. St. Philip Neri said, Lord, keep thy hand over Philip this day, for if not, Philip will betray thee. St. Francis said, If God did not keep me, I should commit every possible sin. Hence, he said that he was the worst man in the world. St. Paul, he that standeth, let him take care lest he fall, and we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We must then acknowledge before God our incapacity and wretchedness. We must admit that we do not deserve to be heard. We must pray as the publican, who did not dare raise his eyes, but struck his breast and said, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This publican of the gospel is the great type of humility in prayer. He stood afar off. He did not so much as dare to raise his eyes to heaven. He struck his breast. He said, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. These external signs reveal the humble soul. They reveal the internal humility. Such external signs are a natural consequence, and are an evidence of the state of the soul. And such external signs strengthen the interior humility, and even help its beginning. But before God, who reads the soul, it is the humility of the heart that counts. It is the humility of the heart which knows and keenly realizes its own nothingness and sinfulness, its incapacity for good, its tendency to evil. But we should note that the publican, whose humble heart was so manifest, did not hesitate to ask for mercy. Although he knew his wretchedness, he knew God's goodness, and hence from the depths he cried, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He had both confidence and humility, and our Lord tells us, This man went down to his house justified. He that prays must have his look fixed upon God, upon his goodness and mercy, his unfailing promise. And at the same time, he must look upon himself 
is weakness and unworthiness. Humility and confidence are the two wings that raise prayer up to the throne of God. To pray with piety we must pray with confidence. Our blessed Lord has promised to hear the prayers of those who have confidence. All things whatsoever you ask when you pray, believe that you shall receive, and they shall come unto you. It was thus the apostles understood the promises in favor of petition. St. James tells us that we must ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, which is moved and carried about by the wind. Therefore let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. The foundation of this confidence is not our own goodness or strength, or our own merit. It is Almighty God's infinite goodness, His mercy, His absolute power to help us, and in a particular way, the promises he has made. These promises were prompted by his goodness. They were the expression of his goodness. And God is faithful. As St. Paul says, He is faithful that has promised. Let us consider one of these promises. And first, let us recall the absolute truth of the words of God. We know that God is truth itself, that he cannot deceive us. We know that we are bound to believe his word when he speaks to us in the Holy Gospel. All our faith is based on the infallible truth of the word of God. We believe Jesus is present in the most holy sacrament, because he himself says he is present. Now remembering all that, let us listen to what our blessed Lord tells us of the prayer of petition. Amen, amen, I say to you, if you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. Are not these words sufficiently clear to remove all the doubts that might undermine our confidence? Our blessed Lord, to call attention to the importance of what he was going to say, begins by using a very emphatic word, Amen, Amen. According to St. Alphonsus, it is like using a species of oath. He has himself said, let your speech be yea, yea, and nay, nay. But here we see him, when declaring the power of prayer, taking as a means to convince us of the importance of his statement, the use of the emphatic word, Amen. Let us note the occasion on which our blessed Lord spoke these words. It was the night before his passion. He was going to be crucified the next day for us. He had just instituted the most holy sacrament. That evening, as we read in the Holy Gospel, he came back several times to the same subject, the power of petition. He wished to convince his disciples, at that solemn moment, of this truth. He wished to leave them this sweet assurance as a most precious legacy to be transmitted to the church. And he not merely spoke of the power of petition, he urged his disciples to pray. Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. We should note the character of kindness that appears in the last words. A gentle reproach, followed by a positive assurance, and then an indication of his desire that we should have contentment of heart, that your joy may be full. Our Lord's goodness shines out in every word. It is indeed himself that speaks. These words lead us to confidence. The invitation to pray in the name of Jesus suggests another source of confidence. But first, we must answer a difficulty. What about the petition of sinners? The prayers of a sinner. The objection, I am a sinner, I will not be heard, is not solid considering the following points. In his promise, our Lord has made no distinction between the just and the unjust. If God did not listen to sinners, says St. Augustine, in vain would the publican have said, God be merciful to me a sinner. Two sinners died on Calvary. One was saved because he prayed. He asked Jesus to remember him. The other was lost. St. James says, He giveth to all abundantly and upbraideth not. He does not upbraid us for our sins, but he hears us. Our Lord says, Come to me, all you that are burdened. 
and who is more burdened than the sinner? Come, all of you, he says. In the parable of the three loaves, our Lord declares that the man will give loaves not because he is a friend, and God will answer our prayers even when we are not his friends by grace. Let us go with confidence, therefore, to the throne of grace. To pray with piety, we should pray in the name of Jesus. Our confidence becomes yet more perfect when we pray in the name of Jesus, that is, when we pray to our Father in the name of His divine Son. To ask in the name of someone is to base our request on His excellence or on something He has done which gives our petition special power. To ask in the name of Jesus is to base our petition on the supreme excellence of Him who is both God and man. It is to base our petition on what He has done for His Father's glory and for our salvation. We do this particularly when we ask by His sufferings, by His death agony, by His wounds, by His blood. In His wonderful discourse after the Last Supper, when the Lord Jesus opened His Sacred Heart so marvelously, to the apostles, we find him on three separate occasions speaking of the prayer of petition. Each gives a slightly different aspect of petition, but in all three the Lord Jesus speaks of the reference to himself which should enter into our requests. It is St. John who was present that records in his gospel these striking words of our Savior. In one chapter our Lord tells us that He will do what we ask Him to do if we pray in His name to the Father, or if we pray in His own name to Himself. Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in My name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask Me anything in My name, that I will do. In another chapter He comes back to the prayer of petition and reminds us that if we are united to Him, our prayers will surely be answered. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. And in the following chapter our Lord once more speaks of petition, and once more it is a petition in his name. He first assures us that his Father will always answer such prayers, and in the next verse he again emphasizes the idea of asking in his name. Amen, amen, I say to you, if you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. In these texts, Christ speaks of prayer to his Father in his name, prayer to himself in his own name. Hence it is that the church terminates her prayers by per dominum nostrum Jesum Christum, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We should imitate the church in this. In particular, during Holy Mass, when our Lord is actually showing forth His holy death, when His sacred blood is actually on the altar and is being offered for us, it is then that we must pray to His Father and to Himself by His wounds and His blood and His passion and His death. To do this is to pray in His name, for when we pray thus we base our petition on the Lord Jesus Himself on his merits. We base our petition on the pains he suffered for us, on the wounds he bore for us, and which he still keeps for our sake, on the precious blood which he shed for us so profusely. We should observe that our Lord in all this is teaching a new lesson on petition. He is the mediator between God and man. We can only go to the Father by him and through him, and our prayer to the Father must be made by him and through him. Per Dominum Nostrum Jesum Christum. When we continue with the book Learn of Me on side B of this tape, we'll talk about the fourth condition for a successful petition. We continue now with the book Learn of Me by Reverend John Kearney, CSSP, and the chapter on the power of petition. The fourth condition for successful petition is that we pray with perseverance. We must persevere in petition. God wishes to be praised by our importunity. He wishes to have a holy violence done to him, as St. Gregory says, 
and we must persevere in asking him until we have obtained what we seek, until we have vanquished the temptation, or until we have obtained the grace we desire. And when we pray for final perseverance, we must continue our prayer until our last breath, until we have secured our salvation by holy death. Our Lord in many places of the gospel taught us the necessity of perseverance in prayer. We ought always to pray, he said, and not to faint. And he at once enforced this fundamental truth by a most beautiful parable. Continuing, he said, There was a judge in a certain city who feared not God nor regarded man. And there was a certain widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Vindicate me against my adversary. And he would not for a long time. But afterwards he said within himself, Even though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow is troublesome to me, I will vindicate her, lest continually coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And will not God vindicate his elect who cry to him day and night? And is he slow to act in their regard? I say to you that he will take up their cause, and quickly. See how desirous our Lord is to convince us of the power of persevering prayer. No comparison is too extreme. He will even use the illustration of an unjust judge, provided he can bring home to us the all-important truth, the power of persevering petition. Could our Lord have taken any more striking way of convincing us? What more could he do? Almighty God does not always grant our petitions at once, and we may reverently ask the reason. We cannot, of course, pretend to fathom the mysterious counsels of God's providence, but we may be sure that the delay God sometimes makes before answering our prayers has no other end but his own glory through our advantage. The saints and the fathers of the church tell us that God delays answering our prayers to prove and exercise our confidence. If prayers were always answered at once, there would be no opportunity for the exercise of this confidence. To increase our desire, great gifts should be fervently desired. To await a more suitable time for giving, to give us instead something better. We ask to be released from temptation. God gives us the grace to overcome it. And God wishes to be entreated, to have a holy violence done to him, to be conquered by importunity, according to St. Gregory. Many examples of perseverance in petition are given us in the Holy Scriptures and in the lives of the saints. Our Lord frequently spent the night in prayer. He went up to the mountain alone to pray. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he repeated the same words through the hours of his agony as the Gospel expressly notes. The blind man of Jericho cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He was rebuked and told to hold his peace, but as the gospel remarks, he cried out all the more, and his perseverance obtained the grace he sought, Lord, that I may see. Regarding perseverance, we should note the words of St. Augustine. A protracted prayer, he says, is not the same as a prayer of many words, against which our Lord warns us in St. Matthew. Many words are one thing, and affection persevered in is another thing. What we must persevere in is the turning of our heart to God, the continued attitude of soul that looks to God for help. Few words, the same being repeated often, like our Lord in the garden. Final Perseverance Perseverance in prayer is needed to obtain the grace of final perseverance. Individual prayers will obtain individual graces. But as a grace of salvation is not a single grace, but a chain of graces, all of which are at last linked with the grace of final perseverance, or a happy death, so, corresponding to this, there should be a chain of prayers. If we break the chain of our prayer, the chain of graces may be broken also, and we may be lost. Hence, the Lord Jesus says, We ought always to pray. The Council of Trent tells us that we cannot merit the grace of final perseverance, the grace of a holy death, but we can pray for it, and if we persevere, we are sure of obtaining it. We must then persevere in asking the grace of final perseverance, and persevere until the day we are called to God. And let us now ask the grace never to leave off praying for this. 
remember that God is always near to us, near to hear us, not like earthly kings who have stated hours for interviewing. The prayer of petition follows the law of habit. If we persist in acts of petition, this kind of prayer will become so natural to us that our need of spiritual help will easily come before our memory, and the expression of petition will naturally form itself on our lips. And in consequence, with a little care, sincere and humble petition can be made to take its right position in our spiritual life. We should therefore persist in acts of petition until the habit of petition is formed, and then petition will be permanent in our spiritual life. A Model of Petition The Woman of Canaan We can conclude by considering a touching episode of the Gospel which sets before us the characteristics of perfect petition. In the prayer of the woman of Canaan we see a prayer that was confident, humble, and persevering. The text sets before us the woman's personal affliction. Have pity on me, she cried. Her confidence, she knew our Lord's power. Her humility, she accepted rebuff. Her perseverance in spite of difficulties. The episode is recorded in two of the Gospels. This is significant. The Holy Spirit so inspired the two evangelists because he desires us to pay special attention to the instruction this episode gives. Let us hear the exact words of the Gospel. And Jesus went from thence and retired into the districts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan who came out of these coasts crying out, said to him, Have pity on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously troubled by a devil. Who answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. And he answering said, I was not sent but to the sheep that are lost of the house of Israel. But she came and adored him, saying, Lord, help me who answering said, It is not good to take the bread of the children and to cast it to the dogs. But she said, Yea, Lord, for the whelps also eat of the crumbs that fall from the table of their masters. Then Jesus answering said to her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it done to thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was cured from that hour. Let us now examine this passage line by line. And behold, a woman of Canaan, crying out, said to him, Have pity on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously troubled by a devil, who answered her not a word. It was a mother's sorrow, the consequence of a mother's love that expressed itself in her appeal. Have pity on me, she cried. That is, if you show favor on my beloved child, you are showing favor on me. It was a petition for her daughter and for herself. It was prompted by charity. It obviously came from the depth of her heart. It was sincerity itself. But the Lord Jesus seemed deaf to her entreaties. He answered her not a word. He read her heart. He wanted her to persevere, and thus to manifest and develop her faith and her confidence. Hence his silence, even to a mother's petition. In spite of his silence, the woman of faith did not cease from crying to him that he would assist her. She persevered. At length his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. They had become annoyed by her importunity, as was said in the parable of the unjust judge. So they turned to Jesus and besought him to use his miraculous power to cure her daughter, and thus to send her away, and so make her to cease her cries. But again he seemed unmoved, not even the petition of his beloved apostles, not even the request of Peter and of John, made any change. He was concerned with the spiritual good of the soul before him. He saw that her faith and confidence were equal to the humiliation. He had already given instructions to the apostles that they were to go first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were to go to their own people and not go to the strangers. This was the first apostolic mission. Later on they were to go to the whole world. He now uses the same words of himself, and he reminds the apostles that he himself had come in the first place for the sake of the chosen people. 
I was not sent, he said, but to the sheep that are lost of the house of Israel. This stranger, he implies, is not of Israel. It was a second refusal, a refusal to the petitioner and a refusal to those that supported that petition. The faith and the trust of the valiant woman were not broken even by this second refusal, coupled as it was with the reminder that she was outside the chosen people. She would still persevere. She had heard of his goodness. She came and adored him, saying, Lord, help me. Wonderful trust, admirable humility. She came and adored him, or as St. Mark puts it most touchingly, she fell down at his feet. Think of her as she lay at the feet of the Lord of goodness. She was bruised in heart by the second refusal, but she still trusted. She felt wretched and dispirited. All she could cry was, Lord, help me. Most marvelous confidence. She must surely conquer him now by this perseverance. She had gone as far as the man who asked for three loaves, or as far as the widow who asked for justice from the unjust judge. Still, the Savior seemed unmoved. There's nothing like it in the whole gospel. The widow of Nahum spoke by her tears and was at once answered. But here, the perseverance, the humility, the confidence, all seem of no avail. How hard it must be, how hard it must have been, to the delicate and sensitive and compassionate human heart of Jesus. How hard to refuse again. But he saw a sincere soul before him. He saw the soul capable of further and more admirable perfection. He wished to make her prayer a model for all times, a model of trust and humility and perseverance. He knew all the fruit of this final humiliation in the prayers that to the end of time, through her example, would be really humble and confident. He strengthened her by his grace to bear the last crushing refusal, and then he spoke, and he smote her again who answering said, It is not good to take the bread of the children and cast it to the dogs. She was not only outside the chosen people. She was a worthless and contemptible being. He spoke of her as a dog. It cost him to say it. It sounded cruel. But it was not cruel. It was spoken in love. He wanted to lead her to the heights of faith and trust which would place her on the throne of glory she now possesses in heaven and unite her to himself in eternal love. The woman bent under this last blow. She was only a dog. This name he gave her cut deep and wounded her sorely. But his graces flooded her soul. She would still trust. She would try again. Out of the very words he had used, she would take her excuse for asking. She would accept the name he gave her. She would accept to be called a dog, and in her very acceptance, she would renew her petition. She would ask for a crumb of the graces that were given so abundantly by him. Yea, Lord, for the whelps also eat of the crumbs that fall from the table of their masters. Sublime humility. Sublime confidence. She had conquered. O woman, he said, great is thy faith. What a joy to his sacred heart to praise her thus. He had watched that soul through all the repeated trials of refusal and humiliation. At each fresh refusal, at each fresh humiliation, he had seen her corresponding with the grace he gave. He had seen her faith and her humility and her trust being strengthened by every trial. And now, with great joy, he can praise her as he grants her request, O woman, great is thy faith, be it done unto thee as thou wilt. She was praised by God made man. She was praised by the Lord Jesus. She was praised for trust and humility and perseverance, all of which came from and depended on her faith. O woman, great is thy faith. Comment is needless on this most touching story. We do not know which to contemplate, the goodness of the sacred heart leading his creature to heights of holiness, sustaining her with special grace, in each phase of her trial, or the humility and trust and perseverance of this creature who cooperated so perfectly with the grace she received. 
The doctrine of petition is here set before us in its dazzling beauty. The divine goodness on which petition rests, the faith, humility, trust, perseverance, perseverance in spite of difficulties, everything that is required to make our petition perfect is presented to us in this most heart-moving episode. May the Lord be forever blessed because he has given us this lesson, this example of perfect petition. May he give us the grace to be always humble and trustful and persevering in our petitions to the divine goodness. The story of the woman of Canaan throws a clear light on our own past spiritual experiences and on the way we should direct our spiritual life in future. When we ask for the grace of holiness, the grace to surrender our will to God, we are always opposed by the wicked one. We can take the very words of this woman and make them our own. Have pity on me, because I am grievously tormented by a devil, by a devil who tries to keep me back from thee, my God. If the Lord seems deaf to our entreaty, let us ask the prayers of others, of the saints and of the queen of saints, and of God's servants on earth. The apostles interceded for the woman of Canaan. If no help comes to us, and we're made painfully conscious of our low degree of grace, and how we are far outside the inner circle of the chosen children of God, of the chosen lovers of the Lord Jesus. Even then, like the woman of Canaan, we must cast ourselves down before him. Lord, help me, must be our repeated prayer. Let us humbly acknowledge our spiritual poverty, and appeal to the wounds and the blood of him who merited for us on Calvary all the graces of holiness. Trusting in his goodness, we can and we must persevere in absolute confidence. And if he still seems to ignore us, and the memory of our past sins comes before us, the sins which stamp us as being wholly unreasonable, even like the irrational animals, for by our sins not merely are we outside the circle of his intimate lovers, but we have made ourselves loathsome before him, even then we must still persevere like the woman of Canaan. We must humble ourselves and appeal to the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world, to him who, as St. Peter says, bore our sins in his own body on the tree. We must appeal to him to apply his atonement to our souls, and then we can and must persevere in petition with humble confidence. If through his grace we thus persevere in humble, confident petition, in his own good time, God will hear us, and will say, even to us, Be it done unto thee as thou wilt. Chapter 11 Mary, the Mother of Divine Grace The Miracle at Cana The Mediatrix of All Graces We are all conscious of a special contentment of heart when in a prayerful spirit we think of the Blessed Mother of Jesus. In early life, when we first aspired to holiness, we trusted in her, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. In later life, when we've experienced spiritual failure, we have still greater trust. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us. In her relation to us, Our Lady manifests with great power the wonders of the divine goodness. When God, in his overflowing kindness, was made man, he came to atone for our sins, to teach us about himself, to draw us to himself, and he would draw us with the cords of Adam. He taught us to call God our Father, to call his Father our Father, Pater Noster, wonderful revelation of God. In a single word Christ introduced us into the depths of the divine charity. Inspired by him, the Church teaches us to call his Mother our Mother. This title of Our Lady expresses a great truth. It tells us of her loving care for all those whom God has given her. It tells us of the desire of the heart of Jesus regarding his Holy Mother. It tells us how he wishes to honor her by distributing his graces and favors through her hands, and how he wishes us to pray to her with childlike trust, with loving confidence. All we have stated is familiar Catholic doctrine. It is the teaching of the Church. But this Catholic doctrine is known to us not only by the traditional teaching of the Church, 
but also by the Holy Scripture, where it appears to all who read with care. And to study the Catholic doctrine in the words of God Himself will make our confidence in Mary more firm and our devotion more tender. The Blessed Mother at Cana the life of our Lord is divided into two sharply contrasted periods, two periods which differ most profoundly, the hidden life and the public life. The hidden life of Bethlehem and Egypt and Nazareth was lived principally for his holy mother, and it is a revelation of our blessed mother's position that so much of the human life of Jesus was devoted to her. During that time the secret of the Incarnation was known practically only to herself and St. Joseph, and thus, while the treasures of wisdom and holiness and love were concealed from the world, for Mary and Joseph they were displayed during thirty long years in the secret of the hidden life in the bosom of the Holy Family. The public life, on the contrary, was lived for all the world, for all the people, for all those around him. This public life, which occupies nearly all the Gospel text, was devoted to instruction by word and example. His wisdom was manifested to all. He had come for all men. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven. At the opening of the public life our Lord had to establish his authority to teach. This necessary foundation for the preaching of the gospel by our Savior was like the showing of his credentials that is, the giving of the proofs that he had divine authority for all he said. These credentials were his miracles. His miracles proved that he came as a teacher from God. No man can do these signs which thou dost, unless God be with him. So spoke Nicodemus. Our blessed Lord himself continually appealed to these miracles as a proof of the divine origin of his mission. The works themselves which I do give testimony of me that the Father hath sent me. And again, before raising Lazarus from the dead, Father, I give thee thanks that thou hast heard me, and I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people that stand about have I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. The first public miracle marks the transition from the hidden life to the public life and hence it has a special place of eminence among the other miracles of our Lord. As we know, the first miracle was the changing of water into wine at the marriage feast of Cana. The Holy Ghost, in recording it with special detail in the Gospel of St. John, tells us, This beginning of miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The changing of water into wine at the marriage feast was then the first miracle and was the beginning of the supernatural faith of the disciples. At the time of this miracle only five of the apostles had been called, Andrew and Peter, John, Philip, and Bartholomew. It was just three days after the call of St. Bartholomew. St. John, who wrote the Gospel account, was himself present at the miracle. The little village of Cana is only three or four miles from Nazareth, hence we can understand how Our Lady was known there, and as to know her was to love her, we can easily realize how desirous all were to have her present at the marriage. Among the Jews the ceremony of marriage was carried out with all the solemnity possible. Our Lord speaks of this ceremony in the parable of the ten virgins. In the Gospel record we hear of a rich feast with waiters in attendance, where abundance of everything was expected. But as among the Jews, the poorest were helped by their neighbors to carry out the ceremony with the usual splendor. We can draw no conclusion from the details of the gospel regarding the riches or poverty of the persons concerned. This first miracle at Cana was the beginning of a glorious series of works of mercy. Once our Lord began, the ocean of his goodness was poured out on all that suffered in soul or body. He went about doing good. It was a joy to his sacred heart to relieve the afflicted, to cure the sick, to pardon the sinner, and moreover each work of wonder was a further confirmation of the divine mission. 
that glorious series of works of mercy did not cease with his visible life on this earth. It is continued to this day, and will be continued to the end of time. In his first miracle, in this first act of the public life, the position of our Blessed Mother is remarkable. Every detail given by the Gospel should be examined, because Our Lady's position here is typical of the position she was to hold in all the works of mercy of her Divine Son for the children of men to the end of time. The Holy Ghost, speaking in the Scriptures of Mary, the Mother of Jesus, has not used many words, but He has said much. Every word has its meaning, its force. We should keep in mind that no word in the Holy Scripture was written by accident. If we examine with care the Gospel of the Marriage Feast at Cana, we shall see that every word in it speaks of the glory of Mary. The first thing that strikes us in the text is the way Jesus addresses Mary. He calls her woman. Why not mother? And we remember that on the cross, when Jesus spoke to Mary for the last time, he used the same word, woman. The word sounds strange to us. Why did he not call her mother? To understand the meaning and the force of this expression, we should consider the customs of the country and of the time, and the style of language generally used. Expressions that are usual in one language seem strange in another. To illustrate the difference of idiom, we may take this example. The French word femme means both wife and woman. Wife and woman have very different meanings in English, and yet they are translations of one French word. Now we can learn the special force of words used in the Gospel by seeing what they mean in other books written in Greek, the language of the original Gospel text. The Greek word, meaning woman, used by the Holy Ghost in St. John, does not imply any want of respect or affection. On the contrary, it is a word used in addressing those whom the speaker greatly reveres. For instance, we find it used by a standard Greek author in addressing a queen with profound reverence. But apart from such explanations, there was a special reason why Jesus should address his blessed mother as woman at this moment, which was the opening of his public life, and again at the closing of his public life on the cross of Calvary. After the fall of our first parents, God had promised that a woman would come who should crush the serpent's head. Mary was the promised woman, the expected woman, blessed among all women. And hence, woman was in a certain sense her official title, as Christ gave to himself the title of Son of Man. She was the woman clothed with the sun, the promised woman, and hence her divine Son gave her this title on these two solemn occasions. Let us examine the text further. Our Lord begins by mysterious words which sound as if he were making objections. He says, What to me and to thee, my time is not yet come. The time appointed for beginning my public life has not yet arrived. An expression so decisive as this, My time has not yet come, spoken by God incarnate, would seem to refer to the higher designs regarding his human life, and to the arrangements decided from all eternity. We might imagine that such a word must be final and unchangeable. Moreover, there seemed to be no great reason for anticipating the determined time. There was no question of great suffering, of disease, or of death. There was no great bodily ill to be cured, or great distress of mind to be relieved. There was no spiritual ill to be healed. There was only the slight embarrassment of the young couple. And this surely did not seem to be a cause for which the time of the public life was to be anticipated. The miracles of Jesus regarding temporal matters were worked especially for those who were in great need. From this point of view, the miracle of Cana stands apart. The situation did not call for any miracle, and especially did not call for any anticipation of the public life. We have a striking parallel to Mary's request in the prayer of the woman of Canaan. In this case, our Lord first declared that he was sent only to the house of Israel, 
and refuse the request of the apostles, and yet he grants it later at the prayer of the woman. At Cana he declared his time was not yet come, and yet he anticipates it a moment later. In both cases we can say that the divine arrangements referred to were conditional, and were only changed for a most serious reason. At Cana it was the desire of Mary. The word spoken by Jesus to Mary when he said, What to me and to thee, seemed to be spoken to make us realize the insufficiency of the reason that appeared, externally, to be the cause of the miracle. These obscure words, what to me and to thee, which sound so strange to us, were a rather common Hebrew expression, found in many places in Holy Scripture, and which seems to have had many various meanings, according to the circumstances in which it was used. The general sense of these words is an invitation not to engage in the matter referred to. Such an invitation may have many shades of meaning, from a reproach to an assurance that all would be well. This last may be reasonably taken to be the meaning here, and hence we may paraphrase it. You need not trouble, it will be all right. This meaning is confirmed by Mary's direction to the waiters. Whatever he shall say to you, do ye. It would appear then that the Holy Ghost has recorded these words to emphasize the fact that the passing humiliation of the young couple was not a sufficient reason for the miracle, and to call our attention to the true reason why Jesus anticipated his time and worked his first miracle. Yes, the real reason why the miracle was worked, the real reason why Jesus anticipated his time, was the wish, the desire, of the immaculate heart of his mother. The compassionate heart of Mary is easily moved. It does not require great distress to touch that heart. Even the passing difficulties of those who were embarrassed through seeming to fail in hospitality, even this was enough to move her maternal tenderness and to lead her to use her boundless power in the interest of her children. We should also note carefully the way our Blessed Lady asked for the miracle, the words she used. They are a further revelation of her power over the heart of her Son. When the saints of the old law wished to ask God for any favor, they poured forth their whole heart before Him. They besought Him to hear them for His own glory, that their enemies might not despise the God of Israel. Consider, for instance, the prayer of Moses found in the book of Exodus, the prayer of Judith, which occupies a whole chapter of the Scripture, or the prayer of Esther. It was not so with Mary. The desire of her immaculate heart was not expressed in the form of a fervent petition to her divine Son. Her wish was only half expressed in the words, They have no wine. Although our Lord had made what might be considered to be an objection, our Blessed Mother knew the heart of her Divine Son, and she knew that Jesus read her own heart. She had never seen a miracle worked, but she knew her half-expressed wish would be acceded to, and hence she at once instructs the waiters, Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. This action of Our Lady is very significant. Her words, the only recorded ones addressed directly to persons outside the circle of the Holy Family, are remarkable as reflecting the complete childlike conformity to God's will which characterized Our Lady, the handmaid of the Lord, and which she wishes us to practice. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim, and then, as someone has beautifully put it, the conscious water knew its God and blushed. And Jesus said, Draw out now and carry to the chief steward of the feast. Thus it was that the first miracle was worked, a miracle all full of deep symbolism, reminding us of the more marvelous change effected daily on the altar when the wine is changed into the precious blood. This miracle, this first among the works of kindness which fill the public life, and which are continued today at Lourdes and elsewhere, this first miracle was the result of the Blessed Mother's desire. The miracle at Cana was a revelation of the power of our Blessed Mother. Jesus says, 
What is it to me and to thee? My time is not yet come. His mother whispers, They have no wine. And lo, the time is anticipated. The desired miracle is worked. The power of Our Lady's prayer is the same today. Christ is ever working miracles at her desire. This miracle was a revelation of the goodness of our Blessed Mother. It did not require supreme necessity or deep affliction to move her maternal heart. The slight humiliation that she foresaw to be coming was enough to make her use the power she possessed over the heart of Jesus. The Immaculate Heart of Mary is full of motherly kindness today, and we can trust her to take care of all her children. Finally, this miracle was a revelation of our Blessed Mother's position in the economy of grace. At her prayer, Jesus conferred this first visible miraculous favor. He is still attentive to her desires. The most precious grace we can ask of our Heavenly Mother is the grace of charity, the grace of love, the strong actual grace that will enlighten our minds to see God as most lovable and will incline our heart to yield more and more completely to his infinite goodness. This precious grace of charity is indeed the good wine of divine love, and it is Our Lady who asked and obtained the good wine at Cana that can best of all obtain for us a rich abundance of the wine of supernatural charity. To obtain divine love for her children is the great glory of Mary. Devotion to Our Lady How marvelously and how perfectly the Gospel reveals to us the glory of the Mother of Jesus! At the Annunciation she receives the source of all graces and blessings. At the Visitation spiritual favors are given by her voice. At Cana temporal favors are obtained by her word. The hidden life of thirty years was especially her own. The Annunciation marked the beginning and Cana the close. The Church was, has well understood the glorious position in the world of grace which Christ has given to his blessed mother. She calls Mary the mother of divine grace, and she's always exhorting her children to appeal to the mother of Jesus if they desire to possess this precious grace. She calls them to be devoted to Mary as to a mother. Devotion to Our Lady is a characteristic both of the saints and of the ordinary faithful. For those who live in a good Catholic home, as well as for those in religious life, there may perhaps be a danger of their taking for granted that they are devoted to Our Lady. There are so many memorials of the Mother of God in every Catholic house that we may easily come to think that she has a correspondingly prominent place in our thoughts and in our spiritual life. True devotion to Our Blessed Lady is a precious gift of God. It is a fragrant flower that needs careful cultivation. If it is not cultivated with care, it will languish and fade away. The first means we should take to cultivate this true devotion is to pray to our Lord for it. We should have the habit of making a daily petition to the Divine Son of Mary for a true devotion, solid and tender, to His Blessed Mother. True devotion to our Blessed Lady is both interior and exterior. This true devotion is first of all interior. It is in our mind and heart. It consists in our realizing Mary's sublime dignity and her consequent greatness and power. In a word, it consists in realizing the truth that she is the mother of God and that in consequence Mary, among all creatures, is the holiest, the most powerful, the most like God, that she is really our loving spiritual mother and that Jesus wishes His grace to come to us through this Blessed Mother's prayers. This intellectual view is preserved by reading and meditation. In the next place, true devotion means that in our heart, in our will, we have profound veneration, unshaken confidence, and tender love for our Blessed Mother. All these flow easily and naturally from the right understanding of her sublime dignity as Mother of God. Finally, true devotion implies that we frequently recall to our memory the Mother of Jesus, the Mother of Souls, and invoke her protection in all our difficulties 
and temptations. We will continue and conclude the book Learn of Me on the next tape, tape number six. Please join us. We continue now and conclude the book Learn of Me by Reverend John Kearney, CSSP, and the chapter on Mary, Mother of Divine Grace. Our devotion to the Blessed Mother must also be exterior. We are made of body and soul, and our soul is greatly influenced by exterior things. Hence it is most necessary to have some external practice of devotion to the Blessed Virgin in order to foster and keep alive and strengthen the interior devotion. It is most certain that anyone who has no external practice of devotion to Our Lady will soon give up invoking her help in temptation, which is the real test of the existence in us of devotion to the Mother of God. The best external act of devotion to Mary is the recital of the Holy Rosary. Our Holy Father, Pope Pius XI, in his encyclical on the Holy Rosary, gives prominence to the fact that Our Lady herself has, in our own times, commended most strongly this form of prayer when she appeared in the Grotto of Lourdes and taught a pure maid to recite it by her example. Our Holy Father shows how the Rosary fosters faith, hope, and charity, and speaks of its special efficacy as a method of prayer. It has, first of all, to be noticed that in piety, as well as in love, however often the same words are repeated, they do not contain the same meaning again and again, but something always new gained from a new emotion of charity. In addition, this method of prayer breathes forth and demands evangelical simplicity and humility of mind, and if we despise this, we are taught by our divine Savior himself that we can hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen, I say to you, unless you become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Our sanctification and our salvation are intimately bound up with our devotion to Mary. If we have true devotion to the Mother of God, she will help us to love her divine Son, and our eternal happiness will be very safe. The saints of God assure us of this, and their teaching has been summed up by St. Bernard in the touching prayer which he addresses to Mary, saying, Remember, O most loving Virgin Mary, that never was it known that any one who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was ever abandoned by thee. At every stage of our spiritual life we can trust in the protection, help, and intercession of our Mother. Honoring her, depending on her, we shall live in union with her to magnify the Lord and to rejoice in God, our Savior. A Prayer O Mother of Divine Grace, O Mediatrix of all graces, O Mother of fair love, who hath such boundless power over the heart of thy Son, who hath such tender affection for thy children, obtain for us the good wine of divine love, that becoming like to thee, we may be closely united to God, conformed to His will, choosing Him before all else, and persevering in this union until we reach its perfection in the eternal joys of heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. There are two ways, at least, of treating of holy living. We might begin by considering the meaning of perfection, of Christian perfection, of the obligation to tend to Christian perfection, of the means of attaining Christian perfection. But we might also begin by considering the holiness which we find exemplified in the saints and in the Queen of Saints, which appears in our Lord's instructions to the Apostles, and which is set before us in the life of our Lord Himself. In these volumes we followed the second method for the most part, as it seems to be more suitable for beginners and for ordinary souls, and because it avoids the rather philosophical discussions which appear at the very beginning of the first method. Both methods give the same result, a clear idea of the state of soul 
the state of childlike submission to which God wills us to tend, and which he wishes us to attain and persevere in, so that we may enter fully into his own divine life and taste, even here below, the beginning of eternal bliss. There's another reason for beginning a study of holy living, by considering the principles that are seen to rule the lives of the saints, the life of the Queen of Saints, and the life of our Savior Himself. The abstract view of Christian perfection, at least in the case of beginners, is liable to stimulate the intellect only without appealing to the heart or stirring the will. It does not exercise a great attractive influence, inclining us to live the perfection we've analyzed and understood. But when we begin by the study of the actual examples of Christian perfection, not only do we reach an understanding of what Christian perfection is, but we have in the very objects of our study a powerful incentive, a sweet attractiveness that draws us in the way of imitation, in the way of living the perfection that we see in the persons we study. When the life of our Lord is the object of our prayerful consideration, it has in itself a sweet potency not only to illuminate the mind, but to capture the heart and the will. The obstacles to our attaining to this state of soul, the state of childlike surrender to God, and the more important means that bring us the actual grace we need for its attainment, have been considered from certain standpoints, while the obligation of striving to reach this state has been before us in the chapters on the law of love. This Christian perfection, holy living, which is seen to consist in conformity to the divine will, is also seen to demand generous self-denial, the acceptance of our Lord's ultimatum. Unless you become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, it involves the fulfillment of St. Paul's rule of life. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God, your reasonable service. Persevering self-denial is possible with the help of divine grace ever at our disposal through the intercession of Mary, our mother. The life of Jesus, revealing the divine attractiveness, draws us to take up this sweet yoke in which we find rest for our souls. Learn of me is the pleading message which reaches us from Bethlehem, Nazareth, and Calvary, telling of the meek and humble heart of Jesus, living only to please his heavenly Father and obedient unto death. The prayer of petition, joined to mortification, and the fervent reception of the sacraments are the all-powerful means by which we may attain and preserve meekness and humility of heart, become conformed to our Lord. Depending on him thus in humble petition, we may come to know the fullness of his life and experience the sweet peace of being conformed to our Redeemer. This conformity is Christian perfection, true sanctity. And thus we come to the end of the book, Learn of Me, by Rev. John Kearney, CSSP. Materials for Meditation on the Spiritual Life and what it requires of us, dedicated to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and our mother, whose gentle care was revealed at the marriage feast of Cana.